How we doing, everybody? Welcome. I'm so happy you're here. Anakwa is here and is asking, what's up, Alex Yard? Well, Anakwa, I I'm just so happy to be here. Uh, I've had such a great time over the past few months, you know, putting together the Banjo-Kazooie video. And I I I'm just so happy that people are finding it and, and connecting with it. And, and I'm here to celebrate, baby. Pixel for one thinks it's great to see two of the games that changed Pixel's life in one stream. Well, well there, that's a great way of putting it. I'm glad you're vibing with it. Um, because, yeah, th these are two big, you know, game series that, that also mean a great deal to me. And Narcor says, congrats on the 25k subs. I appreciate that. Uh, J35Numbers wonders if we're ever going to see a music theory video on Spark the Electric Jesta series. Well... In order for that to happen, I would first need to play the Spark the Electric Jesta series. <laughs> I'm just giving you. I, I never heard of that game. If you can pitch me uh, on the, uh, convince me to play it, tell me why why it's worth it. And, and, and if you persuade me, then I'm going to end up playing the game. Spicy Patty just replayed Mania last night, perhaps in preparation for this stream. Oh, it's going to be such a good day. Such a good day. B between Banjo-Kazooie and, and then running through the scrapbook of happy memories that is Sonic the Hedgehog Mania. Oh, what a time to be alive. So I'm actually going to go ahead and, and warp right to uh, today's main event, which is Click Clock Wood. Which is a really good level. I mean, it's a level that's so god darn good that I even had to talk about it in a video that was about Gruntilda's lair. Cutman's in the house and is extending a congrats on 25k. I appreciate that, Cutman, and, and of course, I'm very happy that so many different people have found the channel, and, and it's it's a great opportunity to reflect on folks like Cutman, who have been here uh, for a good while. And, and I really appreciate, of course, all the viewers that, that have come in, but I, I super appreciate the earliest viewers because that was what helped get the momentum going for, for other people to come discover the channel. All of Spicy Patty's video game memories are from Banjo-Kazooie and its sequel, Banjo-Tooie. And, and let me say this about Banjo-Tooie. I, I, I think that there's a lot to like in it. Um, I will say that the music in Tui is extraordinary. I really like it, and it it, it it absolutely lives up to the standard of quality from from what's in this game. A and I can tell you that during the production of the recent music theory video about Gruntilda's lair from BK, I was you know I, when I'm working on videos and I have long working sessions editing stuff. Uh, a lot of times I'll listen to music while I'm working. Wow, isn't that an amazing concept? But what I wanted to say is that during the Banjo-Kazooie video, I was very, very frequently uh, listening to the Tui soundtrack. A and maybe part of the reason I had a reason to do so was because I only really played Banjo-Tooie once. I, I bought it, you know, when it came out back in the day, in the year 2K. Remember 2K? Some of you do. Um, and, and yeah, I played it through, and, and I'd never played it again in, in the same way that I have revisited Banjo-Kazooie and its soundtrack every now and then. So doing the Banjo-Kazooie video was a great opportunity to, to really take a new look at Tui, and I can absolutely say that I, I have a whole new appreciation for Tui's music now. Uh, that, that I, I thought it was pretty good back in the day, but now, now I just have a much deeper, deeper like for it. And Luke, I appreciate the congrats, as well as Galactic Legend. Owen Wyatt, for one, is in the house and has never played the Banjo games. Really needs to soon. I highly recommend it. Um, I, 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 it would be great, you know, if you and, and other people start to enjoy the game. And, and I, I just love coming on here and talking about the music and playing the game. Because I just, if you talk to anybody who played this game when it came out in, in the late 90s, it, it was a very special and particular type of experience that was one of a kind. And that, you know, is someone earlier in this chat and during this live stream said something to the effect of like, oh, um, 
like most of my childhood memories of video games are, are from the BK series, and I can totally jive with that. Is that the right word? Jive? Vibe with that mentality. But I can't vibe with anything if I die in these thorns, which might happen right now because uh, Grunty uh, is pulling out all the stops. Wow, look at this. I got one health, but sometimes life knocks you down. Sometimes people disappoint you. You put trust in folks that you, you know seem to be on your team, and, and you walk out of the exchange with just one honeycomb of health left. But you can't let that deter you. Plow through the briars. Poke these little birds. The birds know not what they do. I don't hold it against them. Inquirer finished Tui for the first time back in the early years. This final boss was very intense. Yeah, I, I, I'll be honest. I don't even remember the final boss, except that even now that you're just saying that and calling it the Hag 01, um, that it's kind of vaguely possibly making helping me remember it as like some kind of robotic device. Uh, just because Grunty is in worse shape than Old Snake in the second game. Some of you that have played Metal Gear Solid 1, 2, 3, 4 know what I'm talking about. They're pulling out all the tricks. Roboto6, for one, as indicated by his username, uh, was not alive yet in 2000. Um, and, and yeah, it, Robo, if, if you're discovering the game now, that, that's also great. I'm all about it. I'm all about it. Now, I love this level so much. Don't you? It, it's really cool how this is the final level, and it, it's got this walkway that circles, you know, all the way around the tree. Now, can I do this with my regular jump? Yes, so why am I risking it with a backflip? All right, let, let's get the first uh, bit of Click Clock Wood story in motion. We're, we're going to pop over to this little garden area. Or, and see if we can contribute to the flow of nature, shall we? Ahmed Eden X knows what's up. Life lessons with Banjo-Kazooie. And you know, another thing that Banjo-Kazooie teaches you is that you can't just come in all guns blazing to a swarm of bees. Whatever those bees might metaphorically be something else in your life. Look, I got one health. They're chasing me even outside their little area. Y you can't... You can't come in guns blazing 0 to 60 and, and start making a bunch of demands. You, you, you got you to gotta actually look at what's going on, approach it in a level-headed way, and, and you'll find that more often than not, sometimes the bees are actually willing to talk it through. Uh, but some bees, you, you just got to leave them alone for, for today. And, and that's what we're going to do with that swarm that I just escaped with my life. Justin Todd extends some congrats on 25k. I really appreciate it, Justin Todd. I'm happy to be here. Now, Tom Moore suggests use Wonder Wing, and, and that's, that's, a, that's a great thought. I honestly don't think to use the Wonder Wing invincibility probably as often as I should. That being said, I do like... What's it called? I do try not to lean on things like the Wonder Wing invincibility because it, it it's a way of compensating for my weaknesses in the game. A and I would rather just try to play the game on its own regular mode. And sometimes I get punished. Sometimes I get punished. But I, I, I accept the consequences of those high-stakes decisions like I just did by heading right into that little bee's inner sanctum. Wait, did I forgot to do the thing? Well, I'll see it on the way out, if I forgot. Anako says, so am I going to move from Twitch? And my thought is no. My thought is that for, you know, normal, I do three live streams per week over on Twitch. At Alex Yard, that's my username, over on Twitch. And the reason is because I don't want this Alex Yard and Knuckles channel to kind of have blurred lines between, you know, what kind of content is the focus here. Alex Yard and Knuckles, the music theory videos that you watch here are an event. They're an event. Every episode that I put out it is it is formed with love and care, and it, 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 it it's just a different type of experience from, for example, uh, three live streams per week, right? Because three live streams per week, I'm talking off the cuff, I'm saying what's on my mind, I'm improvising, I I'm reflecting on the current happenings of the day, either in the video game universe, all right, or, or maybe in the, the world of politics in the Supreme Court. 
Now, I, I just fell a long distance, and I'm going to tell you what my philosophy on that is. First of all, I can't help Gnati. Naughty? Is that like Gnasty in Spyro? Anyway, uh, my philosophy for Click Walk Wood mistakes is this, for this live stream. Hey, what's up, Tom Moore, TBM, Guernsey Tom? You got three Monikas, one dude, one cool dude. What's up, Tom? Um, so my policy for mistakes in Click Clock Wood for today is this. I'm going to be climbing up this tree w once or twice, as you'll see. Um, I I'm going to allow myself to make three mistakes. If I trip and fall three times, um, then I'm going to start using basically, you know, artificial means to, to retry the thing without having to walk all the way back up. But see what I'm doing right now? I'm walking back up. Um, uh, based on the, the error that I made. And, you know, it, it, it's not like I can prescribe... Uh, I can just recommend a philosophy of playing video games. A and even just to tell you, like, what it was like to play this game in 1998, that, that wonderful summer that the game came out, I saw the commercials, I was just like, wow, that... You hooked me. You hooked me. It looks like you can do a lot of cool moves. It looks like great graphics, cool environments. Let's do it. So you're playing that game in 98 on a Nintendo 64 legitimate hardware, right? And you fall off that jump, then you pay the consequences. Look at this. There's jump two. I only got one mistake left. This is nuts. This is nuts. Yeah, so I'm not going to subject y'all to a bunch of falling. And, and part, But the point is, like, of course, I'm talking live on the air while trying to juggle this. That's a challenge in itself, but... And yes, Tom makes a very good point about the summer, because the summer version of Click Clock Wood uh, gets really terrifying up in the tree. Because yeah, certain the the platforms will get smaller and smaller depending on the season. Uh, but yeah, how many mumbo tokens I got? Twenty four. So I just need one more mumbo, uh, and, and then I'll be able to turn into a bee. It is kind of funny that in Click Clock Wood you turn into a bee in the first season. Y you would think that you'd have to play through a couple of seasons to do it, but I think it's actually great because, like, probably, well, I don't know, maybe the average player, when they first get to Click Clock Wood, they don't yet have the 25 mumbo tokens that they need, so they have to wander around Click Clock Wood a bit. Anakwa recommends finding all of the empty honeycombs before fighting Gruntilda. So that that's an interesting aspect in that, like, you'll, did I just fall in that same thing? All right, time to do this. That's three falls. No, thank you. Forget it. Forget it. I forgive myself. I forgive myself for the same reason that, that I acknowledge that it's totally fine for Anakwa to get all the, the empty honeycombs to extend your health bar, right? That's the idea about what we're saying, right? Extending your health bar. So you'll notice that when I approach games, I, I, I don't spend any time, you know, it, you think about all the gameplay hours that, that a person will spend on the game. Uh, I want to make sure I'm getting the most out of the game. And so I don't want to spend time and effort doing things that will basically permit me to make more mistakes. I would rather just get better at the game. And so I don't, I don't really seek out the hollow honeycombs to extend my life bar. Uh, you can see right now I have five honeycombs, which is how you start the game. Uh, and I'm all about that. I mean, a lot of you probably know that when I play Sonic 3, for example, I don't use the shields. I don't use the shields because I want the game to legitimately test me on how well I'm able to maneuver around and kill enemies. And, 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 and when I make a mistake, I want to get punished for it because that, that will be something that I remember. Um, and and Navnuts could use a big lesson about this because you can see we're here in the spring and the, the dude is just going to town. He's not thinking ahead. He's succumbing to instant gratification. Um, and, and, and come winter, he, he's, he possibly would have to face a pretty harsh reality uh, uh, about his short-sighted decision to do that. Alex G is in the house. How you doing, Alex G? Great name, like the ring to it. Alex G never owned it, but played it throughout a weekend at the Blockbuster rental back in the day. And to that I say, heck yes. I'm glad you got to experience it. I honestly do think that, yeah, this game act definitely works as like a, a beat it in one go type of weekend thing. Um, I mean, I can tell you that, especially because I was so young. How old was I? Probably 11 when this game came out. 
and th this game was my entire summer, right? I, I, I wasn't kidding when I said that in the music theory video. It was the soundtrack of my entire summer. I was going to summer camp that year, and I was drawing pictures about different locations in, in, in the BK universe. And I remember one time this girl was sitting near me at the art, you know, arts and crafts uh, portion of our day at summer camp, and she's like, oh, Alex, well, what are you drawing? And, and I'm like, oh, this is Mumbo's Mountain. A and when I said that out loud, I was like, all right, she doesn't know what Mumbo's Mountain is, so I guess I have to explain it a little more because this kind of seems weird or whatever. So my, my elaboration on <laughs> what Mumbo's Mountain was, I said, it's the mountain that belongs to Mumbo. A as if that just totally shed light on everything, you know? That That's what we call a tautology. That's a tautology. That is a circular statement that is not saying anything because the thing you're, that you're asserting just loops back to the thing that you went... You, you, the, the thing that you said at the beginning of the sentence. Uh, and it's what I like to call nontent. It's pure nontent. It's content that is, you know, empty calories... And I almost never make this many mistakes, but sometimes it happens, people. You just gotta abuse your save states to make sure the live broadcast is entertaining. Uh, uh, I don't need the help. But yeah, this walkway, you're gonna see it uh, get more built and built throughout the seasons, which is an absolutely beautiful meditation on the passage of time. Amadon X says, you fear heights carries into video games. And when I tell you that, especially playing this game in 1998, um, like I was saying, there was no save state, so when you made a mistake, you paid the price. So when you climb back up, and you're, some of these seasons have very, very small platforms, and, and you're way up high, yeah, I absolutely feel that same kind of trepidation where it's like, I know that... Um, I'm going to have to free this little K-cup again, but that's okay because he's an absolute joy. What's his name, Eerie? But yeah, it, it's it, it's just a testament to how well this game is designed and presented that you can actually like experience a little bit of fear of heights just when you're when you're making your way on these very precarious platforms. Um Alex G asks, "Do I play Zelda with only 3 hearts?" And I'll answer that question in a moment. I just have to go grab some. And I grabbed it, so I'm back. Um, the reason why, like, if I were to think about Zelda games, Zelda games, they, they pretty much just hand you the, the, the health bar extension. <sighs> Compared to this, where... Banjo Kazooie, um, it's in Banjo. Uh, let me put it this way: in Banjo Kazooie, it's perfectly reasonable for me to expect myself to like get through a world without taking any hits, for example. And so, like, between because that's not that tall of an order, and because um, the difference is that in Zelda. Zelda is a little bit more like Hades in the sense that there's a lot of fast action combat and, you know, inevitably sometimes you'll make mistakes because you misjudged the, your opponent's, you know, attack animation. Um, so that's a sort of game where I do feel like extending the health bar proportionally as you progress through the more difficult enemies, I, I do think that, that's, that that makes sense. And especially because they just hand them to you after you beat a Zelda boss. But yeah, in this game, I, 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 I consider for me and, and the level of challenge that I'm looking for, I, I don't think it's that tall of an order, for example, to beat the Gruntilda final boss without uh, even taking one hit, never mind five. If I'm m making five different mistakes, then I deserve to uh, lose and, and be booted out and learn my lesson. The game is under no obligation to make me feel good. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, that's that so far this is the best and funniest comment. Reldly says that Nabnuts embodies the modern gamer. And and, and 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 when I look at Sonic Origins, I see the increased top speed and and the increased jump ability 
and, and, and the drastically tweaked mid-air maneuverability. And, and, and that's just Nabnut saying, I want more acorns now. I don't care what the long-term effects of scorf scarfing down all these acorns is. Um, I, I want that satisfaction, and I want it immediately. Do you play Super Mario without getting the mushrooms and fire flowers? Um, that's, yeah, it's so interesting that each of these great examples that people are bringing up uh, kind of have their own nuances. It, it, it's, in other words, it's not a one-size-fits-all philosophy, so that's a great question. In Super Mario, especially the later games, the 2D, like, I don't know, Super Mario Brothers U and Super Mario Brothers Wii, you know, the... The, the, the more recent 2D Mario games, you can tell that the levels were very deliberately designed so that, okay, if this level starts with uh, a cat suit, then the, you, you, will, you will find that the rest of that level, the way the architecture is designed and the way the challenge is supposed to play out, like what is the intended sequence of events? Um, it, it's meant to have the cat suit. And if you lose the cat suit, you can still play through the rest of the level um it, it's not like you're locked out but yeah i, I see the, the, the that example like with the cat suit or the fi even the fire flower and, and different projectile attacks that you can get um yeah that 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 scene that's and, and the reason i do that is because that's deliberate content that that the that the developers created they, they created a very specific challenge for you and they're like all right we want you to get the cat suit Climb up this thing, um, go over here with the cat suit, slide down with your, you know, your ability. Whereas, like, a game like BK, getting an extended health bar, that that's not enabling you to access more of the game's content or challenge or whatever. W which would be my only distinction. Now, I might not get all the Jinjos, but that's okay. Alex G is warning everybody that don't get Alex G started on Origins. They flubbed the Sonic and Knuckles music. Uh, 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 now, uh, that, that's as great as an opportunity to, to just mention this. The music in Sonic Origins is, you know, it, it's it's one of a great many disappointments, and 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 it's a it's a huge one. It's a huge one. Of course, it's a huge one. Um. But, like, I walked into Origins preparing to be disappointed. Like, nothing was hinging on Origins. It wasn't like, oh, this is the one, you know, final, true, and important moment that, um, oh, I know where I have to go, in the beehive, because I'm a bee. I was like, it, it, it's not like, oh, this is the one chance for people to really understand the good Sonic, Sonic tra soundtrack and the prototype music, like, uh, I mean, in this case of me specifically, the fact that I, if you ask me, I think it was perfect timing when I did those videos on Carnival Night, Ice Cap, and Launch Base. It, especially now that we know what happened with Origins, I, I think that the the way that I went about doing my videos and the time that I did um, was ideal. And yeah, I, I've said everything that I could ever need to say, like, in sum, uh, about those absolutely wonderful tracks. Um, and, and the fact that they were totally perverted beyond recognition in Sonic Origins is, in part, just a, a symptom of, of the problems that permeate that entire game. N about just making material changes to the experience. Um, and, 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 and then trying to market that and, and then say that I should be happy with my $45 purchase because this is the new definitive version of the game. So the music flub is just one of many symptoms, and it, it's disappointing. It's a missed opportunity, but I don't lose sleep over it. I don't rage over it, and, and I'm not trying to spend time convincing Sega that they should change their ways because they clearly don't want to listen. And, and one of the reasons is because... You look in the mirror. Did you buy the game? If you bought the game, then you are responsible for the next two or three disasters that, that may happen with future Sonic games, you know? Delay points out Origins. You were supposed to fix the bugs, not... Yeah, in other words, you're supposed to give us the same game and fix the bugs. I, I, I spoke about this very passionately last night on Twitch. 
is a very worthy conversation. Say that, like, w we're not being too nitpicky in what we're asking for. Um, what Origins is, it is not even the bare minimum, you know? <laughs> and awkward to say, is it just you, or does Bee Banjo not really resemble a bee at all? I, it, it strikes me as a nice, cute bee. That, that's an interesting observation. Um, he, he's got the... Ba he, he, I think it's because it's not just a bee. It's a mix of banjo and a bee. That, that's the key distinction. So, like, we saw those bees in the beehive. Those were more like traditional bees, I guess you could say. Whereas this bee is like... It's the character of banjo beeified. And th that's why he's a little bit chubby. That's why he goes, whoa, wee. When he jumps, he's got the classical, um, the, the pants. Gotta love it. Terry Onyx says Alex Yard would be the type of person to play classic mode to limit his view range and have an attempt limit. So that's interesting, Terry Onyx. Um, hold on, let me just load one quick thing. I need to do a little warp for the sake of an engaging broadcast. So let's, uh, hey, it's the summer right now, so let's go to the summer. Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting aspect you brought up, Terrionic, because, um, on that, s again, that it, it, it's so interesting how every particular scenario is different. It's not a golden rule across the board. Like, I... Probably people already know this, but like for the past year and probably, you know, for the foreseeable future, I whenever I play Sonic 3, it's always in Sonic 3 Air. Um, and, and it's because of the widescreen. Um, I guess because the 4x3 ratio that the game was originally released with was not like so much a deliberate design choice as it was a necessity of the era because all TVs were shaped that. That was the only size you could format it as. Um, and, and when I say that, I mean like, all right, the, the Sonic 3 developers set out to create a game and, you know, it. Y you got to ask yourself, if, if time was no factor, if money was no factor, if they could just make the game that they wanted to make without the limits of finances and technology of that particular year, I'd like to think that they would have given the player more screen visibility at, at than maybe a 4x3 is capable of giving you. And so th that's when I look at things like, you know, diabolical traps and, and, and fixing those things. It's like these are things that the, the devs would have done if not for just the, the practical limitations of the development cycle. So... It's interesting you say that because we've been having a bit of a, con a very worthy and interesting conversation over at the Alex Yard Zone Discord server for patrons about specifically how are we going to, like, track the leaderboards for Sonic 3 scores. Because we play Sonic 3, we try to get uh, the best score possible in the first six zones of the game, so another st standalone Sonic 3. Uh, Angel Island to launch base. Just sit down to play all the levels in one go. What's the highest score you can get with no special stages, no elemental shields, and, and a couple of other caveats that, that you'll find out if you uh, come join us in this world of fun, competitive Sonic 3 action. But one of the kind of the crisis moments that I had was, was saying, like, all right, Origins is, like, totally flat off the table as far as uh, comparing scores. Like, if I get a certain score in Sonic 3 Air, and someone else plays Sonic 3 Origins, um, they are going to have a much higher score for a few different reasons that I'm not even going to go into right now. Um, so it's perfectly fine to, like, just to have separate categories. Say, like, all right, here's the top scores for people that played Sonic 3 Air. Um, here's the top scores for people who played Origins. Because it, it's just a totally different thing. It, it has uh, so many uh, variables tweaked that just totally throw a wrench in having a meaningful competition and, and comparing your performance, you know? Alex G has a great question. Who did it better, B Banjo or the B in the Mario Galaxy games? That's a great uh, question to posit. I did play the B, uh, at least one or two of the B levels uh, a couple weeks ago, I think, on, on live stream on Twitch.
I'm gonna die now. Sometimes life knocks you down. You jump to a platform uh, expecting a little bit of, um, you know, solidity. Is that a word? The noun verb? The noun version of the word solid? Anyway, before I go on a tangent, I'll say that um, I think the B in this game is pretty good. It's a little bit overpowered, I guess, but it's not supposed to be used for a platforming challenge. Like, the B suit in Mario Galaxy is like, yeah, you have this flying ability, but it's limited. Y you only have so much juice. And, and I do think the physics of way the B suit in Mario works it is pretty awesome. It, it provides a fair challenge with a lot more mid-air maneuverability, but not kind of nerfing anything. Sad Club loves Alex Yard and loves Banjo the Zookeeper. Banjo the Zookeeper. Come on, kids. Come see these angry birds. These poor birds that I peck into... This is, I, I guess they die when I attack them. Well, let's just face the reality of the situation. I mean, it's... It's a heavy concept, but sometimes it's necessary to get the job done. I don't know. I, I guess I would spare the lives of some of these birds if I didn't need the health, but you can clearly see that I'm down one health cubit energy unit, so it, it's either me or them. Uh, and especially going into this beehive for some high-stakes, close-quarters combat action. Ryan Davison says, Am I gonna make another music theory video? Those are really cool to watch. This level has the best song for sure. Well, Ryan Davison, I can definitely say that I will be making more music theory videos. The reason why, um, the, the, especially this past month or two, th this is a, a, a very, very particular specific time in my life and, and in a lot of Sonic fans' lives where... Actually, hold on one second. Between Origins and, and between, I don't know, it's not Frontiers is, is not really the, the, the thing, but I... I mean, I can tell you right now that the next music theory video will not be from Sonic 3 because this is just not the time to... Uh, I, when I tell you that every Sonic 3 video that I've made has been an absolute pleasure to make, um, I, I wouldn't change any of those experiences for the world. They're very valuable, and the fact that people are getting something valuable out of the videos is extraordinary. I always want them to be, you know, a, a loving celebration. And I, I, I don't want any of the toxicity of, of the inexcusable disappointments that is Origins. I, I, I don't want to power through my feelings on the matter and, and do something that doesn't fully have my heart in it. I think somebody earlier in the stream asked a great question, which is, am I going to ever do a video that like looks at all the tweaks in Origins? I can tell you that the likelihood of that is very, very low. And I'll tell you why right now. If I make one video per month, then that means I get to make 12 videos per year, okay? Um, now, approximately half of those 12 videos are going to be from Sonic the Hedgehog, and the others are going to be from maybe the Banjo-Kazooie universe, uh, other things I haven't touched upon yet. That There's a whole exciting world of possibilities uh, that can come from that, um, but because of that 12 videos per year standard, I have to be very, very careful about it. It's really, you, you just have a limited number of years on this earth, and I don't want to devote one of those months or more to, um, you know, r racking up against my, like, <sighs> I can even tell you that the particulars of the soundtrack, th th there's very little that I could say about Origins music, even if I wanted to, that would be about actually the composition of it. Um, Everything that's happening in, in Origins music just seems to be the the, uh, the the product of neglect. It's neglect. They didn't put enough thought or care or attention into it, um, and, and it broke the hearts of a lot of longtime fans. Um, I, I'm not going to then spend my time on this earth where every video I make is essentially a permanent shrine uh, celebrating the song and, and looking at how it works and, and how it makes a person feel emotions when you play the game and listen to it. I have no interest in directing that lens, that effort and insight toward the absolute abomination. It would be one thing if Sega really tried to do something well and failed, but they just, d they, they couldn't even bother to, like, even really actually do it. 
Um, and yeah, you, you, you don't get a seat at the table. Certainly not w within my format. If that's your deal. Like I said about the swarm of bees, you, you got to come in with the right expectations. And Sega showed they colors. Now I've seen, you know, and, and it, it, it almost starts to feel like an abusive relationship. Because however many times this has happened with Sega, where they just flub things up and, 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 and sacrifice easy wins for... for I, I don't want to say it's for no reason. I, I'd like to think that everything Sega does is very deliberate and by design. And I, I think that Sega knows full well what they're doing. Whoa. Can I do a ground pound to save me? Sega knows exactly what they're doing, and that uh, for for fans to play along with that and, and to try to make sense of it and to hold out hope for a better tomorrow, um, this has been 10 years where Sega has released mostly unfinished garbage, right? The vision behind it is weak, and the execution and, and the actual making of the product is very weak. FNS3 asks what I think of the OST of TMNT Shredder's Revenge, assuming that I've listened to it. Yes, yeah, so I did actually get the game, and I think that that soundtrack is totally fantastic. I will say that T. Lopes, and of course we already knew this, anyone who's uh, played Sonic Mania and, and listened to it, T. Lopes, I, I, I would not hesitate to say that he is a, he's a visionary. He, he's able to do things and come up with things that I can honestly say that I couldn't have come up with. Um, and, and, and I just, uh, I have a great respect for T. Lopes in his composition process. Um, he's, he's been very open about the fact that, for example, he doesn't play instruments. He doesn't play any instruments. Everything that he does uh, to create music is all just, um, I guess, pointing and clicking on the screen. And that is just an indication that that approach is totally valid and fantastic um, and, and, and to be celebrated. And, and I, I will disagree with anyone who says, like, oh, you have to learn music theory or you have to learn an instrument. I, I would never in a million years insist uh, that, that anyone needs to do those things. Um, if someone was struggling with music and they came to me for help, I would say, yeah, d maybe learning the basics of the piano, taking a first theory class, right? But T. Lopes clearly ha has no need for that because he, dude, the <laughs> I think it's the boss theme in Shredder's Revenge. The, I remember that the boss theme is really good, and, and then there's this one song. I don't know if it's the skateboarding level, but it's just like a really fast beat. It's like, it's so badass. It gets you so pumped up to, to fight all those stupid purple enemies that hold on to the jewels every time you punch them. It's absolutely hilarious, and when they're holding their jewels, you could just walk up to them and grab them. And once you grab them, you can throw them toward the camera. You can slam them into the ground for an instant death, I guess you could say. Yeah, really great stuff. I, I, I think T. Lopes is a one-of-a-kind composer. And, uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I mean, I kind of joked on stream about, like, oh, this new Shredder's Revenge game, surprise game of the year, maybe. Um, whether or not it's game of the year... It, to me, is irrelevant. What I know is that me and a lot of other people have picked up that game and have just been blown away with it. And keep in mind, I'm not even like a long-time Turtles fan. I was aware of the Turtles. I think I maybe got my hands on a couple of comics as a kid somehow, but like I wasn't like a big fan. I didn't watch the show. So I come to the table with Shredder's Revenge with no you know, existing fan knowledge of, of the... Th and I think the game is absolutely fantastic. So I could only imagine what an absolute Ninja Turtles Disneyland that game is for like the game apologist and, and, and other people who are just Jay's reviews uh, as well. Huge. Y y y the way that he talks about... Uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you, you could just, it, it's that sort of thing where when people talk about it with a certain amount of passion and, and you can just tell that it really means a lot to them, um, that, that's always very exciting to see. Uh, but this home slice is going to need a few more caterpillars, two more to be exact.
Owen says Sega doesn't make any sense. Anakwa loves how they're just a PNG of bees. Did I miss the PNG? I love pointing out PNGs. Sometimes I will poke fun at the backgrounds in Sonic Heroes, which is a game that I absolutely love, and so does Owen Wyatt. It, it's a fantastic game, a very misunderstood game, and, and I don't... It, it doesn't surprise me that it's misunderstood because a lot of the people that really don't like it and the complaints that they file about it are the exact same thoughts and responses that I had on my first couple of playthroughs. And I think, did I already come up here? Uh, in the other season? Yeah, I grabbed the thing, and I went... So now I gotta go back. Kiwi Kiwi is in the house. And Kiwi Kiwi says, Hi, Alex, big fan. Thank you very much, Kiwi Kiwi. Any chance of me making a music theory video about Undertale? Um, right off the bat, I'll say absolutely yes, it's possible. It's by no means a guarantee or anything. Um, but uh, I'll say this. Every time someone requests something that increases the likelihood of it happening. Um, it, it's not the only factor, of course, but, you know, uh, I was always going to do BK videos uh, because it, this and Sonic are probably the most important influential soundtracks for my whole life. So I always knew I was going to do BK, um, but it, especially seeing people request it, um, even before I did the BK video, I'm like, hell yeah, let's do it. It's going to be a blast. Like, I, I always love sitting down to create a video like this, knowing that this is, you know, it, again, it's not just about placating, you know, the, the, the audience's focus group stated desires of what they want. But I, I, I know that there's a huge, genuine, and, and, and very warranted swell of appreciation for this soundtrack, as well as Undertale. I have played Undertale. I thought it was a pretty cool game, and the soundtrack is freaking fantastic, dude. That, that's a soundtrack that I definitely like listened to in the car a fair bit back in the day when I was driving all that often. Imagine that. I had a job at an office, and I had to get in the car every day, every weekday. had to get in the car and drive like a half an hour, and then, and then it would take 45 minutes to get back home, you know? All right, you think I can land on that leaf? It's a little bit risky. But I'll, I'll, I'll use a little bit of insurance. And let's see if I can land right on that pad. Actually, can that pad take me to the thing? That's probably a better way to go about doing this. So, yeah, Kiwi Kiwi, I, I appreciate that, that, that question because, yeah, Undertale. And also, I think Toby Fox, the composer of Undertale, um, is also maybe... I, I don't know what his theory training is, but I do know... I'm pretty sure that he was self-taught. Um, and, and, and that's just an increased amazing testament to the reality that you can come at music in any number of angles. And, and what works for this person could be different for another person. And we can all learn from each other, even if we don't use the exact same approach of thinking about music. Oh, okay. Anakra was talking about the bees... Um, that chase you once you destroy the honeycomb house. That's hilarious, yeah. It, it's, it's always fun to notice, like, little... F not that they're flaws, but, like, obviously playing this game years later, uh, that they stick out a lot more, you know? Uh, Peach Toast is in the house, and Peach Toast loves the Geek Critiques video on Sonic Heroes. I, I do enjoy that video. I've seen it at least twice, especially because Sonic Heroes is a game that's very polarizing, and I have come to champion, as has Owen. And, you know, like, one thing that the Geek Critique said about Sonic Heroes is that the pinball controls were very bad. Now, that was exactly my verdict for, for many years. And, you know, I after playing the game enough, I just happened to discover that there's a method of using the pinball controls in Sonic Heroes that's a little bit different from maybe your intuition, um, but it works a lot better for whatever reason. And specifically, that's like when you're trying to turn in Sonic Heroes, like move to the left, for example, if you just hold left to try to keep moving left, it's not going to do much. However, if you tap the button, uh, sorry, if you tap the joystick, like left, 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 like individual taps... Um, you will be amazed how much more control you actually have. And that literally has saved my ass 
especially in the bingo highway when there's those very high stakes things that you have to roll down and, and, and there's those danger areas where if you fall in once you, you just die um that's why i love watching videos by folks like the geek critique or king k because a lot of times i'll, I'll agree with what a lot of they're saying and then I, i'll see them uh, issue certain critiques of the game. Hey, speaking of geek critique, th that's the name of his business for that matter. Um, and, and I say like, well, hold on, hold on. Like, th it, It's totally fair to be frustrated with the pinball controls, um, but a and I would say that we should hold it against the game if those pinball controls are not intuitive. Uh, but especially since this is a GameCube game that we're talking about like two years later, um, Sorry, 20 years later, I should say. Two decades. I, I think it's valid to say, like, all right, the fact that we couldn't figure this out as kids, like, yes, we should count that against the game. However, the fact that we're still here playing with it, coming with it to an open mind and sharing tips uh, about stuff, it, it, I, I could trace that all back to the Barrel of Doom in Carnival Night Zone. I've never been bothered by the Barrel of Doom in Carnival Night because... It, it's just, it, it's an example where you have to think outside the box. You have to experiment. Maybe you have to talk with your friends at recess to, to talk about the certain parts of the levels that you get stuck on. Um, I, I went to a smaller private school growing up, so I didn't have, like, a, a ton of kids in my class. So, like, not even a lot of kids had the, the same games that I did. But, like, those those schoolyard conversations are, are very valuable, and it, it's, it's almost like hanging out here talking about this game online it is the modern equivalent of, of those awesome, you know, you share a secret with your friend uh, uh, in the schoolyard at recess, and then you go home and try it, and it's like, oh, I thought he was lying that if you get all the emeralds, you get to go to Doomsday, and you fly around in space to fri fight Robotnik. My friend told me about that. I thought he was just making crap up, but to go home and actually do that was like a, a certain type of mind-blowing, which, of course, Cybershell pointed out in his Banjo-Kazooie video that that element has kind of been lost a little bit. Um, what's it called? And then also the Geek Critique pointed out that a lot of the areas in Sonic Heroes um, have like, th they're kind of like gimmicks that don't really have a whole lot of interactivity. You're kind of just waiting for the automated thing to happen. And what's fascinating about that is that Sonic Heroes, much like Sonic 3, is actually a game that is jam-packed with all these little puzzles. Like, if you play Sonic Heroes the first time, there's going to be a lot of areas of levels where um, you're doing something that's clumsy. You're getting tripped up, you're having to stop, you're having to wait. If you play Sonic Heroes enough, you will discover many, many ways of doing those things more efficiently. Like, even a simple example is, like, when you're grinding on rails, some of those rails are very, very long, and you're just like, all right, I'm just sitting here waiting to, to get to the end of the grind rail. A lot of times, on those longer grind rails, if you actually pay attention to the environment, sometimes the camera is very, very deliberately scripted so that when you come on a certain rail... Um... Uh, whoops. When you come on a certain rail, the camera is angled to kind of hint at something in the background far away that actually feel like, oh, if I just jump off of this rail right now, um, I I'm going to get exactly where I need to go without waiting. The game is a treasure trove of discoveries like that. And like I said, Sonic 3 is the same thing. That There's so many, you know, clumsy, boring moments in Marble Garden, for example, that once you play the game enough, you start to experiment, you start to make mistakes, try different routes... It, each one of those little discoveries you find, it, it's almost like you find yet another moon in Odyssey. Like, you know how in Odyssey you're constantly looking around for moons, and, and when you find one, it's like a really satisfying, awesome discovery? Um, yeah, Sonic Heroes and Sonic 3 are, are exactly like that. James Sud says, Hey, Alex, thanks for everything I do. The vids help you through downtime between work and your bands. Keep them coming. I really appreciate that, James, and thank you for stopping by. It's always great to hear from people, d just to know, like, what... Like, folks that are getting something valuable out of the videos, I, I, I'm always so curious and interested and fascinated to know, like, what 
what's your deal with music in real life? Like, you, you know, you're interested in coming on YouTube and, and looking at music theory concepts from my channel or other people's channel. You know, it, it's so cool. Some people, such as James, are in bands. That's amazing. I'm so happy and glad that, you know, you have a band where you're getting together with, you know, your bandmates on a regular basis to, to practice and, and maybe perform sometimes live or, or often that... That's really tremendous to hear. Uh, I'm glad you're keeping the dream alive. A and not even just that it's a dream, just the fact that you're spending time in your life doing stuff that you love and you're interested in because you, much like me, probably find the, 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 the realm of music to be very exciting and, and it just it just pumps up your curiosity and, 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 and I find awesome, phenomenal discoveries within the realm of music and art all the time, and, and I get a, a very similar sort of excitement is when I discover new techniques to, to get through Sonic Heroes Bullet Canyon level more effectively. <laughs> um, and, and what's even better about learning about those things with music theory is that not only, like, when I find out a cool new maneuver in Sonic 3, I'm like, wow, this is cool. Hirokazu Yasuhara designed this fantastic architecture puzzle for me. And it, it, it was built in mind with Yuji Naka's one-of-a-kind vision, his exquisite code that, that, that gives you a very realistic, almost pinball-esque experience of physics. Um, and, and that, I, I would argue, is one of the biggest, if not the biggest things that defines Sonic's identity because Sonic was a response to Mario, right? Sonic was, uh, uh, you could even go far as to say that Sonic was a revision of Mario. Sonic, of course, owes a great debt to Mario. And it's not like it stole the idea, but it's like, all right, uh, Mario did something revolutionary or whatever, and, and then um, uh, Sonic came along and said, all right, I, I see what you did, and, and I'm going to show you a few different ways that um, this can be expanded and tweaked and revised. Not that it's superior, but that it's a, it's its distinct and own thing. And, and, and that's, you know... Uh, I could look at Banjo-Kazooie and say the exact same thing because Banjo-Kazooie, you know, I, I, I'd be cautious to use the phrase that Banjo-Kazooie owes a great debt to Mario. I, 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 I always hesitate to use the word debt because it's almost like means like you stole or like you owe them something in return. If you owe them anything, that debt is just acknowledging um, th their work and, and appreciating it. You know, like, I have mentioned Cybershell in at least one of my music theory videos. And th the reason I do it is not just to pay back a debt, but it's just a, a perfect and easy and memorable opportunity to do so. Because watching Cybershell's videos throughout the years, uh, way back even his Let's Plays, um, that, that absolutely had a forming influence on the, the, the kind of stuff that I do now. So... To, to, to be able to recognize that and celebrate that it is always, you know, a, a tremendous honor and, and a pleasure. Uh. Mastered Realm, for one, knows a little bit of music theory thanks to my videos. He <laughs> he. Yeah, and Mastered Realm, if anyone doesn't know, he's a really cool guy who... who uh, What's the word? Not heralds, not yields, but he uh, holding it down in Brazil. He he, he he's uh, he's from Brazil, and uh, one of many great things that I could say about him is that he he's got a creative you know vision, and he for example put together an awesome remix of the Ice Cap prototype music. Um, because of course we all know what we actually ended up getting in Origins for the prototype Ice Cap music, but. Mastered Realm made a really awesome remix of the Prototype Ice Cap, but he did it in kind of the style and rhythm and feel of the Brad Buxer Hard Times version of Ice Cap. And, and, and it's not like what Mastered Realm did is some like mind-blowing revolutionary thing, but the point is that Mastered Realm created that remix because he wanted to do it. He thought it would be fun, he thought other people would appreciate it, and he was absolutely right. And, and, and that, you know, the, the fact that someone could mod that track or, or any other track into the game is, uh, it, it just shows that we're unstoppable. 
we're unstoppable. As Sonic fans, a as fans of any sort of media, we can vibe with these games. We can listen to the music and adore it. Um, if the creators that we so admire disappoint us at times, it, it, it's not a, it, it's not an occasion to kind of give up, you know? And, and, and Mastered Realm is just one of many people that I've come across in the Sonic community that embodies that. And Anaqua is from Brazil, too. What a small world. I got to say, it, it it's very awesome to hear from folks in different countries. Um, and, of course, the YouTube analytics will, will give you at least a glimpse of the different countries that your viewers are, are coming from. And I got to say, I, I got to give a big shout-out to Brazil because... Um, a whole lot of love for the Sonic universe in Brazil and the music. A lot of South America, in fact, um, w which is super cool to see. Um, d Brazil loves Sonic the Hedgehog so much that I believe that they were the only even country to get a Master System release of Sonic Blast. So that tells you everything you need to know. Very cool that, you know, I, I, I don't know off the top of my head what the, the comparative... Uh, population is between like United States and United Kingdom versus the, the, the total population in Brazil but clearly the, the, there's a whole lot of love for Sonic and Sonic music in Brazil I'm all about it so big shout out to Brazil uh, if I should be so lucky to visit someday I, I, I really look forward to it because I've got nothing but awesome vibes from that there corner of, of our planet And here's Nabnuts. We're, we're tracking the, uh, the, the, the the journey of Nabnuts. Now, Nabnuts says he needs six acorns. And, you know, we cautioned him earlier in the year that if he just chills inside his house and munches them all down, he, he's going to be left out to cold. Literally out to cold when the winter comes, right? This is the age-old fable. Um, so I do have a little bit of mixed feelings earning this jiggy because... I'm just, I instead of teaching Nabnut how to catch a fish, I am just going and catching a fish and then just giving it to him. So as soon as he eats that fish, he's just going to be a as lost and helpless a as he was before I gave him these acorns. So, like, I, I, I wish this game had a DLC or, like, a future update for Xbox Live Arcade where we could really talk through things with Nabna and, and, and think about, like, all right, well we could we could put a Band-Aid on the problem right now by me collecting these acorns for you, or I can empower you to accomplish your own goals, you know, prioritize the, your saving of resources, um, and, and not only will you, you know, create a more safe and secure life for yourself, but you will actually also enjoy the process of seeking out these acorns. It'll be challenging and rewarding. You'll make mistakes. You'll learn things along the way. Um, but the game Banjo-Kazooie is an absolute masterpiece. I, I can forgive it for that little bit of a blind spot in its thematic storytelling. Delay is watching from over there in Europe. Terrionic wonders if I've played Sonic Roboblast 2. Not only have I played Sonic Robo Blast 2, but I am scheduled to stream it tomorrow on Twitch at approximately, I think, 4 p.m. I would have to check the exact schedule. But yeah, you, you want to ask me about Sonic Robo Blast 2? Whew, I, I, phew, such a good game. Um, and dude, it, it, it speaks to literally the exact same thing that I was just talking about Mastered Realm about. Um, the fact that the 3D Sonic formula could work, but the vision that Sonic Team has had throughout the past 20 years has just been a specific thing that has kind of a lot of unrealized potential. Um, and, and then you've got a, a devoted fan, like the, the fan, the original fan and the team of fans that kept working on Sonic Roboblast. When I play Sonic Roboblast and I get in the flow of things, like I, I think that Sonic Roboblast 2 succeeds in a way that all the other 3D Sonic games do not. What are the other best 3D Sonic games? I guess I would say Sonic Colors. Maybe kind of Sonic Generations. Um, the adventure games are pretty good. And I would also mention Heroes. Heroes is my actual personal favorite. But I, I wouldn't say it's like the best game. Uh, and, and I also would not say that all Sonic games should be like Sonic Heroes. Sonic Heroes is its own thing that very much, you know 
carves out its own niche within the Sonic formula. Um, it I w wouldn't want all games to go all in, but like uh, the fact that there that there needed to be at least one, like at a minimum, at least one game that um, uh, there had to be at least one game where you're walking around as Sonic Tails and Knuckles. And in the year 2022, th this concept is more important than ever because we all went to see that Sonic movie too. And at the end of that movie, we, we have the fantastic cinematic culmination where, all right, the tree, the, it's like I said in the Sky Sanctuary video, it's the genesis of a timeless trio. Um, to be able to run around as all three characters and to be able to switch between the characters seamlessly, literally at any moment, as long as you're standing on the ground or on a rail. The fact that you can switch characters on a rail. Jump ball. Uh, uh, it's pretty tremendous. Hi, the dude has noticed that I'm playing Sonic Robo Blast 2 tomorrow. Yeah, check out that schedule. So, I, this is probably an, a, a, a solid just housekeeping moment to say that I always create the Twitch streaming, s Twitch streaming schedules, you know, uh, on either Sunday or the Monday before my first stream of the week, and those will always be available on Twitter. Okay, a and even if you don't have a Twitter account, y you sh still should be able to just pop in and, and see the feed, even if you don't have the account. So if anyone's curious to see what I'm going to be streaming the week, I mention that simply because I don't want to. Um, use the Alex Yard and Knuckles channel to regularly post the streaming schedule for, for the reasons I mentioned before. Just having to do with the music theory main stage being its own thing. Um, and, but yeah, I, I always, whenever I do a community post on YouTube, I'm very deliberate about it. I'm falling again. Well, let's go to the winter, huh? Uh, uh, uh. Cause I keep falling. I keep falling. And maybe, just maybe, after I wrap up Click Clock Wood, I'll I'll do one attempt at Grunty's Furnace Fun. That's the 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 crazy wacky game show that you play to to finally rescue Tootie, you know. Because I've I. I <sighs> In the course of playing it, especially in, in the leading up to creating the Gruntilda's Lair music theory video, um, I tried to play Grunty's Furnace Fun, and it kicked my ass. It kicked my ass because the timed challenges, like it will basically send you back to worlds to, to do these individual mini games that you did in the world itself, but you have to do it in a much smaller amount of time because the timer has less second time. And you, you know, who could forget the moment in the YouTube video where I come over here and then it's got the wipe that switches to winter and then I'm walking on the ice. Uh, a gorgeous meditation uh, on this game's, you know, breathtaking portrayal of the passage of time across the four seasons. It's the circle of life in Click Clock Wood. Finding jiggies and mumbo tokens. And I absolutely love the hilarious ha 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 laughter of these evil snowmen. Like, they seem like mafia mob bosses. I love it. I gotta get the hell out of this area because this ice cube I is looking for a drink and it's not successfully finding one, so it's trying to gobble me up instead. Uh, can I escape? Yes. And I think I'll get hurt if I go in that cold water, so look at me at the end of my rope, yet again stuck with one honeycomb. What a concept. Anakwa finds the winter season in Click Clock Woods strangely uncanny. So you think this rendition of Click Clock Wood is, like, kind of realistic in, in a way that the other seasons are not? I, it, it's This is such a masterpiece of a level, and the music is a big part of that. Um, I think that even playing this as a kid, 
when I finally got here, just the emotional gravity of it really um, sunk in and, and really hit home. You know, just a meditation on the circle of life, like I was crazily singing about a moment ago. Um, you know, uh, life goes on, you know, you, you, you get raised, and, 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 and when you grow up in this life, you, you're raised by a community. And when I say that, I mean it's not just your parents, it's not just your feelings, it's your teachers, it's your friends. Every time you have a meaningful conversation with those people, you're, you're helping each other along on this grand old journey of life. And, you know, uh, we're here, we do our parts, we're here with the plants and the trees and the earth, uh, and, and like all things, they, they will eventually pass. So looking at the, you know, the, the calm, quiet uh, snow here at Click Clock Woods winter is say like, yes, I accept this. This is how it works. Eventually you do have to let go and, and, and nothing lasts forever in our life. Um, but every goodbye is just fertile grounds for new beginnings, so don't forget that. <laughs> I had to do points out a hilarious observation about the health meter, which is that Banjo and Kazooie go from happy to mad to pissed in just two hits. It's hilarious. Yeah, I, I always caution folks that when, if they're reacting to something and they're really upset about it, um, it's just not, it, it, it's not productive. It's not going to help you in the long run if you go from zero to 60. Just like Banjo and, I, I guess Banjo and Kazooie's uh, expressions in that health meter it, it is maybe a different case because literally, if they do take another hit, I, I think within the canon of the story, they die, right? It, it, it's a non-canon ending, but... It's nonetheless content that, that you do witness. Um, th they have more of a reason to. But if, if you're really upset by something, don't immediately just erupt into frustration and anger, especially in our modern Internet world where you have a lot of news outlets and, and even people on Twitter or whatever other social media that a big part of their business strategy is deliberately saying things in a way that will get a reaction in you. So when you look at a, a tweet about a video game or a news story that's written by a publication that has a, a, a political slant one way or the other, a big engine of how they're trying to succeed is to get you worked up. So I just say just be on the lookout for that. Don't let a single YouTube comment or a single news article about someone's outrageous claim, don't let that don't don't let that get your heart rate up, okay? Don't let that make you start breathing heavier or get your heart rate up because you are just playing in to, to part of their strategy. Um, any meaningful truth that you have to confront that might not be easy at first, um, it, yeah, don't make any drastic decisions in, in how you react to things. Tom Moore also skipped some of the time challenges, uh, probably in the Grunty's Furnace Fund, because you struggled with the bosses when on low health, and working memory not good enough for Tiptoe's uh, Tip Top Squire. Yeah, I, I, sometimes I amaze myself with the Tip Top Squire thing because it's hard. You do have to memorize some of those longer patterns, and what's even worse than that is that when they show you the the, the pattern of the of the turtles that you have to memorize. As soon as that sequence is done, the camera will cut back to Banjo, and then you have to walk to the turtles, and it's now you're at a different camera angle. Like, it's very disorienting. So if I come across that thing in Grunty's Furnace Fun, it, it could get ugly. It could get ugly. Uh, but that's okay. Yeah, I always am a little bit reluctant with memory-related games. And the other thing in Grunty's Furnace Fun that was giving me a whole crap ton of trouble was the mini game in Gobi's Valley where it's the it's a memory game that I actually like a lot more. It's the one where there's 16 tiles and it's basically like a memory match game. You flip the tiles and, and you got to get like two banjos in a row, two honeycombs in a row. And as a boring memory game, it's a little bit weak, but what puts that All right, screw this, man. <laughs> 
I keep falling. Am I going to die now? Da, 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 da. Oh, I got my one health. All right. If I fall and die one more time, that, that might be a wrap. But yeah, the reason why that particular Gobi's Valley memory game is actually great is all because of there's that one enemy, the mummy, that will, you know, you can hit it and it will die, but it will always, like, after, like, 10 seconds, like, get up and start walking again. So you constantly have to be paying attention to it. A and what's more cool about that is, why don't I just go do it now? Hell yeah. What's cool about that is that you can actually kill the mummy by, uh, what's it called? By flipping the tiles. If you flip the tile that the mummy is standing on, then it will hurt it and, and it will like deactivate it for five seconds, like I was saying. So that's like an incredible thing that I'm always looking and enjoying uh, that. When I find aspects of games that are like that, it's like you find a clever, more efficient way of doing it. You're always thinking ep economically. You want the maximum outcome with the with the least amount of like, I don't know, moves or buttons pressed, right? You're, you're always looking for efficiency. And you want to know why Hideo Kojima's games are so good in that regard? Well, one factor in that is the fact that Hideo Kojima, creator of Metal Gear Solid, his... Me oh, I love this camera angle right now. Hideo Kojima's major in college was in fact economics. Right? And if you think of a game like Metal Gear Solid 3 where you're going through the forest, you're having to strategize about your resources because like, you have to find enough food to, to juggle your stamina meter. You've got to make sure you don't come across any poison items. You, you have to ration your rations. And, and, and that, that, that's, uh, I enjoy that aspect of every video game, and, and it's become an important part of the way that I experience Sonic 3, where I'm thinking about ways to maximize my point score but I have to juggle a, a couple of different priorities, time and rings. I, I got to get through fast enough to get a good time bonus, but I also have to, you know, use the limited time and the level that I have to get the most rings as possible. I, I would highly recommend that anybody who's just interested in thinking good take like a free online course in economics. Just take Economics 101. It, it it it's just a very very helpful and good perspective on how to solve problems, how to think through problems, and, 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 and weigh the cost-benefit analysis of any scenario, and, and, and make a choice that, it, that is a win-win for as many different people as possible. Little answer is all she seeks about this game. Me and her look just the same. Grunty's sister, what's her name? That's way too easy, it's Bog Handle. Nah, just playing. It's Brentilda. But you got scared for a sec. You were about to say, wait, Alex, no. All right, now we're going to look at something. And these are so clever and cool that they usually give you, like, a really close-up view of something. Ooh, that's got to be Mumbo's Mountain, right? The tower that you climb up as an ant. Hop, two, three, four. Hop. I'm crawling it. Mumbo's Mountain. Let's do this thing. Alex G knows what's up. Supply and demand. Dude, supply and demand. Uh, explain so much in just modern society or whatever. What's next? Click Lock Wood. I was just there, and I was just there in the winter. What's Mumbo doing in his skull? Mm, in the winter, I'm uh, warming by the fire. I think he's not there. I think he's not there. Uh, I'm going to go with my gut. Hell yeah. And, and that's just such a beautiful touch that it's like, all right, it's winter. People have, uh, it, it's kind of like how, you know, the birds, if, if you're up in New England, a lot of the flying aviary birds that fly around throughout the summer, in the winter, they leave. It, it's, it, it's, it's a natural evacuation, and, and it's just a beautiful way that the pendulum of the universe continues to swing back and forth, doing its thing. Now, what sound effect is this going to be from? Listen up, then make your choice. Which character... Oh, I need to put the volume up. I'm not actually sure. Nippa? What? It's got to be the whale, right? But is there a whale in this game? I know Nipper is real, but I don't think it's Nipper. I'm going to go with the whale, even though... Uh, no, Nipper. Uh, <laughs> I went against my instincts. Uh, oh, well. 
Penny Pizza is weighing in to say that this game is awesome, and I would agree entirely. Now that, Burper, that's got to be Scrappy. No, the, the pirate from Treasure Trove Cove, right? Oh, no, that's the toilet. I think it's Lago, which is hilarious because that's an overt recognition of calling that thing that you find in a toilet a log. Penny Pizza wonders, what is my favorite level in Banjo-Kazooie? What a great question. What quickly comes to mind is maybe Gobi's Valley. I think that that level just looks so cool as an overall environment with so many, di you know, you got the, the, the sand waterfalls over here, you got the pyramids over there, you got, you know, riding the magic carpet to, to go see Gobi. I, I, I just, and then the fact that you free Gobi and then Gobi shows up again in Click Clock Wood is wicked, wicked cool. And then, if that's not enough, in this game, what's in the eye of Mumbo Skull? What level is this? It's probably a mumbo token. Damn. Oh, Tom is saying that Clanker w would be registered as a whale. But yeah, as I was saying about Gobi's Valley and Click Clock Wood, after Gobi, when Gobi leaves Click Clock Wood, he says, all right, I'm out of here. I I'm going to the lava world where you'll never find me. Game ends, couple years pass. Uh, oh, I think he said autumn. Yeah, so autumn would be 10. And then when you play the sequel, Banjo-Tooie, sure enough, what is it, the Hailfire Peaks, the, the level that has half of it is lava, the other half is snow. Uh, yeah, lava, who do you find? Gobi T. Camel, the only one. All right, this is one of the time challenges. It might get ugly, but let's find out together. Should I get the health? Oh, no, I can't. Penny Pizza, I want to ask, what is your favorite level in Banjo-Kazooie? Well, I'm, I'm glad this is the, uh, the, the bees combat part because I literally just did it like a half hour ago or whatever. But yeah, 30 seconds, you really can't afford to miss a lot of these bees. I feel like you have to get every other bee. All right, it was seven seconds to boot. Shouldn't I be getting an award or something? <sighs> Delay is doing computer science, and, and you'd say that's a, uh, a solid economic substitute. Yeah, I, I would agree that... Um, uh, what's it called? Sorry, I was distracted by this, because these are the quizzes that you have to answer, the, the answers that her good sister told you about Grunty, and, and it's different for every save file, so this is going to be, as we call it, a crab shoot. Dirty, dirty, dirty birdie. Oh. It wasn't Greasy Grant. Was it Undead Ed? You're telling me it was actually the first one? Good thing I have that awesome ability from the Tom Cruise movie called... What is it? Edge of Tomorrow, Live, Die, Repeat, where every time he makes a mistake and dies, he just starts the whole day over again. That, that's basically what I just did. Anakwa's favorite level is Treasure Trove Cove and Mad Monster Mansion. And of course, Mad Monster Mansion I I is a beloved song by that there Grant Kirkhope. He cited it, as I mentioned in the video, his favorite composition in the whole series. And it's a darn good one. Monster Mansion, you can creep. What wakes the ghost from... It's stepping on the floor, right? And it creaks. Creaky floorboards. Floorboards. Penny Pizza's favorite level is a hard choice between Treasure Trove Cove and Ghost... Yeah. It, you mentioned... You, uh, Penny Pizza is also mentioning Freeze Easy Peak. And, yeah. I, I, I think that the one-two punch of... Freeze Easy Peak, followed by Gobi's Valley, is, is really fantastic. Should I go? Yeah, I'm going to go. This this route, eh, yeah, I'm going to go this way. If this is heard, I think this is the Bubble Gloop Swamp. 
combat when you're fighting the, the uh, wouldn't you, it's, no, not bees, it is fishes. Wait, oh no, maybe that's just, that's got to be the hornet, hornet hive. Yeah, that was the music I just heard before. I thought it was the, the frogs in Bubble Gloop Swamp. But how could I think that? Because it's click clock wood. Do -do 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 -do. Rusty Bucket Bay's whistles. I think it's this. Three, one, two. Did you like the part of the video where I included the three different whistles? That was like when I when I first played that back, I just laughed my ass off. Um, just seeing those realistic clips occur in time with the Rusty Bucket whistles. <laughs> And, and when I saw that, I laughed almost as hard as the first time I played back the part in the launch base video where the death egg crashes to that melody. This has got to be Freeze Easy Peak, right? The Christmas tree? You're damn right, Wubba Zubba. And Iceborne, I have heard of Skies of Arcadia, but I've never played it. I think that's a turn-based RPG, which is generally not uh, my cup of tea. Every couple of years, uh, I'll get in the mood to play a, a game uh, that's like... Because I think it's turn-based, right? Paper Mario and Bug Fables being two of the more notable entries that I've had fun with in the past few years. Uh, broomstick? Oh, this is just a bullcrap. Brentilda question? Edge of Tomorrow, Live, Die, Repeat, starring Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt, available on demand. As we speak. Oh, I went backwards. Oops. All right, so I just... I'll just take a different route. I had a dude is thinking about doing another run of Sonic Robo Blast 2. And... Probably my favorite level in Sonic Robo Blast 2 is Castle Eggman. What the hell's going on? Oh, oh, I I always get confused because when you get the answer right, the audience goes boo, but that's because the audience is like cheering for Grunty, you know? I had a dude is on Chapter 7 of Bug Fables. I think I made it about halfway. I think I got to, like, Chapter 4 or something, and then the game just started kicking my ass. Which season? Is there a drought? I guess summer? I wasn't even paying attention to the question. But summer? Drought? That checks out. Luigi Bud thinks Castle Eggman's music is really good, and I would agree. It's really awesome. I, I think the Castle Eggman music is so awesome. In part because, like, the first act, the way the rhythm is like, do 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 do, one, two, three, one, two, three. It's like not what you would typically expect in a Sonic game, but the fact that in Act Two, it settles into like a more traditional 4 4 beat and, and just takes that chord progression and really just takes it to a whole new level. It's really awesome when you have an Act Two remix like that. It's part of why Sonic 3's soundtrack is so remarkably incredible. What the hell, man? I I tried massive bloomers, a flea circus. Is it saying they're all wrong, or did I not try the last one? Was that so hard, Alex? Iceborn confirms that Skies of Arcadia is a turn-based RPG. With a great soundtrack. And yeah, the original on Dreamcast was two discs. Remember those ages? And I remember they did a bit about it in Metal Gear Solid 4. They're like, all right, uh, Snake, it's time to switch over to disc 2. And then Snake is like, what? Th we're on the PlayStation 3. We got... Blu-ray discs. Get a grip. Breaking the fourth wall like a madman. Good old Hideo Kojima. Rusty Bucket Bay. Uh, I'm not actually sure what that was. It was probably the mansion. Damn. All right, fair and square. I got that wrong. 
Now the sound is kind of getting all choppy and screwed up, huh? That must sound unbearable. That's a little better. All right, let's take a look. This is Mad Monster Mansion, and it looks like it might be like Mumbo's Mountain or something foresty. But indeed, I recognize that exact little area. And Grant Kirkhope would too, if assuming he's played a lot of the game that he did this wonderful score for. Chilius VGM is in the house. How you doing, Chilius? On Terionic Wonders. Would I ever do a music theory video on Sonic Rubble Blast 2? I, I would say that there's a very real possibility of that because I think that music is so tremendous and it, yeah. I, I mean, I just even found out on the other, s hold on a sec. Uh, termite? I, I wasn't paying attention. Um. Uh. Yeah, Sonic Robo Blast 2. In fact, over at the Alex Yard Zone Discord for patrons where cool folks like Chilius BGM hang out, someone, I think it was Conic and Snuckles, great username, who recently shared a, a, a couple of, um, this is Tread Trove Cove, a couple of, like, albums that came out. It's like one of them is Virtual Sonic. Maybe I was the one who shared that one, but the other album is like some kind of Sonic and Knuckles arrangement CD that they put out. And basically, I think I could have this partly wrong, but there there's an extended version of the composition for the Sonic and Knuckles theme, I think, that includes the exact melody from Sonic Robo Blast 2. At the beginning, it's like... Dun -dun -dun. Dun -dun 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 -dun. Like, it's literally... So, like, to, it's such a cool Easter egg to discover like that, because I had played Sonic Robo Blast 2 first. Now, with this little mini boss, you just got to be confident. You, you have to just keep doing your beak buster attack, not ask questions, just head right, and you almost kind of want to stand in a manner so that if there are multiple boxes hopping around, only one of them can, like, get to you because they're kind of all in a line, and they don't do the... See how they don't do the best job of, like, walking around each other to get to you? It's kind of like in bad movies where the main character is fighting a whole bunch of different enemies, and even though there's, like, 20 enemies... Like, only one of them will step up to fight the protagonist at once. You got 15 seconds. Got a little hairy, but I think I'm going to come out alive. Anakwa is also interested in maybe some Bomberman. I can't say I have as much experience with Bomberman. Um, I, I think literally it's just I, I got a Nintendo 64 game once. I rented it a couple... I think we rented it one or two times. I kind of liked it. Which character has this dumb voice? Oh, we could never forget that voice. That's our favorite camel. Even better than Joe the camel is Gobi the camel. Don't Google Joe the camel. Yeah, I'll do another musical thing to just to get the uh, the honeycomb. Pick up items on the ground. Which one makes this silly sound? Ooh, I'm not sure. I feel like that noise only happens like once or twice in the entire game. Somehow I pulled it out of my hat, people. T Dog 0041 wonders how did I get into music theory? Well, I had taken a little bit of uh, instrument lessons at different parts of my childhood, a little bit of drums, a little bit of piano, but I didn't really stick with it. Um, but then when I got to college, I started writing songs, writing my own music, you know, like rock songs with lyrics. I would play all the instruments, and I would write the songs, and I would record all the instruments, you know, separately on, on a track and layer them all together. Flowers, it's got to be flowers, right? Um, and so when I got to college, I, you know, was picking some electives, and I was like, ooh, one of my electives, I, I could do music theory. And just that one class, I'm not paying attention to the course, that one class that I took, uh, it, it was just a single semester, pretty much. It was music theory 101, 
Um, I absolutely fell in love with music. Th that was a class that I really applied myself. I, I, I put in like a full deliberate effort. I always did my homework on time. I was so interested in the stuff. And, and the professor that I had, I, I was very, very fortunate. Uh, squirrel is outside in the winter. Grass is high as the autumn. It's got to be that, right? Damn. Look at me swinging and missing. So yeah, that, that was really the only single class that I took. But just taking that one class, and then I kept the textbook, and over the years, every now and then, I'd come back to the textbook and like read ahead to some of the chapters that we didn't get to in Theory Class 101. I highly, highly recommend, if anyone's a little bit interested in music theory, yeah, see if you can take, you know, an inexpensive, you know, one semester class, even if it's in your, your spare time, like, to have a great, I was very fortunate to have a great professor who was able to, like, ask all the questions, the things that I was wondering about. Um, which color ginjo is a fake? This should be easy. There's no brown ginjo. Yeah, having a great teacher goes a long way, but even if you don't have a super outstanding teacher like I was fortunate to do, even just having a person that you can talk through things in real time and ask real, that that's it. You'd be amazed how much a one semester course can lay a, a very, very useful foundation for you. Seronymous is in the house. How you doing, Seronymous? Seronymous is a longtime commenter. Always great when you pop in. This has got to be inside the boat in Treasure Trove Cove, because it's underwater, I would guess. I'm going with my gut. Damn right. Now we've got two Grunty questions. Do, 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 do. Hey, it's Grunty's motif. I wonder why. It's because I stepped on a Grunty space. What's hanging from my bedroom roof? This is just a Brentilda bit. So I'll just guess the guesses in order. And it was right. If you go down in the woods today, you're in for a big surprise. If you go down in the woods today, you better go in disguise. Oh, you think I'm out of the game? Uh-uh, rotting fish, let's do it. Oh, you think I'm out of the game? Uh-uh. No, it is smelly socks. I got a save state on the second space. T Doug 0041 says, Thanks for sharing. Super interested in music theory since your vids. Well, I'm really glad to hear that, T Dog. And, and I would also add that if, you know, time and circumstances don't allow you to, to take a full college course, um, I, I, I'd like to think that there are great resources available online. That, that even, you know, someone for free who's just coming to the table, free resources. I, I kind of wish I had a. a a definitive, like, free online course that, that I could direct people to. But hey, maybe I'm just going to have to make one myself. Would y'all like that? It would take me a couple weeks, but... Oh, that's so disgusting, that answer. Uh, Seronymous says that I didn't even expect you to recognize you, so thank you. Yeah, and, and I'll just take that opportunity to say that I, I'm so appreciative of comments. I still read 100% of comments. Um... And a bubble fish. It's got to be bloop, right? Um. So yeah, I, I thank you for the comments. I I I will only. I usually only respond if I have something to add. Like if someone just has kind words, I, I may give it a heart. I may just look at it. Um, but I do absolutely read 100% of comments, and, and I'll tell you that even now, after the Banjo-Kazooie video and the new subscribers that have come in, it's still m more than feasible to read every single comment. So thank you so much for people's thoughts in the comments. Uh, Seronymous also asks, what's the time on the quick clock face? Oh, that's difficult. Wow, that was a stab in the dark. Seronymous is also curious, is that my natural voice or do I affect it? Because Seronymous thinks that I could be a voice actor, honestly. Well, I really appreciate that, Seronymous. And I can tell you that this is just Alex Yad talking like he talks to everybody every day. And um, it's funny you say that. I, I, I've never really been good at, like, impressions per se. But a week or two ago on stream, 
I was talking about the Sonic 3 soundtrack and Michael Jackson, and, and I was just... I, I ended up doing a brief impersonation of Michael Jackson. And, and like, it came out way better than I would have thought when I went back and listened to the stream, so I guess I can do a Michael Jackson voice decently well. I'm not going to do it now, but I will definitely do it in the future. If if I have a contextual reason to do so. I, I just don't want to be like a Toy Story Woody pull toy where every time you just pull the wire and he'll do different sounds and, and, and statements on command. You, you don't want to turn your life into a pull toy dynamic, but I had a very deliberate reason to do the Michael Jackson voice that day, and maybe I will have a reason to do a Tony Soprano voice in the future. That was a horrible impression. Uh-oh. All right. I got to be on top of my game now because I have to spell this backwards. This is nuts. So we got start with E. This is like when you get pulled over for suspected drunk driving, which is never and never will happen to me. But sometimes they ask you to spell the alphabet backwards. So I don't know if Rareware was just trying to, you know, prepare us for that. I, I would say don't prepare for that. If you're drunk and you get caught, you should get arrested. Uh, Because I'm not going to do this. Ooh. I need another O. And then I need a Z, followed by an A. I can see my A. And then a K. I'm saying this grab out loud to help me process the data. Come on, K. Uh, and then I need an O, right? I'm not going to do it. J. It's way over there. Sorry, cop. I, I didn't pass this particular test, but I've never did driven drunk, and I never will. Rago GBA points out that, hell yeah, that would be great. An online music theory course in depth sounds awesome. Yeah, I, I'd love to be able to do something like that. I was kind of kidding that it would take two weeks. But um, I, I do think it's a very worthy goal, especially because, like I said, a as of right now, th there's nothing that I can think of to point you to in terms of a free resource. I did try to use, if any of you have heard of Coursera, Coursera is a free... It's basically you take college courses for free. And, you know, it, it's pretty much just, you know, you're able to listen to the lectures. There are quizzes for certain things. And I, actually, I did take an economics class through Coursera because uh, I was just interested in, in learning about that stuff. And so I tried to, uh, out of curiosity, I started doing the Coursera music theory course. And it was horrible. It was truly horrible. I was really disappointed. And I can tell you right now why it was so horrible. Case in point, the very first lesson, the very first lesson, uh, one of the things that it spent some of the time in that lesson on was to say, like, all right, here's the Dorian scale. Here's the Mixolydian scale. They literally showed you all seven scales on the screen at once. They didn't play any of them to see what they sounded like. But they're just explaining it in this abstract way. They're like, yeah, here's all seven of these scales. Uh, you're going to have to memorize these and know them or something. You know what I mean? Like that is, you'll notice that if I talk about something like the Mixolydian scale, like I did in the Carnival Night Music Theory video, um, I'll do that because I have a specific reason to bring it up and I have a specific thing that I'm going to apply it to an example in the song. But to just come out on day one and say, all right, here's these seven scales you're going to have to memorize. You're not learning. You're just memorizing. Anyone can memorize. A kindergartner could memorize. That That is next to useless in my accurate opinion. So I'm always giving practical applications uh, of those concepts and, and that's what I would be doing. That's kind of what I'm already doing in my music theory videos. I, I do think that if you watch each of my videos like a few times, you will notice common vocabulary being used across the videos. And that's valuable because now you don't have to sit down and memorize vocabulary. You just kind of learn it passively and naturally by the course of seeing those principles applied in action in, in a very intuitive and accessible way, even if you have zero music theory background. Random guy on the internet, great username, 
I do live streams. Damn. You love the Sonic videos and especially the Donkey Kong one. And you've yet to check out the Banjo one. Yeah. So we do, of course, have the awesome Donkey Kong video. I really like that one. That was... Even that video was a special case because that was... It's the only video that I've done this for. But that video was co-written with Ardclaw. Now, Ardclaw is a great buddy of mine. I've known him for a long time since back in the old Ololilia days. That's how we... Um, came across each other's work is because Ololilia was designing his video game, Platform Masters. And he basically opened it up to the entire internet to do submissions. And so both Ardclaw and I submitted music to Ololilia's project, and and, and we really liked the, the, the songs that each other had done. So... I've stayed in contact with him, and now in the music theory videos, he's, um, a lot of the remixes that you hear in the videos are done by him. Like, for example, the recent thing is the Carnival Night video, when there was that remix of the song Jam by Michael Jackson. Um, to avoid copyright stuff, I, I, I try to avoid playing the real clip of the actual song, and, 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 and that just becomes a fun, creative opportunity for Ardclaw to, to come up with a new imagined version of the song. And, and I just, I cannot speak highly enough about Ardclaw's musical vision. Um, he composes music that is just, uh, you know, uh, on a next level of genius. Like, sometimes when I listen to music, I'm like, all right, this is really good, but I can see what they're doing, and, and, and like, it, it, I, I can see how a person would come up with this. I could even see myself coming up with, like, a similar idea or a similar motif, okay? But Ardclaw? No! -ho. Ardclaw comes up with stuff that just sounds so incredibly good and unique and memorable, and it's like he... It, it, it. Folks that are really into music, and especially when you have pals that you talk about music with, it's like when it comes to talking about music and noticing cool things in songs, it's almost just like you, certain friends just speak your language. They, they understand how you think about music and, and what things you're looking for in it. And there's just, you know, uh, individual moments on Ardclaw's albums that I just, like, uh, that that incredible moment right before the pre-chorus that, that leads into the verse. Um, such such a nice small touch, but it's attention and it's care and it's passion. And, and that's what Ardclaw is all about. So big shout-out to Ardclaw for helping out with um, the, the remixes and, and just... Um, yeah, he, he, he steps in for the certain things that I, myself, do not specialize in. Alright, these time challenges are very difficult. Let's see what... Oh, uh-oh, Tom, it's the tip-top part. I gotta be on top of my game. Watch as the turtles sing day song. Repeat it quick. You won't get long. Alright, it's on. Alright, it's starting on purple up at the left. Back to purple. Back to purple again. And then blue. Yikes. All right. Purple, 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 purple. I think it's this. And then this. And then I think I have to go back to the purple. Is this the last one? Uh-oh, is it red? There's one more, huh? I don't even... I can't even... Uh, Seronymous is a visual learner to a fault, so my videos help out a lot. So much of music feels like a walled garden sometimes, like I was tempted to believe I missed out on music school, so no hope. Yeah. Seronymous touches upon a, a very important point, and I appreciate you that you're saying that, Seronymous, because that's been kind of one of the, I don't know if you could say, like, mission statements of the way that I approach the videos, but I, very much like you, process things a lot more effectively when it's in a visual format. There's no way I'm going to be able to memorize this, but let's give it a shot, huh? But yeah, uh, I'm glad you're connecting with it. I, I think that that visual approach um, helps a lot of people. A and, and I would further add, Seronymous, that I don't think... I, I wouldn't even consider a, a concept like that to be like, oh, you you're a visual learner to a fault. 
I say that especially, you know, with my background as an education major in college, everybody has a different learning style, and all those learning styles are, are different and, and equally legitimate. So I, I salute you, Seronymous, for recognizing your own learning profile and, and, and seeking out media that accommodates it well. I think red's first. Uh, death. Now, I genuinely thought that um, maybe I could come back here and, and, and get that joker. Because I think if you get a joker, you can skip. Do I have any jokers yet? If you have a joker, you can skip a box. No. All right. So let me risk it and, and go to this instant death panel. That's a good business strategy. Delay finds it difficult to apply uh, music theory. You would imagine writing your own music wouldn't be as difficult if you could decide to stick to music theory. Yeah, I would just say... Um, it the bed doing anchors propels. Oh, it, it is anchors, isn't it? I would just say that um, if... Not that this is specific to you, but if a person is trying to learn music theory, I highly recommend, like like I was saying, a college class, just one college class is ideal. But if it's not a college class, just do something deliberate where it's like y you're starting at a logical endpoint rather than just like searching from video to video and, and just grabbing bits and pieces and, and trying to contextualize it all together. That can be next to impossible to do, and it is extremely valuable to have like a structured set of like lessons or tasks somehow that that like that a a and what's good about that is that you stick with it because you always know what is the next step the next step is just to look at the next chapter or, or whatever it is you know do i know where i have been doesn't rhyme with scream Ooh, that could be click clock wood uh that could be mumbo's mountain oh they know me well yeah, where the hell were those red flowers? I Damn, man. I flubbed up. At least I didn't fall into the lava. That would have been embarrassing. All right, there's red flowers at the mountain. Uh, stone... Sisnik is saying, still waiting for Hydrocity Zone music theory. And, and I'll say this as a little bit of teasers. When when we start the Sonic Mania portion of tonight's stream, uh, I'm going to play Sonic Mania. And when I get to Hydrocity Zone, I'm actually going to do a quick pause on the game, and I'm going to appear on camera, and, and I'm going to have a kind of keynote address. It's, like, it's going to be a short little thing where I appear on camera and talk through a few things as it relates to that second level of Sonic My Hedgehog 3 and Knuckles. Um, so there's your little teaser. Oh, let me, now I can get my jack. What's his name? I think it's... Uh, if I see it, I'll know it. Snacker, because he's looking for a snack, a.k.a. you. Delay now knows a few things about music theory. My videos taught you a few basic concepts very well. A and that's great to hear, Delay, especially because, yeah, I I'd like to think that, if nothing else, my videos can be effective for teaching you those first initial building blocks. A and then I would think that you could watch my videos a few times, especially, you know, people pointing out that they rewatch them. Just doing that, I, I think that you would have a, a, a kind of a helpful head start when you actually do, if you do sit down to do any sort of formal instruction like that. Like a class or any sort of online module. Tom's hype is increasing exponentially. That's what I'm all about. All right, I, I do want to get a honeycomb, because what the hell? Random guy on the internet further asks, 
How would I recommend learning an instrument? You just started learning guitar and started practicing it again after a few days off. Well, this is definitely Freeze Easy Peak. Yeah, instrument. I mean, that is a a, a, a whole big... Uh, uh, it's Freeze Easy Peak. Here's what I'll say about an instrument. I think that a piano is a fantastic starting point because with a piano, you, you're... <laughs> it sounds so obvious to say, but you're, you're pressing buttons on a panel. I, I distinguish that as different from a guitar because a guitar, you have to really... It, it, it's a whole additional technical skill set that you have to develop to be able to move your fingers efficiently and, and press with enough pressure and, and, and build up those calluses uh, on your fingers. That, that can be an additional layer of challenge that, that can make it hard to, to keep going, I guess. Piano, like I said, uh, a very inelegant way of putting it is that it's just a row of buttons in a row. Especially because a piano has a much smaller barrier to entry. You could go on Amazon right now and buy a MIDI keyboard that just has like two octaves and then plug it into your computer and, and you'd be able to even just practice scales or, or try out musical concepts like that. So in terms of learning a new instrument, I, I would highly recommend piano. Rusty Bay, what was on the shelves? Feathers. Oh, was it the... I think it was the eggs. All right. All right, three more spots to go. Can I do it? None of your business. Awesome. You, so many hilarious, great usernames. None of your business has popped in to say, love the channel, awesome analysis of BGM. And yeah, I, I would say a similar thing to what Neil deGrasse Tyson says, which is that... I definitely appreciate the praise. I can only take so much credit for it because it part of what I'm doing is just being a good reporter. I, I'm going and finding awesome, fascinating things, and I'm conveying to them to you effectively, but a big part of the magic is the thing itself, right? The, the music in Banjo-Kazooie is so extraordinary that uh, part of the magic of, of what we're doing here is just, like conveying information effectively, but the music stands on its own as just a, a, a total, uh, really admirable work of art. A work of art. Miss Carrie's Corner's name is Chase at 11 years old. Well, hello, Chase. A huge fan. What instrument is the best starting band? Yeah, like I was saying, piano all the way. Um, it. All right, what music is this from? We all know this one. It's Grant Kirkhope's favorite of the bunch. The reason, a big reason why I typically feature piano in my music theory videos is, again, for that very visual reason. It's much easier to represent music visually on a piano. Like, the things that I do on a piano, I couldn't do with a flute. There would be no way of conveying what I'm talking about with a flute. And if I tried to do it on guitar, it would only really make as much sense to people who understand how a guitar is set up. But a piano is so wonderful because it's just you move left to right and you go from lower notes to bigger notes. It's clear cut. It, it doesn't require any extra training. You can just look at it and make sense of it, you know? So, yeah, I, I, I cannot sing the praises of piano high enough because all those spells she lends, whom at school was your best friend? Oh, I remember that Bruntilda told me the answer to this. But it wasn't Sweaty Betty. It was, however, Saggy Maggie. Poor Maggie. That's her distinguishing characteristic. I hope she had her own friends. Chauncey Curley appreciates what I do, and I appreciate the kind words. Pick the one that's true today. The engine room has four cogs. I think that means four lifeboats. Maybe not. Ship has three funnels. I have no idea. Four cogs or three. <laughs> Imagine if you were a kid and you died on the very last question. I'm sure this is very hard, and this must have taken me so many god darn tries. The crocodiles in the swamp give you the names of what they chomp. Yumblies and <laughs> grumblies. I love how Mr. Vile says, avoid the yellow yumblies. They not ripe. 
It's one of my favorite lines in the entire game. They not ripe. <gasps> well, I did it! A unique fanfare for defeating Gruntilda in this game. All right, random guy on the internet is sold on the concept of the piano. Glad to hear it. Uh, I'd love to hear back from you if you uh, explore with it in the future or what you're discovering or what you find useful. LZ Epsilon used a joker on the last questions, and I bet you I guarantee I must have done that same exact thing myself as a kid just to secure victory, and I don't even consider that cheating in, in any form, especially because... you. You earn the Joker cards legitimately. A and those instant death questions are insane. Should we pick Tootie? Because I'm in need of a new washing machine. Is that similar to the washing machine that you turn into in Banjo-Tooie? Maybe not the exact same washing machine, but like, you know, a, a little bit of foreshadowing. I love that Tootie doesn't just run off of the victory podium. And the Harvard Yard is in the house to say that you recently learned that the notes going down the guitar vertically are actually the circle of fifths. And, and, and that's a really cool thing about the, the, the strings on a guitar is that exactly what y you said. You start on E, the lowest string, and you go up. Each next string is a fifth. It's just like the circle of fifths that I talked about in the Angel Island music theory video and the Ocarina of Time Kakariko Village video. And what's the other one? I feel like I talked about it again. Well, I'm not going to watch all of these credits, but um, yeah, I I'm going to get soon going with Sonic Mania. I'm very excited for that. Anaka doesn't remember a washing machine appearing on the podium, and I don't either. Chauncey Curley says, I have no idea how much some of you love video game music. BK, Donkey Kong, Mario RPG, Yoshi's Island, like, and all I can say, Chauncey Curley, is I'm glad to hear that, but I definitely have an idea of how much people love the music because I am one of those people. I mean, that Sonic music, BK music, um, awesome music that uh, folks over at the Alex Yard Zone Discord have introduced me to. Um, yeah, it, I think... I. I think it's fair to say that there's just a certain type, a, a certain brand of passion that a person can have for video game music more so than like, you know, a, a, a new single that Cardi B or Lizzo or Lil Wayne puts out. The reason why music from video games can go to the, like the super next level is because you are experiencing the music as an extension of the story on screen that you are actually participating in, right? You're not just watching a movie passively, right? You're, you're participating in the experience. You're choosing where to explore in this winding cave or this crazy swamp with all the piranhas trying to chomp at you. Um, it gives such a greater gravity and effect to the music that it really just emotionally resonates so heavily um, and, and it really just takes it to the that I would even describe that as that that's an advantage that video game music has over other uh, contexts that one could encounter music. It's because in video games you are a much bigger part of the story than you are when you listen to you know a Paris Hilton single. Remember when she recorded some singles and then released them and then people played them on mainstream radio and those listeners listened to it. The gold is in the house. How you doing, the gold? Zimtax64 wants to watch all the credits. They are great credits, I, and I love the little nicknames that they come up, like Todd Big Butt Bushell, Doug Crocktus Campbell, Kyle That, Brent Boombox Clareman. Like, I would imagine that a lot of these nicknames have an inside joke, um, and, and then some of them are just, all right, pick any character and just put it in between my first and last name. Sarah Snare Bear Osborne. Strat Hux XP is popping in to say hi and thanks for the theory content. Keep it up. I absolutely will, Straw Hut. And I appreciate that. And so does Gobi. Gobi appreciates it in Gobi's Valley and Click Clock Wood and even in Hailfire Peaks. Oh, 
Oh, the second hilarious gold moment of the day is Straw Hut's comment to say, Lizzo? Paris Hilton? Avoid them. They not ripe. That is literally the funniest thing that I've heard in over 72 hours. Bravo, Straw Hut. That was freaking fantastic. Oh, my God. They not ripe. <laughs> Oh my god, oh my, you just made my day. Just like, as if this entire day is not already an absolute blast and a good time and just a fantastic good vibe celebration. You just brought it to the next level, Strohut. I'm like almost crying laughing right now. This is fantastic. <laughs> Nabnut. Uh, I'm not sure if Nabnut learned his lesson, but the fact that Nabnut learned his lesson or not is irrelevant because the point of this story is to be viewed by us, and it's up to us to play any video game or, or pay attention to a story in a work of media. It's up to us to put together the pieces and walk away with the right takeaway. And, and, and we talked about a few very important concepts with uh, the, the red flags in Nabnut's instant gratification mindset. A a and it's a, a it's a salient reminder, people. All right, Straw Hut, have a good one. Thanks for popping in. Yeah, and and the gold is asking about Mega Man. I <laughs> there's so many people that love Mega Man music, which is awesome. I have tried to listen to it, uh, many different soundtracks. It's not that I think it's like bad or anything, it's just that it's a certain type of music that, it's almost like a little bit, it, for just for, for me personally, I, I wouldn't say that this is an objective criticism of it, just that for my taste, it kind of leans heavily into a very frantic, almost cartoonish anime sort of feel. Uh, and, and that just seems to be a, a, a specific type of thing that, that people vibe with. But I will say that, in all honesty, I've never played a Mega Man game, so I would be more than willing to actually give a Mega Man game a shot because there have definitely been soundtracks that I've just listened to on YouTube and I didn't really connect with, but then when I actually get a chance to play the game and experience the music in context of the game, then it's like it's like something clicks. It's like oh wow! Like I, you know, listening to video game music on YouTube can be hit or miss if you're not actually looking at what the game is. Some soundtracks can stand on their own, and you could just listen to them without a reference point of what the game is like. Um, but but others aren't, and that's not a weakness. That's that that's just it. It's an essential component to understanding what the song is trying to convey. Now, does anyone recognize this camera angle? Because this is just one of many stunning areas in the... It's such a simple, you know, little room like this. But uh, as I'm putting together the video, right, I'm wandering around Grunty's mansion, Grunty's lair, trying to find cool rooms and different camera... And I just got here, and I looked at this, and I'm like, I freaking love this so much. It's just the door. The way the door is glistening, switching between the note and the number... Um, the, 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 the wonderful way that Ding Pot just very earnestly jumps up and down. He's just accepting his job and helping you out to get from place to place within the lair. It's just like this, this one little shot right here just speaks volumes. Uh, FNS recommends Mega Man X as my first. Robo uh, echoes the question about Bomberman. I think I've listened to Bomberman 64 a few times on YouTube, and I liked it. Um, I, I know that Bomberman 64 is definitely not, like, the one core essential Bomberman game, but that's the one I only know about that game because we rented it once or twice on the N64 when I was a youngster. I the dude says the cauldron looks very sad, and if you think he looks sad here, like, it's funny you say that because I can, when I look at him, I see an earnestness and, and, and kind of a contentness, but it doesn't totally write off the fact that this entire lair is, is overall pretty gloomy. Um, I will say that the second game, Dingpot is in it, and it's just really depressing. 
Um, they were going some for something very specific with Banjo Tooie. Like they really leaned heavily into the darkness, as I pointed out in my music theory video about ILO Hags. However, yeah, they they and Kazooie is actually very mean to Dinkpot in the second game. Right? It almost gave me bad vibes. Like I wasn't like morally offended or anything. But I was really... Ju there, there's a few things in Banjo-Tooie that simply... Like, I I'm not passing judgment. I'm not saying it's a failure. But it just gives a player such as myself some bad vibes. And Chauncey Curly has a recommendation for some N64 jungle mixes that I might have to check out. Miss Carrie's Corner likes the Sonic 3 soundtrack. Uh, Miss Carrie's Corner will go so far as to say it's your best soundtrack in the entire series. I mean, it, it, it's one of the standouts, to say the least. It, it's a really good one. And, and part of the reason it's one of many things is the fact that it's got all the Act 1 and 2 remixes, of course. That just really puts it to a whole new level of excitement to take the basic blueprint of Act 1 and, and then take that same chord structure and, and just give it a whole new life with a different rhythmic structure, for example. It's out of this world, people. Let me actually hop in one of these cauldrons. I guess they're all called um, Dingpot, but there's different Dingpots of different colors throughout the layer. Random guy on the internet thinks that Sonic CD has excellent music, and to say that I agree with that statement would itself be an understatement, because I think Son as good as Sonic 3's soundtrack is... Um, Sonic CD, I, I wouldn't even try to compare them and, and say that one is better than the other, but just the fact that Sonic CD is able to use, you know, CD quality, uh, true audio recordings, um, and yet they, the, 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 the soundtrack uses that, uh, that, that newfound technological ability to make something that is so much more uh, uh, of a greater, like, richer musical experience, and yet simultaneously not losing sight of what makes a good Sonic song, right? It, it uses that newfound technology, but creates these incredible rhythms and, and just totally memorable melodies that just get attached to your heart for life. Um, I, I really adore the, the Sonic CD soundtrack, I, I, I guess I got to say. All right, y'all ready for some Sonic Mania? I want to just come outside just to, to, to bring things full circle with the Gruntilda's Lair video. Did y'all like when I popped out here and, and, and did a little bit of these moves? Right? Uh, it's so funny that this game has punching. Like, it's just, all right. <laughs> Banjo is roaming the streets in freaking Boston, going to a bar, trying to start a fight, throwing punches at the first guy who looks at him the wrong way. Keeping it real goes wrong when somebody steps on your puma. Remember that Chris Rock bit? And by the way, I stand with Chris Rock. I know that's not like a brave hot take to have, but I stand with Chris Rock, and Will Smith is a huge bully. And Will Smith, as far as I'm concerned, Will Smith did something so serious that basically he gets a five-year ban from my attention. I cannot get invested in him I cannot take anything he says seriously. His his understanding of how to treat other people is so incredibly warped and off base that he could not come out like two months from now and say, listen, I did some soul searching, I did, right? Because he doubled down on everything that he did in, in the longest Oscar speech of, of all time. So anything that he says in the near future is just because kind of he's being coerced to do so. And, and as far as I'm concerned, Will Smith has a five-year ban. He's not worthy of my attention or, or my respect for at least five years. A and it's up to him what he does with those five years. I mean, going to India and then posting on Instagram about it, I, I would say, is a bad start. If you wanted to do that, I think that's great. But don't be sharing that stuff on social media as a way to say, like, see, I'm doing the work. Because any millionaire jerk could get on a plane and, and go on a catered, you know, freaking excursion to, uh, to to India to talk to some hired gurus get the hell out of here and the only thing we've heard Jada Pinkett Smith say is essentially nothing essentially nothing because the only thing that she said since the Oscars was to say to read a prepared script 
that said like, oh, it's the time for healing. Me and my family are doing a lot of healing. Um, that statement is essentially nothing. That's essentially nothing because that could mean that Jada is sitting there think like, oh, I got hurt in the exchange of words at the Oscars and I'm healing. So for all we knew, she could be doubling down on that really repugnant behavior. And you know what's even better to, to cleanse the palate than Jada Pinkett Smith's horse shid? A little game that I like to call Sonic the Hedgehog Mania. It was released in 2017. It uses the retro engine, and it provides a very, very fun experience. So I, I don't want any detractors saying that the retro engine itself is inherently flawed because it can be used to very wonderful effect. Miss Carrie's Corner thinks that Banjo-Kazooie has the best game soundtrack in the world. I, I really think there's nothing like it. I think that Grant Kirkhope is a fantastic visionary, and, and he was at the right place at the right time, and he poured himself into it, and he wrote the music in this soundtrack with purpose and intent, and, 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 and there's a reason why we're talking about it 20 years later, because it's that emotionally resonant. Take a quick look at the remaining Twitch streaming schedule for the rest of the week. I'm going to be back tomorrow on Twitch to play a game that we were talking about a little bit earlier. You can see that the opening act is Sonic Robo Blast 2. And, and, and then the main event, the main show, is Sonic 3. Every single week I do a Sonic 3 stream, typically on Wednesdays, where I do a wager. Right? Like lately my wager has been 185,000 points, I believe. I try to play through Sonic 3, the first six zones, Angel Island to launch base, and I aim to get that wager score. And if I don't meet the wager score, then I give away a gifted sub. And that gifted sub goes out to a random person in the audience. And if they win the gifted sub, then they get that gifted sub. The next 30 days, they're able to watch my streams with no frustrating commercial interruptions. And I got to say that it's always fun when I give away gifted subs and when people in the audience give away gifted subs to other people. It's such a cool way to like to, to help, help support the YouTube channel, support the Twitch streaming um, and, and, and it's also just fantastic to, like, I, I, it always warms my heart when people give gifted subs to other people in the audience, and, and now that person is going to get to hang out with us, you know, more because they're, they're going to be more inclined to watch the streams because there's no ads. It, it just, it warms the heart. It warms the heart. So let me boot up Sonic the Hedgehog Mania, a game I quite enjoy, a game that has fantastic music, Good graphics and knuckles. Yeah, Anakor points out a, a very interesting thing, saying, you know, the retro engine got used for making the Sonic CD port that I always play in my live streams. Yeah. You could see that just yesterday, Monday, July 11, I streamed Sonic CD, and whenever I stream Sonic CD, it's always the 2011 Steam, you know, remake, remaster, whatever, of Sonic CD, and that uses the retro engine, a and I've always felt that that Steam Sonic CD plays great, so that, that just shows you that the problems in Origins are, are not inherently a problem with the retro engine, it's the apparently deliberate tweaks that, th that they made to certain variables in Sonic's moveset. And I learned this in real time on day one after Sega the Hedgehog, Sega Sammy Company uh, already acquired my 45 hard-earned dollars. Just John 43 says, congrats on the milestone. My music theory videos are inspiring and emotional. I really appreciate that, Just John. And, and kind of what I was saying to before is that I, I've had such amazing memorable experiences with these games and this music that on one this is not the only mission statement of the the videos but one of my goals when i sit down to to, to write the script and present the video to everybody i'm asking myself like how does my heart interact with this game how does my heart interact with this particular song from this level what i like i, I one and one lens that I look at things through is I'm saying, like, this video is like a time capsule. It's it's a scrapbook showing you this is how my heart interacts with this music. Um, and, 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 and it goes to very real, poignant, um, emotional places sometimes. And, and I'm glad that's resonating with people. So thank you very much, Just John.
Are you ready for some mania? And, and I'll also echo this again. When I get to Hydrocity Zone in Sonic Mania, I'm going to be kind of temporarily pausing the game, come on camera for at least five or ten minutes, uh, to, to say a, a few important things, including just, you know, a massive thank you, and, and I wanted to appear on camera. Mrs. Carrie's Corner is still waiting for a Gobi's Valley Music Theory video, and I can confirm right now that that's a possibility. Sonic Mania, Sonic Mania is about to open up. <laughs> Ferga Gabonix has an alternate idea for a Hydrocity spinoff called Hydro Atrocity. You should get Sega your card. I, that, that, I, I like that idea. It, it, it's like a little bit dark, but not as dark as Genocide City, one of those suggested level names that, 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 that was on the cutting room floor for Sonic 2, I want to say, if memory serves. Hatrocity, that's great. <laughs> T-Dog wonders if I'm going to get all the emeralds. So that's a great question. I actually am going to go for the emeralds. I usually never do that in... Sonic 3, because the blue spheres just are... E every time you play them, they're kind of samey. You're walking on a grid and just only making 90-degree turns. There, there's not nearly enough of the freedom and momentum energy that, that I look for in a Sonic game. But that's why I do... Anytime I play Sonic CD, I generally do go for the special stage emeralds. Um, and and I, I do enjoy Sonic Mania's special stages a whole lot. So I will be going for them where I can. But you'll notice that even if I do manage to get all the emeralds, I will not, um, I will not use supersonic ever, a a and we can talk more about that w once we get to that juncture. Um, so I just gotta pull this up. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your patience. can hear that great, wonderful Hyper Potion song. It's a classic, baby. It's a classic. Do, 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 do. Oops. <laughs> I'm just setting up my set, people. Thank you for your, uh, your patience. Harvard Yard likes to get all perfects because it really pushes you to explore and get many chances as the stages as possible. Yeah, those perfects, they're doable. They're, they're tricky, but they're definitely doable. I salute you. I'm just going to put a little bit of Sonic CD music on while I uh, just get Sonic Mania set up. Gotta love that JP soundtrack. I'm not playing Sonic CD today, so always a good opportunity to get some of the tunes out there. Miss Carrie's Corner, indeed I'm aware of Stop and Swap, and I found out about it in 1998 when I got all the jiggies in Banjo-Kazooie on Nintendo 64. Great memories. Ooh, this probably has conflicting audio, doesn't it? Let me turn off the Sonic CD track.
All right, I figured something out, so I'm almost wetty. Uh... All right, cool. That's a good sign. So, as I mentioned, I, I do aspire today to beat the entire game. I don't know if it's going to happen, but you and I are going to figure it out in real time. Oops, I didn't mean to shut off the game. I meant to go to the main menu because I do need to go grab my water in the other room and, and just take a brief, like, 60-second pause. Uh, and, and then I'll be back, and we'll be rolling through the rolling hills of one green hill zone, a level that showed up in this game and Sonic Generations, and it's going to be in Sonic Frontiers, and it was in, um, man, I don't know, plenty of games. You know the drill. <laughs> All right, so let me let you enjoy the opening cutscene here and the opening animation because it's really tremendous, let's be honest. All right, I'll be right back. When I tell you, you know, the first time I saw these intro animations, it was really special, man. It was something else. It was it was a great feeling, even just watching the first trailer, you know. Put the audio down a little bit. Robo didn't even know about the alt music, and it's pretty dope. 
It's pretty dope. Terry Onik thinks that Hyper Potions did a really good job on the main music. But you like the alt one even more. Well, that just goes to show you how well they selected the intro music for this here game. The Harvard Yard has the word yard in their username just like I do. So I approve. And the Harvard Yard points out that this alt music even has sound effects that were left out of the final level. I am going to be playing as Sonic today. I was tempted to maybe do Encore mode, but the reason I didn't was a couple things. One is that I, I just wanted the core Sonic experience with the regular color palettes. I really do like the alternate color palettes in Encore mode, but just as a baseline thing, you know, for, for this stream on this channel. And also, uh, over at the Sonic Debate Society, the next debate we're going to be doing is Sonic the Hedgehog 3 versus Sonic Mania. Um, so part of what I wanted to do and part of the reason why I picked this game for this stream is because I'd, I want to just explore some food for thought in, in that upcoming debate. Just need to click a couple more things, and then we'll be ready to go. Wow, the system knew that I was playing Sonic Mania. I didn't even have to plug it in manual. That's remarkable. Harvard Yard knows what's up. Yard Bros. Yard Bros, that's the movie that I'm way more interested than Mario Bros. You can find us in the yard. Uh, I'm briefly going to play the encore mode music because it's so goddamn good. Just this menu. Listen to this. What? Uh. Oh, so damn good. What a treat. What a treat, getting this Mania Plus and then hearing this music. I listen. It, it's even got a Section B, I think, coming up right now. Oh, those those double snares. Ta-ta. Ta-ta. So damn good. Ready for the Eggman cadence now. Six, seven, one. Look out for Eggman. He's looking for you. And he's got some crazy machines to fight you with. Let me know if anyone has some complaints or grievances about the audio leveling mixing, but otherwise we're almost ready to go. Terionic wants the game audio a pinch higher. Let me put it a pinch higher. And if anyone disagrees with that, cast your vote or forever hold your current audio mixing levels. How's that? You notice it, an increase? Or was that an imperceptible increase? Anaka wonders, wasn't this music for Encore Mode made by Falk? 
He was a composer for Sonic fan games in the early 2000s. Well, I cannot confirm that, but it, it's, uh, it, it may very well be. I wonder if anyone else knew. And if so, that's cool that, you know, a fan composer got to take to the main stage like this. And there's the mania motif, right? It goes do do da 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 do do da do. Ready? It's coming up now. Now do do da 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 do. So good, so damn good. Could use one more little pinch. I'm looking to rowboat for the ultimate confirmation of whether the audio levels are acceptable. How's that? I always want to err on the side of too low rather than too high, you know? Because I've had streams that I play back and I'm like, oh my god, the music is way too loud. Testing one to me. Yeah, I think this is solid. Terryonic points out T. Lopes was also a fan composer. Nowadays, he's a really big official name. You're damn right. You damn. If the credits of Shredder's Revenge are any indication, and if my flying battery video is any indication. That there T. Lopes is a household name, and the reason he is a household name is because he deserves it. He made music, and he put it out into the meritocracy that is the Sonic community, and he knocked it out of the park. Oh, did I accidentally start this level? So I'll just mess around in here for like a minute, but like, yeah. I love the alternate color schemes. Love um, the... the, the I, I, I like being able to fly with Ray. Maybe I'll try to fly with Ray before I start the actual game, you know? Uh, but in order to do that, I'm going to have to find a certain kind of monitor, I think. All right, if I can't find one, I'll, I'll bounce out of here. But, wow, did you see that projectile was going to hit Mighty, but it bounced off because he's got that very protective shell, you know? All right, let me get out of here. The point I was just going to make is that flying around as Ray is really cool. Hitting spikes is not. So let's actually play the real uh, full game. We're going to start off at the greenest of hills, Emerald Coast Zone. Start a fresh new file, new beginnings, blank slate. Hey, this is just like that other Sonic game that I enjoy and that I made a couple music theory videos about. It's very similar. Hey, it's not Knuckles this time. It's a bunch of egg robos from Sky Sanctuary, maybe? Now, right now they're all red. Is it the Phantom Ruby that transforms them into all their different colors and personalities? Like, this is basically a sequel of sorts, thematically, to Sonic Colors? Uh, or maybe even the Deadly Six as well? Those generic Pixar characters where... Each character is just a, a, a strict control scheme. No, a strict color scheme. Like, oh, Zabok is all red, and, and the Mindy Kaling girl is all green. It's so funny that the uh, the green character in the Deadly Six in Sonic Lost World is basically just the Mindy Kaling character from the Pixar movie Inside Out. And I think a lot of us will never forget the, how we felt that, that summer, also in the summer, of 2017 when this game came out. And this was a really fun, just a, a breath of fresh air. It was the first new canon Sonic Momentum side-scrolling content that, that we'd gotten since, since, well, since Bill Clinton was the president of the United States of America. And here this game came out in the Trump era. That's crazy to think about. Crazy to think about crazy to think about, true to acknowledge. Applesauce casts a vote for higher uh, background music. If there's a big demand for it, I, I will concede a little bit, but I, I generally like it to be on the softer side. But at, at the same time, you know, someone's sitting here watching the stream. If the music is at a uh, a, a low level, and it's to the extent that it's frustrating, 
and you're not vibing with the level and the gameplay as much as you could, well, then that's definitely uh, a solid reason to consider uh, putting up the volume one more notch. But yeah, it breaks my heart when I play a stream back and, and, and just it, the music is loud. It's partly because, well, it's not the only reason, but one reason I exercise extreme caution is because I have an ear condition uh, involving tinnitus and hyperacusis. And I won't go into a lot about that. I, I've talked about it in more depth with patrons in the past. But I got to be really careful with the, the, the volume levels of things that I listen to. So, you know, long story short. So when I play back the streams, it, it stinks when the music is so loud that the only way to hear my voice is to turn the entire volume up. Um, you know, I, yeah, I'm not trying to play a card or make an excuse, but... Let me put it up one more notch because I, I do value your input and you're not going to vibe with it. I put it up another micro notch. Everything channel points out that there's another special stage ring further back in the zone. Yeah, so I will only go for special stage rings that I encounter on the fly. Um, I, I, I won't do any deliberate searching and certainly not backtracking. What I will do is appreciate this wonderful background. I think it's so cool. It's like the sort of like the inner cave of Green Hill. I don't think the original game had any caves, did it? But I do know that the Sonic Generations definitely had caves in Green Hill, and I think it's freaking awesome. Especially just to add another underground layer to a level that's primarily about, you know, being outdoors, so to speak, in the greenery. Um, it, it really fits well, it really works. And I salute you. I salute you, Mania Green Hill. I don't think this is a perfect game. And, and, and I'm going to very confidently take to the debate stage and contend that Sonic 3 is a better game than Sonic Mania. But this game does a lot of things well. And even if you look at it just from the perspective of beggars can't be choosers, this game is a beggar's banquet. <laughs> if this is all we get, there's a lot to like. <laughs> Hey, it's that shield that I recognize from my profile picture on YouTube and Discord and Twitter. I am available on Twitter, by the way, having a whole bunch of important and meaningful conversations over there. And as I mentioned earlier in the stream today, if anyone's interested in catching uh, my Countum 3, every week I do three live streams on Twitch. And if you could believe that, this YouTube live stream celebration for 25,000 subscribers, I mean, this is really just... This is a bonus stream, in addition to this week's three streams. Tomorrow, I'm going to be streaming Sonic Robo Blast 2 and Sonic 3 doing a wager. And then on Thursday, what do we got coming up on Thursday? Sonic Adventure 2 with a warm-up of... Was it Crash Bandicoot 2? So generally, every week, I, I definitely have at least one non-Sonic game that I play. It's usually not the opening act. Oh, sorry. Usually the non-Sonic game is the opening act, whereas the main event of each stream it is often a Sonic game. But I can tell you that uh, 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 the week that Sonic Origins came out, suffice it to say that my experience with Origins was negative, and my opinion of it stays that way. And, and that week that Origins came out, I couldn't believe it, but I could believe it. that The last stream I did that week, the main event was Shredder's Revenge. Because I'm like... It, I think it's really telling that the fact that I don't actually purchase video games all that often, uh, especially now that I'm on a content creator's lifestyle budget, I, I can't just be buying these games left and right. I, I have to really think about my purchases. So I don't buy games a lot. And I finally, Origins comes, I fork over my $45 that I, that I, that I, that I earn doing the passionate work that I do here on YouTube and Twitch and stuff. And like, um, yeah, I, I, I had a negative experience with Origins, and what happened two days after Origins came out? I bought Shredder's Revenge. I was like, Origins is freaking garbage. Um, everybody's here on Twitter and YouTube talking about how great Shredder's Revenge is. I looked at like one or two videos, including the Game Apologist's great review of it, and I'm like, this, this, I didn't think of it this way, but looking back, it was like I needed an antidote. I need something to cleanse the palate and just have a fun, meaningful experience with a new game. 
after the uh, Sonic Origins left a really horrible sardine taste in my mouth. Sardines mixed with olives. And, and with way too much Parmesan peppercorn. I like Parmesan peppercorn, but if you just pile it on, you're no longer eating an entree. You're just eating a pile of salt or additives and grab... Amity and X is, like, this close to finally getting supersonic after all this time. Now, that's supersonic getting the emeralds in the first six zones, or is that um, you, you've gotten the first six zones emeralds, and now you're going for the super emeralds in Sonic 3 and Knuckles? The Everything Channel says that Origins is great. It provided you your first opportunity to play Sonic 3 and Knuckles. So... That's awesome, Everything Channel, and, and I'm glad you said that because my my frustration with Origins is totally valid, but it is not, I would not expect other people, like every single other person who buys the game, to, to have that feeling. Now, Everything Channel, the way that you just said that, it sounds like you never owned Sonic 3 before. So... If you never played Sonic 3 in your life, and then you got Origins, um, yeah, you could have a rockin' good time. And and, and and I would say to the Everything Channel, I'm very happy to hear that. If there's folks that didn't play Sonic before, and now you have Origins, and, and now you're, you're, you're running through Marble Garden and seeing what it's like, that's a victory. The problem is that Sonic Origins works perfectly fine for folks like the Everything Channel to... Um, to, to have an entry point to, to, to Sonic. The problem is that if you are in my shoes, someone who's been playing this game since you were young, someone who's intimately familiar with all the different maneuverability things that you can do based on the specific level architecture, and then you get to Sonic Origins, and there's basically cut content. There's things that are missing that a newcomer to the game would have no idea that these things are missing. But for longtime fans, those things stick out like a sore thumb, and it just becomes like an orchestra where the instruments are a little bit out of tune, and, and, and like the flute can't keep up the tempo and keeps having to like find their place. So new fans would not even have the, the previous knowledge to be able to notice that stuff. But for us longtime fans, for Sega to say, like, all right, this is now Sonic 3 from now on, you can't even buy the original version. You have to, if, if, if someone enters the marketplace and wants to purchase Sonic 3 to their game library, their only option is Sonic Origins. That's a problem. That's a problem in itself, but uh, th that's not to say that people shouldn't be enjoying Origins. Um, would I even tell people that play a lot of Origins, like, oh, you should definitely play like Sonic 3 Air sometimes so you can get... The, the, the flow of, of, of what the original game was like, I, I don't even necessarily know that I would, like, insist that anyone does that. Um, but to say that you're playing Sonic 3 Origins um, is to say that you're not actually playing Sonic 3. What you're doing is playing a remake. Like, you know how they did Final Fantasy VII Remake? A and they took the core story and the locations and the characters, and, and they just totally remade it and they added new mechanics and it becomes a different experience but it's not supposed to replace the original it's a remake Sonic Origins tries to have its cake and eat it too and it doesn't successfully juggle those two things Uh, Retromod8 extends congrats on the 25,000 subscribers, and thank you very much, Retromod. Uh, I'm very happy to, to hear and celebrate and, and recognize that I'm very grateful for, for all of your support and continued viewership. And, uh, and I look forward to, to bringing you more stuff. I really look forward to bringing you... I, I, I'm at a very kind of vulnerable, precarious spot right now. Like, if you talk to me, like, what's been going on with Alex Yard in real life? in the past few weeks. It's been a little bit rough. I, I don't want to make those problems into your problems, so I won't outline them. But I'm suffice it to say that I'm extraordinarily proud of how the Carnival Night video turned out, and I'm extraordinarily proud with how the Banjo-Kazooie video turned out. And, and I just want to make sure that what comes next is going to provide a good experience 
And, you know, I, I just had... It, this is not the only factor, but, like, it's been a rough year for Alex Yard, even just in terms of Sonic stuff, because I strongly dislike Sonic Movie 2, and I'm not here to convince anyone that they shouldn't like it. Um, I, 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 I would just ask you to extend me a little bit of sympathy, because just about everybody loves Sonic Movie 2, and I am in the, the very small minority of, like, 2%, if you go by Rotten Tomato score, that, that would just... I felt like I was totally left out in the cold by Sonic Movie 2 in the way that Sonic Movie 1 was, like, amazing. There's so many... It's not a perfect movie, Sonic Movie 1, but... Sonic Movie 1, uh, just... it, Especially for someone who's been a fan all along, I don't even need, like, Easter eggs. I would rather... the Instead of spending time inserting a ton of Easter eggs into the movie, I would rather just um, have you... Add story elements, especially as it relates to the characters and getting to know them more as people. Like, to, to introduce some aspect of Tails' conflict where maybe he's not feeling confident enough. And, and then he rises the occasion to help out when Sonic needs him. Like, that that's really all that I kind of needed in, in a Sonic movie, like with Tails in it. And Tails just kind of just... Uh, Tails' involvement in Sonic Movie 2 was kind of an afterthought. I mean, they teased Sonic... They teased Tails at that, you know, end credit scene in the first movie. And it was just a really jarring experience to have all that hype built up for Tails in the second movie. And then had to have Knuckles come in. I think it was perfectly fine and well for Knuckles to come in. I think that was a smart choice. Not waiting any longer to bring in Knuckles. I think that's actually ideal. But it should not have come at the cost of attention on Tails. And it sure, certainly should not have come at the cost of instead spending valuable screen time um, uh, showing Rachel and Randall Handel bicker about uh, stuff that had absolutely nothing to do with Sonic My Hedgehog, the blue blur who runs around at the speed of sound. Got places to go, gotta follow my chemicals. And the Everything Channel, I, I do uh, really appreciate the 25,000 sub. Congrats. Uh, Everything Channel is displeased with the new remasters. That would be an understatement if I said that. Everything Channel further elaborates that thanks to my videos, you've learned now how to play Marble Garden, Hydrosity, and Death Egg on piano. Well, that's really cool. If you ever uh, should, not that this is like something that you need to, I'm just saying, if you should ever post anything online, uh, showing yourself kind of playing that stuff, I would love to see it. That would be really cool. Bajax, Bajax, I appreciate the, uh, the, the commendation on the sub count. And of course, it's never about the sub count. I've said this before, but I'll say it once now that we're here on this big official live YouTube stream. One thing that you will never ever hear me say is, hey guys, you know, we're at, let's say for example, we're at 47,000 subscribers. I'm really trying to get to 50,000 by the end of the year. It would really mean a lot to me if we got there, right? I will never say anything like that because that, to me, is very discourteous to the folks that are already here. It's like saying, like, all right, I've gotten 47,000 of you to, to pop in and vibe with these music theory videos or whatever kind of content a person is making. To just constantly be fixated on future metrics and, and, and then to spend time talking with your audience about how you're trying to get there, I would much rather focus my time and attention on making videos that provide a funny experience, uh, useful info about the music, and I look at milestones not as something to like strive for and think about all that much. I just think of it in terms of, for example, the fact that I've gotten to 25,000 subscribers in the amount of time that I have, because I think when I announced the Patreon, it was almost a year ago, so, and at that point, I think I was at 10,000 subscribers. So, 15,000 subscribers in under a year, I, I would think that's solid. I, I don't even mean to compare myself to others' growth rate, but just by the sounds of that, I think it's pretty good. So, when I hit a milestone like 25,000, I'm like, all right, 
this is a fantastic sign that I'm going to be able to keep doing this. I'm going to be able to focus on music theory videos as my full-time thing, and, and that's just something to celebrate and recognize and thank you all for. Chancy Curly, for one, has been sharing my channel with every musician friend you know. Uh, I'm thrilled to hear that, and I, I just, you know, it absolutely warmed my heart, for example. One of the comments I got on the Patreon announcement video was the fella from, I want to say Argentina. I forget if I, it's the wrong country, I forgot. But somewhere in South America, he said that, you know, he brought the videos to the attention of his English class and, and they watched a video or two in class and talked about the musical stuff to like practice their English and he said it was a fun time like that that stuff like that brings me so much satisfaction and gratitude like way way more than you know a, a, a subscriber count milestone you know like that's absolutely priceless and, and I really appreciate him sharing that with me and I just yeah it it almost brings a tear to my eye to imagine people s so far away on, on, on a different part of this planet that we share together. It's the only planet we got, really. And and, and just the fact that th this awesome music and its inner mechanics, right, the ultimate mix of science and art, is even connecting with people who don't speak the same language as me. Um, that, I, I, I really, I think it's extraordinary, and, and I'm very grateful for it. Oops. Bajax Bajax uh, loves my passion. Glad to hear it. Chancy Curly echoes the idea that that's how we'll progress the channel. Focus on the craft and they will come. If you make videos, they will come. If you spend most of your time just telling people to come watch, Hey, everybody, my, my video is almost at 10,000 views. Could, could, could more people watch it, please? Like that. I, I always recommend in that kind of situation, people, instead of, like, spending time and effort requesting that people watch your videos, instead, you should focus that time and attention on making videos that people want to watch of their own accord. Because you could ask your pals and social media following, to, right? But that's, like, that's just a quick temporary band-aid. That, that is not a, a long-term sustaining engine of either, you know, metric success or even just the level of you enjoying what you do i'm extraordinarily fortunate that the the music theory videos that i want to make are like you know w one of the most things the things that i'm the most passionate about and, and i love spending my time on it. It, it it's a true pleasure and a privilege and 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 to just see the viewership come in as a natural product of that is um something that i take a great deal of pride in Chuck is saying hello from the UK over there where it's 11 p.m. and that you love the content. Thank you, Chuck. And, and, and I'll just point out on the topic of the UK's time zone, um, that's a, a significant reason why a lot of my streams that I do three times a time over on Twitch begin at about 4 to 5 p.m. That way that there's just a reasonable chance for, for the UK audience to pop in and say hi because we've got a whole bunch of awesome, you know, TBM Tom, uh, who, who, who was here earlier and maybe is still here. Fantastic guy. He's a patron also, which I, you know, really just appreciate so much. Every little bit helps, and, and Tom is a big part of that. And, yeah, Tom's a cool guy, and I really love when he pops in to share his thoughts, and, and he comes up with funny stuff, so that nothing but love for the UK from the Alex Yard Zone, let me tell you. But I try to accommodate the schedule the best I can. And I'd like to think I do that solidly. And I also do one stream per week, on the other hand, that is like kind of more tailored to the prime time time of like the West Coast in the United States. Uh, so I usually start those streams on Thursdays at 8 p.m. Or also if I do a Saturday stream, it's usually on the late side. I would love to do more streams on Saturdays. But with three streams as it is, it, I, I, you know, especially because with these last two videos have been a big production. Um, I, I, I just don't want to burn myself out. So I, I'm just keeping it to three streams as the default schedule on a weekly basis. But yeah, 
We did a wonderful stream this past Saturday. That was a really great stream. What did we play? Shin was that the Shinobi stream, or was that a whole week ago? Alex, what's the matter with you? I forget. No, last night was what? Oh, no, the Saturday. Actually, the Saturday night stream was Shinobi 3, and that was a great game that Robo recommended. Tom Moore is still here, and he noticed that I was careful. Did I do something careful and efficient on this boss battle? Because if so, Tom, I'm glad you noticed. As Brentelfloss used to say, thanks for noticing me. Y'all ever watch Brentelfloss? He, he does those videos that he basically takes video game songs and then adds lyrics to them. I believe that Brentelfloss went to school for, like, writing musicals, so he's like... <laughs> He's got the exact training to, to be able to do that kind of stuff. And yeah, I, some of my favorite classical YouTube videos from back in the day were from that there, Brental Floss. He has a Banjo-Kazooie with lyrics video. I really liked his video that he did with Dave Bulmer that was the Super Mario Land for the Game Boy. And I wish I could find some more special stage rings. I'm really not sure why I'm not encountering them. I feel like I usually do encounter a lot of them just naturally in the course of playing the game. Gotta love these balloons. The Everything Review asks, is my last name actually Yard? Uh, no, it's not. It's actually Ann Knuckles. <laughs> Yard is my middle name, and And is just a, uh, a ceremonial placeholder for the YouTube channel. No, of course I'm kidding. Alex Yard is indeed a stage name that I came up with... Um, well, the I think the first time I ever used it, out, uh, you know, on YouTube or anything, was when I created the Alex Yard and Knuckles channel. And of course, at the moment that I created the Alex Yard and Knuckles channel, it wasn't even a channel about like Sonic Three necessarily or music theory. It was just uh, the home of the series of videos called Ask Ulalilia Things. Uh, some of you longtime viewers of the channel, if you ever browse, you know, my total video list, you'll see that. You know, you keep going back, there's music theory videos, and, and then what's before the first Lava Reef video, music theory, was on Lava Reef, and before that, you get a set of videos entitled Ask Ulalilia Things. And it's one of my magnum opi. In, in no small part, thanks to the to just the wonderful personality character, a great pal, Nick Smith, a.k.a. Ulalilia. Special stage? Hell yeah, let's do it. Have I even gotten a special stage today? I think I did at least one, right? So this one, I think the best strategy is to go down this route first, get the rings, because I think this route has a fair amount of rings to offer, and then you never go down this route again. Because now I can always go through the click route, and I point this out in part because I've heard people say that they struggle with these special stages. Um, and I can totally see why. What I always advise people is that each of these special stages kind of has like a, a single trick or a single maneuver that once you figure out how to do it, you, your life becomes like, it, it's just like you have to figure out that one efficient thing. Like for example, in this one, you can see I missed the mock speed upgrade and I'm still gonna be able to beat this special stage, but getting that, if I had gotten that mock speed upgrade, it was right after I got to Mach 2, it would have instantly bumped me up to Mach 3. And then, yeah, like I said, in the first few, like, dozens of seconds in these things, you kind of got to focus on rings just so you can buy yourself enough time, you know? Especially the levels that have two routes, you, you just have to mindfully select which route you're going down first because there's usually a longer route and a shorter route, and you want to take the longer route first and then always take the, the shorter route for all remaining laps. Francis Weber is in the house to point out that the beginning of the theme for Studiopolis Act 2 sounds like a news report. I, I really love it so much. It, it's really funny that it, it has that news report effect. t Lopes knocked it out of the park. And especially because when you start Act 2, you've got all those TVs 
with Robotnik's face, and, and it's got the moving animation. It's so goddamn good. Uh, I, I wish that there was some fan content where someone made YouTube videos where they basically, like, imagined, like, what kind of TV programming would be on Eggman TV. Like, maybe there would be a show that's kind of like MTV Cribs, but it's the Badniks showing you their lair where they live and, like, uh, talking about, like, the different health insurance options that the badniks get under, you know, working under Robotnik's employment. I mean, that's just one of a million ideas. And we see these rolling things have returned from what, Scrap Brain Zone or whatever? Everything channel points out that there's a secret final boss if you get supersonic before the end of the game. Yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of that final boss. What is it called? Egg Reverie or whatever. It's a little bit too frantic. I, I don't feel like I have a solid control over what I'm doing. Um, I, I would say that the Doomsday Zone from Sonic 3 & Knuckles absolutely takes the cake, let me tell you. But those are big shoes to fill, let's be honest with ourselves. Mine a 49er, loving that rhyme, saying that you've always wanted a Robotnik TV show after playing through Mania. Dude, I would watch it. A and I would think that the ratings were Sonic Boom were good enough that there would be a market for that. Sonic Prime, I, I just... I, on one level, I'm absolutely excited for it, and, and it might be cool, it might be just okay, but even if it's not amazing, like it would just be kind of cool to watch a, a long-form Sonic property that's not, like Sonic Boom is its own thing. Jerk Purse really likes it. Other people's really like I, I totally see the appeal. Um, but that kind of comedy approach for that's targeted toward kind of a certain age group, you know, it, I'm, I'm almost 35 years old. So that's just a natural product of the demographic mismatch. But Sonic Prime seems like it could have like legit stories and not just, you know, situation comedy plots. It's not that one is better than the other, just that I have a higher interest level in it. And is it just me, or am I not supposed to be able to hit Robotnik when I'm on the ground? Because doesn't that, like, half defeat the purpose of the entire boss? But Jax but Jax says, dang, you don't sound 35. You sound like 25. Suffice it to say that about a year ago, I went to a place of business and I bought something that you had to be a certain age for. And, 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 and basically the guy, was, can I see your ID? And I gave him my ID and he and I wasn't even offended by his reaction, but his reaction was he looked at my ID, saw that I was actually like 33, 34, and he was just like, "Oh, damn! I did not think you were that old. Oh my god!" Like he 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 cracked up, but it was like a really hilarious moment. I wasn't off put at all, um, because just one product of that is like I think that the fact that I maybe sound young or look young, in some instances, that can be a disadvantage because I, I can definitely speak from experience that there have been work situations. In, when I used to work in the fields of education and then medical coding and build, billing, those were the two fields that, that I worked in for, for several years each. There were absolutely moments where people would talk to me a certain way and you could tell it's kind of like a mother like scolding her son almost. It's very condescending, it's very off-putting, especially in the presence of my colleagues, right? So that's kind of a disadvantage. Also because I'm not very tall, my height is what, 5'7"? And like that that's a whole nother angle of it where people kind of treat you like, uh, oh, hey, good job, Tiger. Um, I don't lose sleep on the topic of my height anymore, but it, it, it's definitely something that I had to grapple with when I was treated in that way on multiple occasions. 
The interesting thing about height is that you know how we're having this cultural reckoning where everyone is beautiful and, you know, that uh, beauty comes in all shapes and sizes. Mindset is somehow discriminatory or not fair or not inclusive. I, I think that's total horseradish, but, but that's a common view. Okay, but people are so sensitive about calling out someone's weight and yet height seems to be this thing that's just it's still okay to shit on somebody because they're not tall and i say that because imagine if you were at work and, and you were saying to your colleague you know you're in the cubicles you're down on the floor you got a bunch of your co-workers in the area and you're just casually talking to your co-worker and you say like oh um yeah there's that insurance form you have to fill out all you have to do is go down to Human Resources and just talk to Mary. She's the obese woman that works in Human Resources. Just just ask the obese woman for a form, and, and, and she'll give it to you, right? If you said that at work, you would probably have that grounds to be fired, right? And, and I have zero interest in ever saying anything like that, ever. The reason why I put it that way is because there's this very interesting double standard where you are allowed to make comments exactly like that but about height, because that hypothetical example that I just gave you about an obese person, that exact same thing happened to me. Someone described me in the company of multiple colleagues and said, oh yeah, if you need help with that, you just go talk to Alex. He's that short guy over at that department over there, right? Like height, it's saying that someone is short. Like it baffles the mind why in 2022 that people are allowed to do that. Um, and yet, for some reason, anything regarding body weight, for example, is like a total taboo. That's a mind-boggling thing that I've had to grapple with. I'm totally at peace with it now. And I could talk for hours more and more about why I'm at peace with that. I think it's a fantastic, very interesting conversation. Um, but I, I just used this random tangent that I just went on to, to give you a little bit of teachable moment. That when you take a dig at someone for their height, it really makes them feel like shit. It really does. When you're watching a movie or a TV show and, and you get to a part where they make a joke about somebody's height of the kind where if they made an equivalent joke about weight or race that they would be instantly canceled, um, that bullshit is inconsistent. Demrupi says height discrimination is real and messed up. Uh, and everything review echoes my sentence sentiment that fatophobia is taken seriously but heightism is treated like a joke it, it if nothing more i just like to contribute my two cents to give some food for thought for, for you fine people that are sitting here in the audience because i think for many years i was just not aware of that double standard and to to, to see that we're you know just a lot of people in our society are further and further devolving into their safe space, stay inside the bubble mindset where they say like, oh, don't call me this name because if you do, I might commit suicide. Like that, that never flies a as, a, as a form of logic. That's just trying to hold public conversation hostage uh, just so what, so that your feelings are preserved. That That's never acceptable. Um, sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt you. That is as true as it ever was, uh, but a lot of people in this day and age are starting to forget that. You have every right to make fun of someone for their height. I think it's a really shitty thing to do, and I hope that I could persuade you not to do it. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it's the weird double standard that um, maybe I should just write a novel about it and, and just expose all that horseshit. Chilius VGM says, woohoo, the Sonic game with the best OST. Of course, Chilius has told me lots of different occasions and, and reasons why he, he really loves the T-Lope style. And I just think it's so awesome and cool that we have this game, Sonic Mania, that, that has, you know, T-Lope's very specific and awesome vision for, for creating these immersive tracks. Um, and, and, and to the point that Sonic, uh, sorry, Chilius VGM was so, you know, he vibes with the music so heavily that he's created lots of his own um, projects in, in the T-Lope style, whether that's remixes of Sonic songs in, in the kind of mania mode um, s sort of sound feel. Um, 
I, I, I cannot speak highly uh, enough of, you know, a, a work of art such as the Sonic Mania soundtrack that inspires others to, to do great stuff. That that's it, it, It's just a really cool way where you can watch the cause and effect of, of just paying things forward. Th this person makes something, it inspires them. What they make, you know, brings more people into the discussion and, and the field of that art. It's just something to celebrate and recognize, Bab. Everything Review says Sonic Mania has the best OST is kind of cheating because I don't do these Blue Spheres ones. Um, because how many of the tracks are from older games? And that's actually a big re... That's, a, that's probably going to be a big point of discussion in our Sonic Mania debate because, as I mentioned before, we're going to have a, a, a debate coming up in the Sonic Debate Society, which is available to all Alex Yard Zone patrons going to be Sonic 3 versus Sonic Mania and one of the big things that I will contend is that one of the reasons that it's harder to make the case that Mania is better than Sonic 3 is for the simple reason that Mania owes a great deal of its identity to, to those previous games. You know like uh, Sonic Mania can be seen as a great greatest hits uh, a super polishing and even tweaking the gameplay a tiny bit to its benefit, I would say, and, and, and whether or not you agree that the tweaks are to its benefit or just that maybe it's not your niche, but I, I think it's fully valid. And But yeah, it, it's kind of like when Lenny Kravitz put out his greatest hits album. You know, he had... Uh, are you going to go my way? That, right? And then what else? Uh, what's the other Lenny Kravitz song? I want to get away, I want to fly away, yeah, y'all know that song, right? I'm sure Chilius knows that song. Nah, I don't know, Chilius might not know that song. I, I just picked a random great viewer to include in that little micro bit. But when Lenny Kravitz put out his Greatest Hits album, I believe that he also recorded, you know, two new songs that he had written new for that. So it's kind of like that. You get Sonic Mania. It's got a bunch of remixed and reimagined old zones. And, it, it, and, and then you get a little dose of something new that takes the existing formula that you love and, and does something new with it. And, and, and that's basically what you get in Press Garden, Studiopolis. Oh, and, and, and I will say this. Especially the first few years of playing Sonic Mania. What am I at? Mach 2 right now? The first few years of Sonic Mania, usually when I would sit down to play the game, it was... I, I wouldn't sit down and start at Green Hill and just play through all the levels in order like I'm doing now. Instead, I would kind of pick and choose the levels that I liked the most. And I would actually say that that... Shoot. I would say that that fact in itself is actually a strike against the game. The fact that it doesn't work as well for me as, you know, the same way that Sonic 1, 2, or 3 work. I could sit down, play all the levels in order, the complete experience. This game is super exhausting as a complete experience. And, of course, I'm trying to do that on stream today. I aspire to beat this entire game. But, I mean, this is a very particular time and place where I'm jazzed up with excitement for celebrating 25,000 subscriptions on the Alex Yard and Knuckles YouTube channel. But this is a very special case. Generally, I, I, I probably anyone who plays this game has a similar experience where after a certain amount of levels, you, you just hit a wall, you feel overwhelmed. Everybody talks about Sonic 3 and Knuckles having long levels like what? Carnival Night Act 2, Marble Garden Act 2. But once you accomplish base proficiency in the game, th those levels, you're getting through the, the level in like three and a half minutes, four minutes. And then I can't drop dash, but I can double jump. This song is bringing Dem Ropies back. <laughs> Chilius says Mania is just now. That's what I call Sonic. That's really funny. And Chilius, I was actually I, I vividly remember when those song compilations started. Now that's what I call music. Like it, it pretty soon it got to now that's what I call music two and three and then forty seven. But I was there for the first one, man. And, and, and it was definitely not my jam. It was not my genre selection of music, but I, I certainly saw those commercials on repeat, you could bet. Chilius just plays Sonic Mania for the music. And that's totally legit. 
my brass of power enthusiast pal, Chilius. Oh, and hey, what's up again, Steve Reen? Steve Reen is listening to the stream while at work. As I, I've echoed this in the past that I, I think it's great that my stream kind of works even if you're in listening in an audio-only capacity. Like there's been a couple times that Triple B Music has popped into stream. Say, hey, what's up, Alex? I'm, I'm washing dishes, but I'm listening to the stream and hanging out. How you doing? Triple B Music, of course. Uh, I, I will always point out his fantastic uh, rock cover of Dire Dire Docs, which I featured very proudly in the Dire Dire Docs Music Theory video. That was Triple B. Did a fantastic progressive rock reimagination. And, and you know... I've said this before, so I won't go on too long about it, but in the era of low-effort remixes where people just download a MIDI and just switch the sound on, I, 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 that's one of many reasons why I so deeply appreciate the stuff that Triple B does because Triple B really reinvents it into its own thing b but totally honors the original composition. And, and that's that, to me, that's like the baseline uh, blueprint of, of what a cover like that should be. So well done, Triple B. Triple B also has an incredible medley where he features all the songs that are in the Game Gear version of Sonic 1 because it has a different soundtrack from Genesis Sonic 1. Nine times out of ten, when Chilius is playing Mania, he'll notice stuff that he didn't before. I know that feeling. It's very exciting and... You can bet that it happened a whole lot with me over the past two or three years because doing these music theory videos, like when I come into it, I'm like, all right, I'm going to do this video on Sandopolis. I, I start, you know, putting together the video, and even before I start anything, I, I do have a general idea of a few important things that I want to touch upon, including the important thematic, you know, content of the video. Okay, fine. Uh-oh, no rings. <laughs> yeah, look at that. I'm almost at seven minutes on this flying battery bus, and you're trying to tell me that Carnival Night Act 2 is too long? Get the hell out of here. Try again. You are the weakest link. Goodbye. Remember that show? What the hell was I talking about? Triple B's covers, Sonic 1 Game Gear, man, I don't know. Do -do 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 -do. This is an awesome boss theme. Do, do, do. Well done, T Lopes. Do, 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 Particle Icicle has the best username I've seen in at least 20 minutes. And it popped in to say hello. Hello, Particle Icicle. How's your particle? <laughs> Chilius never thought that today he'd be reminded of the weakest link. Uh, and that's great, Chilius, that you remember that, because I know that you're... Uh, considerably younger than me, I'm pretty sure. And so, I, I mean, The Weakest Link, I remember that show being on, if I had to guess, I would say like 2003 approximately, maybe even earlier. So like, yeah, I, I remember the host was uh, a British woman, right? And uh, I don't know, did that show continue in prominence over there uh, in, in the Queen's Kingdom, the United Kingdom? Because if so, that's awesome. Wow, look at that. I got two hits, even on this segment where you can't grab onto the little pole like I'm about to do. Oops. Steve Reen remembers the weakest link. And, and that's just tangentially reminding. And that, that's when the show Survivor first came out. It, or I think it was around the year 2000, approximately. There was a whole bunch of, you know, 
I don't want to say copycat shows, but plenty of other shows that took that reality show formula and, and they put their own spin on it. There was one show that is absolutely not just the greatest, like, kind of reality game show I've ever seen, but one of the greatest works of television program that I've ever seen is a show called The Mole. It was a reality show, uh, you know, competition every week. You know, the first episode, they start out with, like, I don't know, 14 contestants, and every week, uh, they, they uh, someone gets, someone loses and gets eliminated from the game. The Mole was an absolutely fascinating show because each season, like, there was 14 contestants, but all along, one of those 14 contestants is actually the Mole. They're sabotaging the success of the game because they have to do all these challenges to try to win money that they put the, all the money in the pot, and the person who wins all that money in the pot is the final winner at the end. But all along, there's one secret person who's actually sabotaging their success. So in order to succeed on the show, you have to figure out who the mole is and, and then answer questions about the mole on a quiz. Um, and it's just such a fascinating thing because part of your strategy, if you're not the mole and you're a legitimate contestant trying to win, one of your strategies is to try and like act suspicious. Like you try to do things that might be perceived as suspicious, but you don't want to make it too obvious, right? So, like, just those huge layers of, of a mind game. I, I, I highly, highly, the season one and two of The Mole, um, truly, truly fantastic. I do know for a fact that season one is available on DVD. Season two, I don't think I've ever seen a, a DVD for. But you know who's the host of that show, The Mole? Someone whose name you probably recognize. And that person is... Anderson Cooper. Anderson Cooper, uh, one of my good home slice homies, news reporters, who has been at CNN for a great long time. But yeah, he was the host, and I can say that he absolutely, absolutely brought his very awesome and unique brand of humor and just kind of epicness. And, and, and there's nothing like it in the. I absolutely adore that show, The Mole. And, and a big reason why I mention it for you now is because, of course, I can't go back in time. And be able to experience the show, like trying to figure out who the mole is, because I know who the moles are in both seasons. Yeah, really, really, uh, just out of this world quality. Just it, it's like a real life mystery, like obviously not a murder mystery, but like a mystery where there's a. It's like a, it's like a real life game of Clue almost. Yeah, <laughs> I see people are drawing comparisons to uh, Among Us. We got a bunch of sus humans in the mix. Always got to look out for them sus characters, of course. Steve Reen used to like The Amazing Race. I definitely knew uh, some big fans of that show. I really like the press garden level that I'm playing right now. Earlier in the stream, I mentioned that throughout the years since Mania has come out, usually when I play this game, I will just pick and choose my favorite levels to play. But one of them is indeed Press Garden. And it's so funny and interesting. If I look at all those levels that I like to replay a la carte, those levels tend to be the new levels that are new to this game and then the Sonic CD levels. I think the reason why I was so amenable to the Sonic CD levels here in Mania is because when Sonic Mania came out, I had next to no experience with CD. So it was almost like I got to experience Stardust Speedway and Metallic Madness as new levels. I, I, I didn't know nearly as much of the original reference point that those Mania CD levels were built on. Of course, like in Stardust Speedway here in Mania, you get like the Marble Garden pulleys that you grab onto and, and they pull you up. So it was, it was also very fun to, for example, find that so, okay, so for example, in Sonic Mania, uh, of course, many of you know that when you go to Lava Reef, one of the gimmicks that they introduce as a kind of blend and remix of different zones is that in Mania's Lava Reef, there is those kind of, they're not exactly conveyor belts, but they're like the areas of the ground that move in a certain direction, and you can flip a switch to determine which way that conveyor belt is moving. I didn't know what that was originally from. So to see that in Lava Reef, and then uh, a few years later to get really, really, and just totally fall in love with Sonic CD, and then get to Quartz Quadrant, uh, oh, that's what that's from. 
That was super, super fun and illuminating or whatever. Oh my God, G. Clark is saying that that show, The Mole, is still on Dutch TV because it has Dutch origins. I guess I did know that it had overseas origins, that it didn't originate in America. And wow, that's really awesome. G. Clark, I, I, I don't know if you live in um, the Netherlands or not, but oh my God, if there are any seasons of that show that are by any chance available with English captions... Holy shnikey, I would be incredibly, incredibly interested in, in, in watching those. I did know that there were other, you know, that, like that. I know that there was an Australian mole. I think there was a, that there could be any number of international versions of the show. And, and the U.S. version was just one of a great many. Um, but to even think that it's still on today is so goddamn cool. <laughs> Michael Seamus says you think Sonic Team has a mole. Oh, I think you're getting. To, I think that there might be a mole or two uh, driving the Sonic brand into the ground. <laughs> Although not really, because they still continue to sell millions of copies without any complaint or issue from a great number of fans. To the extent that if you complain about the game, you'll have people saying like, "Hey, your complaints are illegitimate." You're just being cynical. You're not being fair. You'll never be happy. You're just playing up your negativity uh, just because that's how the modern internet works. Hell no. Hell no. Chilius is asking the eternal question of what is a Sonic, and, and I'm glad that I'm able to answer that right now. It's actually a, a, a not-all-that-bad fast food restaurant where... There's a drive through and there's also there's these little stations that are kind of set up like those restaurants in the TV show Happy Days, you know, the show with the fonts, where he jumps over a shark and looks really cool and all the women fawn over him because he got on skis and then, you know, got pulled by a motorboat, jumped over the shark, saved the days. For some reason, jumping over the shark solved the situation that, 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 that they were doing. Anyway, the point is, yeah, Happy Days, you, you'd see those... Um, I don't know if I'm mixing it up with, like, the old-timey music theaters. I mean, sorry, remember the drive-in movie theaters? Obviously, they still have them, but they were, like, a, a much more common staple of, of how you went to see a movie back in those days. And it was all always a double feature. It was always two movies, and, and that wasn't some crazy, um, you know, almost not doable marathon. That was just like, oh, yeah, all right, we're going to see a movie. It's a double feature, obviously. Got to get our damn money's worth. I think the only movie I ever saw at a drive-in movie theater was... It was a double feature of Minority Report, that Tom Cruise movie. And then the second double feature was The Sum of All Fears, which I believe was a Tom Clancy, Jack Ryan movie that had, I want to say, Morgan Freeman and maybe Ben Affleck. Um, granted, I was, you know, in, in my teens, maybe my younger teen years when I saw that double feature... And I believe I did start to fall asleep at the sum of all fears. Not because it was a bad movie, but just because, god damn, it's late. Going to late movies is always a little bit iffy. Like, I remember I went to see that movie, James Gandolfini, the guy who played Tony Soprano. The last movie he was ever in, you know, that was released posthumously, was a romantic comedy called Enough Said, co-starring Julia Louis-Dreyfus of Seinfeld fame. And yeah, I went to see that movie with my girlfriend... The movie started at 11.40 p.m., uh, and, and we unknowingly caught a few Zs, not because the movie was bad, but just because, goddamn, it was a Friday, and I had just worked an entire day of work, drive up to Boston, drive another bit to, to get to the movie theater. It's 11.40? Yeah. I don't recommend it. <laughs> the Harvard Yard says that the only movie you ever saw at the drive-in theater was, very appropriately, I would say, Cars. <laughs> That's so goddamn perfect. Language, Alex. Put five cents in the swear jar. Be humble. Ow. Come at me, star. 
or I'll come at you. It's kind of ridiculous that you can hit the stars and kind of break them. I feel like you shouldn't really be able to do that. If Metropolis is any indicator, really good boss. One of the only good bosses in this entire game. There, I said it. And if anyone disagrees, I, I'd be very excited and open-minded to talk it through with you because Oil Ocean Act 1's boss is t horrendous. Horrendous. Tom, TBM Tom Moore, thinks that the starfish look really out of place here. It is a weird thing to take from Metropolis Zone and just abruptly transplant it into this snowy land. Um, you know, it, here we are at Stardust Speedway, which for anyone that doesn't know, Stardust Speedway is just you traveling to the present, past, and future of the Sonic 1 level that is called Starlight Zone. It's a city. It's the same Starlight Zone city. And, and, and back in the day, we had these Roman columns. We had that beautiful water veranda. I don't even know if that's the right word, but it's like a waterway that goes through the town so you can travel from place to place. You know, like they have in the movie Babe, Pig in the City. I like that that's my reference point for... for oh, yeah. W w when I'm talking about the the waterway roads that get you from place to place in certain European cities, yeah, I, I guess the reference point for me would be Babe, Pig in the City. Are the Babe movies a big deal among modern kids? Do they even know about them? I think it was about, like, it's just Babe the Pig. He was a pig, and he could talk, and uh, he went on adventures. I don't even really remember what his situation was that, that he was working through in those movies, but I remember, like, in the Babe movies. I don't think I saw Pig in the City, but I was definitely marketed to. Anaka says, start a speedway, let's go. And let's go is what I said last night, getting pumped up for Better Call Saul. And, and I'll say right off the bat, I won't give any spoilers, but goddamn, Better Call Saul final episode just began last night that was a real treat i'm really excited i'm a little bit cautious only because i consider the ending of breaking bad to be i would give it a b plus it's not per i would say like season two season three season four are like i, I would give all of those seasons an a the final season I, I think the main problem with the end last season of breaking bad is that there were a lot of episodes that were just spent with like Hank and Marie and, and everybody else finally finding out what Walt was up to. We've known about that stuff for five seasons, but just to watch them process the data, stuff that we already knew, that was it, it was a little bit slow. I will say the last four episodes of Breaking Bad are pretty awesome, especially the one, the second last one, where he has to go to New Hampshire. That that was a highlight of the series for me. To the extent that I almost consider that second last episode in New Hampshire, I, I kind of consider that to be the actual finale. And, and, and I view the actual true finale, entitled Felina, as it, 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 it just it does not play by the rules of all the episodes that precede it. Um, and, and Walter White is just able to get away with any number of ridiculous things that should not work. There's no reason why he should be able to walk around Albuquerque and, and meet Lydia for, for tea at the coffee shop when everyone knows that he's on the lam and, and there's wanted signs and stuff. Um, not to mention the ridiculous sequence where he goes to rescue Jesse and he angles the car the perfect way to, to get all of them. At the, it's all really over the top and it's just not really consistent with like Walter White lives in a very heavy state of denial throughout the entire series. And, and his big denial is that he thinks that he can legitimately protect his family. He thinks that what he's doing is a legitimate means of providing for his family. Um, and he doesn't realize that his ego gets so out of control that it actually endangers his family like 10 times more. Um, the fact that Walter White never has to pay the ultimate price with that, it's almost like he kind of gets away with his very slimy and, and, and very kind of he he prioritizes his own welfare at the expense of innocent people and, and that is never acceptable when you're at fault so to see the last episode and see Walter White get everything he wants
kind of left a little bit of a bad taste, and also just the fact that it was not very plausible. So the headcanon that a lot of us have available to us is just that Walter White actually died in the car at the at the end of the the New Hampshire snow episode. And, and, and that the last actual episode was actually his dying fantasy. Now, of course, that does not check out, especially with El Camino, because El Camino continues what happened next and officially acknowledges Walter White's death inside the meth lab where he was discovered. So uh, I, I don't think that that official canon thing should change my feelings on how I feel about those last set of episodes, but overall it was pretty good, but I, I, I'm just... A little bit cautious coming into the last season. I, I'm a little bit irked that they're dragging out the Gene stuff for so long. And I won't spoil anything about last night's episode. I will say that last night's episode definitely does clear the way to, to be able to give the Gene timeline a, a lot more attention. Which is good. Which is good. T has popped in to say, hey man, just want to say thank you for the music theory videos. It's really helpful and fun to watch. Well, I appreciate that, T. Thanks for popping in and sharing as part of this, con uh, you know, this very happy celebration today. And, and I mean, I'm celebrating this today, but this is really just uh, kind of a scrapbook moment to really celebrate and reflect on the past two years, especially the past almost year since I launched the channel at the same time that I started doing this full time. So I'm very, very grateful every day to be able to continue doing this. And, and a big part of that is people like you, username T, capital T. <laughs> Terrionic loves how Walter White's death became a random meme reaction image. I'm assuming that's actually in reference to the moment where Hank um, has bad things happen to him and Walt has to watch it and he's totally horrified because it's one of the first major moments that the actions of Walter White actually have some real life consequences that tear apart his actual family, you know? Um, but yeah, that, that shot of Walter White's just total horror and shock um, and, and, and how similar that looks to Tails Gets Trolled. It's obviously a different expression, that classical Tails Gets Trolled expression. It's not the same, but it's very, very funny to compare the two. <laughs> yeah, what are the best Breaking Bad memes? It's, um, it's that Victor of Walt being totally shocked. And then, like... Like those dialogue panels where it's like, yo, Mr. White, look at this. And then oftentimes the reaction to what Jesse calls his attention to is that horror and shock disgust face, which is so funny. But Jax Bajax has got to go get busy with work. This has been a fun stream. Well, thank you, Bajax. I'm glad you popped in. And I hope you continue enjoying the videos because I, I look forward a great deal to making more. That's what I'm all about. And, and there's plenty of Sonic music and Banjo-Kazooie music that I can think of in my head right now that I'm very excited to, to, to make videos about. So I look forward to it, and thank you, Bajax Bajax. <laughs> Astrid News says something funny, which is that you don't know if you'd be able to take Breaking Bad seriously when you watch it because of how many memes. So I would ask, Astrid News, it sounds like you've never watched the show, but you've seen the memes. What have been some of the memes that you have really just stuck out and, and now you're like hyper aware of. That's really interesting. It's so cool how a show such as Breaking Bad can take on, you know, such a huge cultural relevance just as a show, but then other people who never even watch the show and, and they just encounter some of those really memorable like moments by a memes. That's so cool. I love it. I really love it. And yeah, I would be totally curious to, to hear like it. If someone encounters Breaking Bad primarily through memes up front, I would be so interested to see, like, yeah, what is your experience of the show if you ever do getting around to being interested in watching it? Whoa, those things explode with fireballs? Is that new? How did I even trigger that? I didn't know those things exploded. Did they patch this damn game again? What were they thinking? Yeah, look at that. That's kind of pointless because 
they like explode in a direction that like doesn't even endanger you. Delay wonders what even is this boss. Um, actually, this boss is a bit of a deep cut because I believe it references elements from the final boss of Knuckles Chaotix. I want to say which is a game that I should probably eventually get my hands on and probably stream because I'm making my way through the entire Sonic library and, 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 and the list is getting shorter of the Sonic games that I've still yet to play. You might be wondering, what are the biggest Sonic games that I have not played yet but I really want to get to? Those games would be Sonic Unleashed HD, because I've only played the Wii version, Knuckles Chaotix, Tales Adventure, and yes, I do count that as legitimate and worth considering. Sonic 06, I'm probably going to get my hands on Project 06, because I've heard it's, you know, playable. Am I forgetting anything? Sonic Origins, I'd like to try that sometime. Just kidding. <laughs> Anarcher says, if you remember correctly, wasn't there a scene in Breaking Bad where the characters are playing Sonic 06? Not only is that correct, but I also featured that in my Launch Base Music Theory video. Um, uh, one of my favorite comments of all time on my YouTube videos was a comment on that exact Launch Base Music Theory video. And the person wrote a comment, and they're like, they're like, wait, I know this isn't the point, but... Sonic 06 has multiplayer? That was an amazing comment. Uh, uh, so thank you to that commenter. Um, but yeah, Jesse uh, is a gamer, you could say. And, and there are mul I think there's three across the whole series. I believe there's three different episodes where either Jesse... I, I think Jesse is the common thread in all the games, but it's Jesse and someone else playing a game that has Sonic in it. There's the Sonic 06... And I think there might be two episodes that both show him playing a Sonic racing game. I don't know if it was... I'm not really as familiar with any of the racing games except for Team Sonic Racing. Which, by the way, Team Sonic Racing has such an amazing soundtrack because it's T. Lopes and June Sonoy. And, and, and it's such a cool... They, they really did a fantastic job of, like, kind of doing a fusion of their two styles... And there's even, like, the results music that you hear at the end of a race. Um, it's like it, it's like an ultimate... Like, not only is it a fusion of their styles, but it's, like, literally back and forth. There's, like, a, a couple of measures that are, like, Jun Sonoy's guitar style thing. And then two measures that's, like, the brass of power that we're hearing right now. Do -do 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 -do. And by the way, when I was playing this this week, I was able to walk up to that emerald. Usually that badnik is supposed to swoop in and prevent you from getting it. Um, but lately I've been able to run up to that emerald, which is immersion breaking, because I should have picked it up. I should have picked it up. Where we go next? Nobody knows. The Phantom Ruby makes this a big mosh posh of stuff. Oh, it's Hydrocity Zone. So as I promised earlier, I'm going to appear on camera now. And I'm going to give my keynote address. It's a little bit about hydrosity, but also about some other stuff. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get to the first area where I am above the water. So that I don't drown. Uh, and then I'm actually going to appear on camera. So anyone who's never seen my face before is in for a treat. Um, but, of course, I haven't reached the surface yet because this level, unlike the original Sonic 3, um, has a whole lot of water, a whole lot of water that you can't skip. Um, and, and some of us have mixed feelings about that, Owen for one, to be sure. And it's a legitimate grievance. All right. I've made it to the surface. Let me appear on camera. I'm going to let this continue going, and it'll probably time out, but that's fine.
Metafizzle is in the house. Wondering if anyone's done a surf rock cover of the Hydrosity theme. Seems like a natural fit. I would certainly check that out. And I appreciate y'all's patience. I just had to step away and eat a couple of pretzels. Because <laughs> I'm a hungry man. Hungry man. All right, I just need a moment or two. Now, I'm going to put on the original Hydrocity music for a moment because it's a great tune. Uh, I, I'm sure a few of you out there in Sonic Tinseltown have, have asked yourself and, and just had the thought like, hey, if Alex Yard did a music theory video on the second level of Sonic the Hedgehog 3, I think I would enjoy that. And I can understand that thought process. And I... Uh, I applaud you. I applaud. So why don't we take a quick dose of uh, the Hydrosity theme. We'll start with Act 1. Terrionic notes that I left the timer on 420. And if you're currently in California or Massachusetts, cheers, enjoy yourself, among a great many other places. Hey everybody, I'm up here, but now I'm down here. How we doing? My name is Alex. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you so much for popping in to this very celebratory occasion. It's so celebratory that I myself am able to exist in Hydrosity Zone. I really love this zone. It means a lot to me. Uh, I liked it as a kid. It, it, it gives you some cool upper routes so that you can uh, stay out of the water. Unfortunately, Mania kind of lost sight of that. Sight. Planet confirms pretzels are always worth it, and I appreciate the affirmation. Bernard A. says hi. Very glad you joined, Bernard A. I'm going to uh, put something up on stream, on the screen right now. Uh, let's see. Whoops. I'll be right back. <laughs> I'll be right, right back. You could bet. Sonic Mania Sound Sources, wow, that's a very good username because it. Uh, I'm assuming that your channel I I is chock full of cool Sonic Mania Sound Sources, and when I look at your username, I know exactly what I'm getting, and it's very easy to remember. That's a very good username. I applaud you. I salute you. All right. Um... I'm so close to becoming on camera. going to be good. Okay, here comes Alex. Hey, everybody. It's Alex back in the Hydro City Zone. So, yeah, again, th this has been a, a huge celebration. Uh, I'm very happy about all this. Um, I'm going to put the Hydrocity music on because it's a rocking tune, to be sure. We're going to start, of course, with Act 1. Because that's the first game, that's the first act that I encountered as a kid. Because you have to play the levels in order. Alex Yard points, uh, sorry, uh, Quasi Mensa says, Hey Alex, did you know that Flying Battery and Death Egg have a similar motif in different parts of the song? Uh, nothing comes to mind, but uh, that, that's a cool thing to look out for. I'm going to have to take a look uh, w with the sharper eye. 
Yeah, so um, th there's any great number of, of things that I could say. Um, it, it's been an absolute wild ride this past year, and really, I, 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 I want you to know a little bit about the journey that I took to get here. And, and I, th I just want to outline it a little bit just to, to give you a reference point of my mentality of, of coming to these things. And maybe even just maybe give you not, not exactly advice, but food for thought about how to approach the things that you're passionate about and how to fit those into your life. Because things that I do with music theory or maybe some of the things that you want to do with music, you know, you, you tried to learn it in the past, you wanted to learn a new instrument or start painting or whatever it is that you're really passionate about, that you're curious and, and it keeps you excited. It can be difficult in our modern world, as more so than ever probably, to juggle those things, right? You got work, you got family, you got all this stuff. Like how, how does it fit into a life? Um, I can't who's in the house. How you doing? Um, and and I can't too. I I just want to give a shout out to I can't too because I can't too is one of a great many commenters that I can think of that just popping into chat I during live streams every now and then. I I, I think that I can't too is a prime example of just being a great contributor and, and just a friendly person and not by doing anything in particular, but just. Yeah, every time I see I can too pop in, that that that's that is one of the a great presence, great food for thought, and I can too has said multiple things in the past that have made me laugh my ass off, and and that, I'm all about that. It, everything that happens in this life, you, you got to find opportunities to laugh. So hi, I can too. Um, Bernard A's name is actually Derek. I'm glad I registered that. So I want to briefly outline the fact that. As I approached my professional life into my 20s and 30s, I never had the mindset where I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to pursue music theory stuff and YouTube videos, and that's going to be my full-time thing. Um, stuff like that, of course, if you had asked me, something like that could have been like a dream scenario. But my mentality was that I didn't want to like graduate from college and then suddenly come into this world and try to make it. I can tell you that the 10 plus years that I spent working as a teacher, working in education, working in the field of medical coding and billing for five years as I did, those were all, even though they had nothing to do with music theory per se, those were actually all very extremely valuable life experiences that helped form me to the person that I am. I just think that if I had come straight out of college and, and started to like make YouTube videos, it, it would have been just this weird hall of mirrors where I don't really have much life experience, but I'm trying to like convey a lesson about life or about music. And, and I just think that getting out there in the real world and making mistakes and learning from your stumbles, um, and, and not just learning from stumbles, but also accomplishing goals, setting goals and accomplishing them. It, it's a very important, healthy mindset to cultivate. So my impression coming into my 20s and 30s was like, all right, I love doing music stuff. I'd love to teach people about music theory. This is something that I thought about even going back to college. I didn't go into it full time. Instead, I said, okay, I'm going to work a 40 hour per week job, right? A typical nine to five. And I'm going to do the things that I'm really passionate about and that I love in my own free time. And if things had continued in that way, if my YouTube channel never picked up a, 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 a lot of viewership, and, and I, it, that wouldn't matter because I would have continued doing it just out of the passion for it because I wanted to do it. I wanted to be there. I wasn't doing it for metrics or numbers or anything like that. And I thought to myself, like, all right, I'm going to keep working a nine to five. But if I keep working on this passion project in my own time, if it were to grow and succeed uh, on its own accord, then I, I will pursue it full time. And that's exactly what happened. Um, but I always had the kind, I guess you could call it a safety net, not so much a safety net as it is just a practical plan um, rather than just go all in. So even though I did that in my spare time it was still something that I loved doing and just the fact that I was able to do it on evenings during the week after work that was a pleasure in itself so to be able to go from that to this is like a total dream come true it's probably maybe even more that I ever could have reasonably asked for um, 
but I do think I deserve it. It's not that I have imposter syndrome. It's just that it's not lost on me every day that I am extremely grateful for, for hanging out with all of you and, and the kind words about the videos and all that stuff. I can't do appreciates the kind words and yeah, it, folks like I can't do and, and Tom TBM and Robo and, and Owen, I could list uh, any number of, of super awesome people that, that uh, have helped bring my experience in this Sonic universe to uh, just a much higher level of enjoyment and, and just a rich experience of being able to have meaningful conversations with people. Now I'm going to flash something on screen right now and it's a book. All right, it's a book called whoops, Reclaiming Conversation, The Power of Talk in a Digital Age. Now, this was a book that I discovered a couple years ago, and it, it, as we dive deeper into internet culture year by year, right, Twitter wars, um, just bickering online, everyone it's just like the Dreamcast Caution Seaman character warned us to say, like, hey, you know, if everybody retreats into their own bubbles and they walk into a situation making demands, and they're not willing to talk it through, that if they don't get exactly what they want, they just book it. They run. They can't handle the conversation, so they run. That doesn't work, and, and that's just going to put us on a path to like even more heavy polarization. So one of the things that I've been doing uh, in recent weeks, and, and, and I will continue doing so in the future, it's something that I've enjoyed a great deal, for example, I've been doing the Alex Yarda News News Dispatches. They're kind of like a Sonic News Roundup and, and a little bit of a taste of other video games, but mostly an emphasis on Sonic. But it's an opportunity to talk through what I'm thinking about and current goings-on in the Sonic community. Now, the Alex Yarda News Dispatches are available on my Alex Yard channel in a playlist. They're unlisted, but anyone can... Like, the playlist itself is not unlisted. It's just that you can't search for the actual videos. But I'm going to be doing one per week, and I, uh, this is part of me seeking to accomplish some of the goals that are so well outlined in this book. I can tell you one amazing thing that I took away from this book, and it's available as an audio book. I know people, a lot of people aren't really into reading, like in terms of sitting down and reading for hours at a time. I, I actually list, I'd never read the book itself, technically. I just listened to the audio book. It's the whole book, obviously, but... I just make that distinction to say that this book is very fascinating and um, illuminating. One of the things that this book speaks to that I've been implementing into my Alex Yarda News dispatches or my tweets or, or any kind of online interaction that I've been having is that there is extreme value. Hold on a second. There is extreme value in having conversations with people where you don't know where the conversation is going to go. You don't come into the conversation with a preset mindset of, of what the, con right? You come in with an open mind. You're willing to listen to anybody without judgment. And the best that you can do is sit down on those two chairs, talk it through respectfully, um, figure out where you agree and where you disagree, and... All you can do is just have that honest conversation and, and then walk away from the, the, the discussion with, you know, you were able to say everything that was in your heart. You were able to say the things that you believe in and the things that are important to you. So um, I highly recommend this book, it, 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 uh, you know, especially as a content creator. Now that I'm not working in an office, I have much less, you know, daily interactions with people um, in real life, like in person. So being able to have chats on Discord and, and talk through some more complex, you know, not straightforward issues, you'd be surprised how many things... You, you think the Sonic universe is just this frivolous thing, but you find that when you actually start to engage with some of these discussion topics, it can actually tangentially but still relevantly lead to some heavy aspects about what we believe in and how we treat each other and what the definition of respect is, okay? So the reason why I wanted to talk about this during this level is because right now, if you could see that text at the upper left-hand corner of the screen, okay, what that says is that we need to talk about how you talk about hydrosity zone. Okay, now 
I, 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 I solemnly swear I'm going to take an oath right now. During the stream, I will not outline any of my reasons for why I pronounce it hydrosity zone. I will also not try to talk through the reasons why I disagree with why someone might conclude that it should be pronounced Hydro City Zone. I promise I'm not opening that Pandora's box. That, see, my hand is up. That There's my oath. And if I start to do so, I'm going to catch myself, and you should all hold me accountable. We're not actually talking about Hydrosity Zone. We're actually just talking about how we talk about it w w with other people. Now, of course... This topic has led to a lot of toxicity among the Sonic fandom. And I, I, I would like an alternate, I would like to present an alternate mindset about how you can approach, right, when you sit down in those two chairs, like I outlined, right, you're having a public discussion on Twitter or on Discord or any sort of public setting. Um, let's establish some baseline factors about how we treat each other with respect in, in terms of that. Now, I want to just tell you a, a quick personal anecdote. Um, one of my best like experiences as a Sonic fan, and, and one of my kind of just most memorable memories of being a Sonic fan, uh, uh, something that I will always cherish, is I was on an audio call with Cybershell, and we were just chatting, you know, about different music theory stuff, and uh, and we got to the topic of music theory. And we were talking about future videos. And Cybershell said, you know, something, I don't remember his exact words, but he said, you know, I I'm really excited maybe if you do a Hydro City Zone video. And he pronounced it Hydro City Zone, whereas I pronounce it Hydrosity. That was one of my greatest and, and most happiest memories because it was me and Cyber hanging out, shooting the shit. And he could say Hydro City Zone, and I could hear that, and, and I could regard that as totally legitimate. And it just warmed my heart. It was just like a crystallization of why um, people come to the different t people come to the table with different experiences. And and on one le like one thing that you will never see me do is you shame people for like, oh, how can you pronounce it that way? You know, like you're, you're ridiculous, right? I'm not opening that box today, but all previous comments that I've had on the matter, um, I, I, I specifically talk about the premises, why people cite. But that that moment with Cybershell was just a, a, a very simple, you know, toss away moment. It wasn't a big deal, but it was just like, I'm so glad that he can say it one way and I can say it another. And, and, and we can recognize that we're both legitimate human beings, and it's not that either of us is right or wrong, but we're just hanging out, vibing with the music, vibing with these. So that that was just, and I didn't even say anything to that effect at the time, but, you know, especially reflecting back on it, that, that was a warm, that, that was a high point in my Sonic experience. And I, I, I highly recommend that you take that approach. Um, because it, it's just not worth it to sit around and, and, and stew about the fact that you pronounce a word one way and the rest of the world pronounces it another way, like uh, in equal measure, it's about 50-50 as that recent poll that, that Sega sent out. The fact that half the planet uh, pronounces it one way, because half the planet pronounces it Hydro City Zone, even just that in the fact in itself, that's why I would never go up to someone and say, how could you think it's Hydro City Zone? Because how could they think it's Hydro City? Well, half the planet thinks that it's Hydro City Zone. So obviously they're not some illiterate, unsmart thing. And, and that's the problem is that people try to come to the table and use kind of shame and bullying tactics to try to make their point. And it's especially, it hits home and it makes a person a little bit sad I, you know, in, in reflecting on it when instead of using it as an opportunity to sit down in those two chairs and I mean you had Ruth Bader Ginsburg who's on the Supreme Court uh, leaned very heavily in the liberal direction and then you had Antonin Scalia who was one of the most conservative mindset right but they, they were on totally opposite ends of the political spectrum but those two people were, they shared a, a best friendship. Like maybe not that they were best, best friends, but they considered each other to be one of their best friends. They, I think, went to operas. To, the fact that they could disagree on such fundamental things about law and, and culture, 
but the fact that they were able to sit down and enjoy an opera and go out for a bite to eat together is so fantastic, and, and I think that society crumbles if we don't have that. Instead of meeting someone and saying, like, oh, where are you from? Massachusetts. Oh, so you like the Red Sox? Get out of here, right? Like, that person is kind of kidding in a way, but they're kind of ca having their cake and eating it, too, because they're saying, like, oh, I'm going to use this opportunity to make a comedic joke that also slams you for your identity. It slams you for identity, and it's slamming you for an identity that, in some ways, you didn't choose that identity. Like, I didn't choose to be born in Massachusetts. Um, you didn't choose to be born in New York. So what you're really saying in that moment is like, how dare you be born in a different state than me? Like if you actually put that under scrutiny, it doesn't really check out at all. So I would recommend in the spirit of that book, Reclaiming Conversation, there is, it, there, there is an extreme amount of value to sitting down, talking through disagreements, and, and more than that, we've been doing this on the Discord. I think it's been hugely illuminating and satisfying and rewarding um, to talk through and try to work through them in real time, right? I come to the table with an opinion, and maybe one of my patrons comes with a disagreement. I, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate when my patrons come to the table and say, Hey, Alex, I disagree with you about this hydrosity thing or about this sonic thing. Let's talk it out, a and then th that person outlines their points, and I'm like, hmm, I never had to consider that. Even just the act of sitting there and talking and thinking through it in real time, that is extremely valuable, and that will help you just have practice for working through problem solving and solutions for the future. Um, that is the route that I recommend because it's healthy, it's consistent with having you know a very welcoming and inclusive Sonic fan base. And on one level, I shouldn't have to even say it because I consider that to be just a baseline requirement of respect. Now, what I want to caution you against is bullying, intimidation, and running. Okay, Those are three tactics that, that you will see people use to... It, it's a way of digging their heels in and be stubborn and, and just totally double down on what they're saying. And the reason why you know that they actually don't have a good point to make is because they run. They either run from the actual conversation because they're too afraid to have it, or they, they, they dig their heels in and start to... Uh, sometimes it can uh, approach into the bullying territory. Whether or not it's bullying is, is a thing in itself, but shame. Shame is the thing that we are... Uh, that, that, that there's no doubt about. That, that there are people like... I will shame, I, I, let me put it this way, I will never shame a person for pronouncing it Hydro City Zone. Never. I will never go up to a person and say, the fact that you pronounce it Hydro City Zone, that's crazy, get the hell out of here. Like, I, that will ne that, that's like an important core mission statement. I, I solemnly swear that I will never shame someone for the simple fact that they pronounce it a certain way. What I will do is call out faulty logic when people say the reasons why they pronounce it a different way and those reasons don't make any sense, um, I will not hesitate to, to, to break down, right? But all I can do is kind of talk through my perception of the premises, and I can tell you that I think that based on your premises, you're, you're drawing an incorrect conclusion about the pronunciation or about whether Sonic CD is a good game or not or if it's reasonable to react negatively to Sonic Origins. Any number of these things, I will not shame you for having the opinion. Um, what I will do is have a polite and respectful conversation to talk through all the moving parts because some of these things are complex issues. What I will never tolerate is bullying. And the reason why I need to talk about either bullying or the shaming thing as it relates to Hydrosity Zone is because T. Lopes has been engaging in some very concerning toxic shaming when it comes to Hydrosity Zone. Now, I guess this just hits home especially hard for Alex Yard because Sonic 3 is a game that I've loved since I was a young child. And I, 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 a, a, as the years pass, I, I've only grown a deeper and deeper appreciation for it. So... <laughs> When it gets to a point where T. Lopes is now brought on board to an official Sega project, and he's he worked on Sonic Mania, right, the game that I've been playing here today and, and that I quite enjoy, um, the fact that 
T. Lopes takes a canon role within Sonic Mania, which is a huge honor, and I think that T. Lopes knocked it absolutely out of the park. He did a fantastic soundtrack in Sonic Mania and Shredder's Revenge, and right, all that stuff is totally true, but totally separate. I, I will not give T. Lopes any extra leeway, right, or cut him a break, or try to ignore some of his bad behavior simply because he, 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 he's turned out some masterpiece soundtracks. Th those are two totally separate things. I would even say that the fact that T. Lopes is such a influential creator with his music, and, and his music has brought a lot of joy and, and, and enjoyment and inspiration to people, I would say that that actually makes it doubly, triply important for me to call out and condemn the toxic behaviors that I've been seeing. T. Lopes entered the official canon to do the soundtrack of Sonic Mania, for example. In the past couple months, there's been a renewed interest in the discussion of how to pronounce hydrosity. What totally breaks my heart is to see T. Lopes use the, the material of hydrosity as a weapon to shame people. That breaks my heart. The fact that you would kind of be a, a, just shame people for having the pronunciation choice, just the fact that, that they pronounce it a different way than you do, is so intolerable that you would send out a message like this. Now, if you can see on the screen, this is a tweet from T. Lopes on July 2. Um, it, it, it's a continued thread of one of his probably multiple tweets that he sent out. Um, I think he sent out a video on YouTube that was based... I, I didn't watch it, and I've, t I, I've told people in the past why I haven't listened to it. Basically, he put out some kind of remix of the Hydrosity... Right, so he's using the Hydrosity music to make this really toxic, hostile point, shaming people for pronouncing it the way that I do. Um, and so to, to use that... Basically, he took the Hydrosity composition, which he didn't compose. He took that composition and made a bit out of it where... Again, I didn't listen to it, so I don't know all the lyrics to it. Um, but the theme of that remix was to say, hydrosity is not a word, right? That, that was the premise of, of that song. So to use the palette of a beloved level like hydrosity and, and, and its mind-blowingly amazing music as a weapon in this bully, shameful arena... I condemn it. I reject it. It's very disappointing, and, and I would just say if T. Lopes it, it, it eventually catches wind of this, I would say uh, I love your work as a composer. I, I look forward to, to moving past this type of behavior, but it's very off-putting. It's very counterproductive, and it's not. It, it just doesn't fit into an inclusive sonic society. Looking a little bit at chat, Steve Reen, 511, Steve Reen. Steve Reen is, is a fantastic guy. He became a patron, I think, a, a few months ago. Uh, I, even just in these past few months, I've had so many, well, we've had a few Discord calls where um, we talked about, you know, just casual stuff, video games, but also I've had some very real and, and very illuminating conversations with Steve where Steve has challenged respectfully. Steve comes to the table. He says, hey, Alex, I, I disagree with what you said. Can we talk it through? Um, and, and, and those situations, th those exchanges that we've... I regard Steve to be a, a very valuable you know, pal in the Sonic community because he is willing to, instead of just sending out a tweet and, 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 and trying to pile on shame and borderline intimidation, right? You look at this tweet by T. Lopes, if you actually think about what T. Lopes is saying here, it's pretty horrible. Because what does T. Lopes think is going to happen as the result of this tweet? Let's play out a hypothetical scenario. Ready? I log into Twitter. I, I, I see T. Lopes put on his needy, insecure Hydrosity remix. And, and, and then he puts it out, uses that beloved composition as a weapon in his toxic flame war or whatever. 
and, and then he follows that up by saying, oh, by the way, it hurts less if you accept it. So here, here's a hypothetical response to that. Well, pronouncing it Hydro City Zone conflicts with all of my English training and my bachelor's degree and my background in English language arts and even the phonetic reading training that, that I received as a child in kindergarten. But because T. Lope says it hurts less if I accept it, um, yeah, I guess I accept it. A and I'll avoid that hurt. I'll avoid that hurt if I just accept it and I go against what all the logic and reason and education and sensibility ha has brought me to conclude. So see, that, that was just a hypothetical scenario I just played out. That is so ridiculously absurd that someone like T. Lopes would think that like, oh, hurts less if you accept it. Basically, you're saying it's kind of like, it's kind of like a Donald Trump thing where he's calling the dude from Georgia and being like, oh, if you could just get me those 11,000 votes, that, that would be great. Oh, if we could just move past this, oh, we'd be fine. Oh, it would be a shame, you know, if we weren't to get those 11,000 votes, right? I look at that tactic, and, and that's all part of the same problem, is that T. Lopes is avoiding conversation by just not speaking to the inaccuracy of his premises, and he's trying to conclude the situation by saying it hurts less if you accept it. So you should just accept it. Right. And, and, and there's no cop out that you could make. A, oh, T. Lopes is just kidding. Right. Because T. Lopes has sent out multiple tweets that pass agree, passively aggressively outline his very foolish reasons for pronouncing it Hydro City. Now, remember, it's not foolish to pronounce it Hydro City Zone. It is foolish to take to a social media platform and, and then try to bully and shame people because they pronounce it differently without actually engaging in the reasons why they pronounce it the way that they do. So I I'm going to wrap up this segment right now and get back to Sonic Mania. Uh, I'm very excited to continue. This has been a great day. It will continue to be a great day. A a and I just wanted to say this as evidence of the fact that, like, I don't let these things rain on my parade. Because if I you have to walk into social media with an expectation that you might be disappointed by anyone. You have to be very careful in who you put trust in because... If you look to a friend or a content creator that you admire, if you kind of like have a default trust in them, and when I say trust, I don't mean that they're going to betray you, just that you trust them to think through things fairly and talk through disagreements. So T. Lopes, the only thing I would ask you to, ch I, I have no problem if you pronounce it Hydro City Zone forever. And even if I disagree with your reasons for doing so, that actually has nothing to do with me. The only thing that I will do, and I will recommend that you will do, is constructively explain to people why you think it should be pronounced a certain way. After you outline your reasons, you have to walk away. You have to walk away because you have to let the person decide for themselves how to pronounce it. You can't get people to... Uh, pronounce it a certain way because you're saying it hurts less if you accept it. Just get over it. You're wrong. Um, when you do that, I, I lose all confidence in your viewpoint because if you are resulting to those kind of tactics as a substitute for actually engaging with the topic, that tells me everything I need to know. Trust, this type of trust that I'm talking about is very important. And I w will use the example of Owen. Owen is... Owen, quickly I'll recap that I didn't like Sonic 1 for most of my life. Owen became a patron, he joined the Sonic Debate Society, and I had a d discussion with Owen where Owen got me to comp completely rethink the value of Sonic 1, and now I regard to be that to be a great game. So, Owen came to the table with an open mind, so did I. I, I I've, been, I I've been convinced that Sonic 1 is the weakest game in the original series, and because Owen sat down and gave me a respectful and level-headed outline of all his points, 
I, I don't forget that. That's very valuable, and, and that means uh, that's an indication that I say, like, all right, now in the future, if Owen were to say something like, oh, actually, Sonic Unleashed is really good, and it's one of the best, if not the best, 3D games. If I heard that from some schmuck on the street, I, I would just say, like, uh, why do I need to give that person's opinion any weight? But if Owen says it, Owen has a, a kind of established a track record of having fair conversations, uh, making his points respectfully, and, and, and by and large, accepting the fact that other people might disagree. A and I applaud that. I'm almost a little bit reluctant to applaud it because I don't think it's some kind of really special thing. I consider that to be, because it is, a baseline requirement of treating people with respect. So um, I instead of just making this, you know, a big pessimistic condemnation of, 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 of the things that T. Lopes has said here, I'm going to turn it around to T. Lopes and, and I'm going to extend a huge... Not so much an olive branch because I haven't done anything wrong, but just just a warm and open invitation, T. Lopes, to reevaluate how you have conversations with other Sonic fans or, or the people in your life. Um, you're not conducting yourself in a way that deserves my respect or anyone else's. And you could just as easily move the conversation forward by... Um, calmly listening to the reasons why people pronounce a certain word the way they do and then it, if 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 you can't convince them to change their mind based on the reasons then you failed and i don't mean that in, in a bad way like oh you failed whatever i just mean it in terms of you failed it's like i've failed in, in these discussions in the past i've sat down with people and, and tried to convince them that Sonic Mania, uh, sorry, Sonic Heroes is a good game. I outline all the reasons why I think Sonic Heroes is actually good, but that's li that's the extent of my participation in the discussion. After I just outline all my reasons, it is up to that person and that person and alone to decide how they're going to pronounce the word. So when I try to convince someone to like Sonic Heroes and, and it doesn't work out, that is... I don't want to say it's a failure on my part, but w what I can do is I can be man enough and mature enough to say, all right, I guess in this case, I, I didn't convince them to see things the way that I do. That's their choice. That's not something that I'm going to continue berating them about in order to try and change their mind um, because that's just totally counter to an inclusive and welcoming and an accepting Sonic society. Using Sonic IP, such as its music or levels, as a weapon to fuel that toxicity is tragic. So I would say just T. Lopes engage with the issues themselves and accept that people are going to come to different conclusions than you do. I mentioned earlier in the stream that some of the people that I admire pronounce it Hydro City Zone. It doesn't upset me when they do. It's a cause for celebration and like diversity. It's kind of like a stretch to say that that's a diversity thing, but just the fact that both of those pronunciations are equally valid in their own ways is a way to celebrate the different opinions that we have throughout this wonderful Sonic universe and, 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 and not an opportunity to get toxic. I will say that... Um, I guess that I, I'm going to quickly look at all the, the, the comments that have come in in the past... Uh, the past couple minutes, I I, ex I I appreciate the props. Digitus saying congratulations, you deserve you deserve everything. I love your content. I can't do very sagely says that the hydrocity hydro city debate is just an allegory for life. You will meet people in your life that will disagree with you 
and you'll have to engage them to solve those problems. I'm going to screenshot that. That's that, that's a perfect crystallization of everything that we're talking about. Now, I I don't want to only read comments that are, uh, you know, saying things consistent with my viewpoint. I'll, I'll be totally honest and transparent that I'm seeing multiple comments so saying that basically you don't think that he's trying to have a go at anyone. He's just bantering. He's not bullying. Um, people saying that I'm overreacting. Um, like, for real, you acting like this is a personal attack. Any other comments disagreeing with me? All right. Runstar Homer, great username, says, Dude, the tweet you're uh, complaining about looks like some completely harmless ribbon. Harvard Yard gets my point, but doesn't think using Hydrosity as the example is doing me any favors. It's too silly. So you agree with my overall point, but you don't think that this particular hydrosity example I is an example of that? Um, here's what I'll say. If you... I, I would be... I'm not going to drag this on. I'm going to resume the game pretty soon. But if you think that what he's doing is just basically harmless ribbing, um, that, that's totally fine. I, I would say that that's a cop-out. It's a cop-out because it is, you know, I, I, I brought up this aspect with other content creators and even Stephen Colbert. Stephen Colbert has, as of recently, been engaging in a lot of the bully tactics that um, he used to so effectively satirize. He used to be just a huge parody of Bill O'Reilly because Bill O'Reilly would always dig his heels in he didn't want to have a conversation. If someone was making a good point and disagreeing with him, he would cut their mic. He would say, go to commercial, cut his mic, right? That That's a huge red flag. That tells you everything you need to know, you know? I would say that... And guess what? To my point earlier, to my point earlier, I'm going to flash this up on the screen again. Reclaiming conversation. So right now, that's what we're doing. I'm telling you a, a lot of important things that, that I think about when I experience th this kind of messaging on, on a public forum. Um, I want to be clear. T. Lopes has every right to do this. Nothing I'm saying here is like he, he's not in his rights. All I'm doing is offering constructive criticism about how these kinds of things are experienced by others. Um, and, and even just, I'm giving T. Lopes a hint. T. Lopes, if you want to convince people, you, you got to do a better job because what you're doing is leaning on just a, an insistence. You think that if you keep saying it, it hurts less. If you accept it, it'll hurt less. That, it, you're not changing my mind and you're not changing a lot of people's minds. So, Part of the reason I'm flashing this on the is because right now I'm laying my thoughts on the line in front of a live audience and I'm having a great many people, you know, disagree and challenge me with that. And I think that's great. I, I want to I'm going to resume the game soon. But I, I, I'm saying this because I do not want my views on this topic or any topic to exist in an echo chamber. I, I want to tell you what I'm thinking and, and respond to it. Um, what I'm going to say in lieu of... Uh, 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 of opening up a whole new thing. I'm going to say that the sort of approach that that has been engaged here, I cannot just write it off as, oh, he was just joking. Because he's done it time and time again, and it, it's that kind of thing where... I was talking about height earlier in this stream. I, I, I identified the fact that I am 5 feet 7 inches, and that that is not considered tall, and that height is... A, a thing that, you know, like we were saying, it's a total taboo to identify someone as obese. But if someone's short, you can just make a big joke about it in, in the presence of your colleagues in a professional setting, and that's totally fine. Um,
What the hell was my point with height? <laughs> I brought that up earlier. Ah, it's because um, here, when you all say here, here's the, here's the. I think this is probably the last thing that I can leave you with on this topic before I resume the game. Um, for you to say that, oh, T. Lopes was just kidding. He, it was just a good-natured ribbing. My experience of that is basically like if I was at work and I overheard, because this happened to me, I overheard someone say like, oh, if you want to work on this project, y you have to go to Alex to, to go get a form. You know Alex, the, the short guy? Go get a form from him and uh, and, and then you, like, the, to, it, the, like examples like that or like there, there have been times where someone, you know, calls it out directly and says like, oh, hey, Alex, um, you know, you're just talking about, oh, uh, oh, what did you do this weekend? And someone says, oh, yeah, I, uh, I, I went out, you know, to, we went out, um, checked out this new place. I went out with my family. Oh, how's your son doing? And he says, oh, he's doing great. He's taller than you. If you've never felt a feeling like that, to have a conversation like that surrounded by colleagues, what it feels like in that moment is that if I actually called someone out on that, I would bet that they would say, oh, I was just kidding. Right, but that that's a cop-out because you could say that you're kidding, but the fact of the matter is you pursued a, a form of conversation that led to an energy where it's like, hey, everybody, Alex is short. So to just say that it is a, uh, oh, that just a good-natured ribbing, I think you're right, like that, that's, that's messed up to, to ask me to just take that kind of beating in the presence of my colleagues. So it, it, it's reasons like that where I always get off-put by people at social gatherings when th they're constantly ribbing you about this or that, and, and, and they just have the cop-out to say, like, oh, that, that was just a ribbing. Now, of course, the examples that I just gave are not exactly the same as the pronunciation discussion, but it's the same kind of thing where you're having your cake and eating it too. You're, you're telling me I'm wrong or not smart or something like that for believing the things I do that, that make perfect sense. And, but even more so, I think the reason why T. Lopes deserves the shame in, in, in this particular example is because... He's digging his heels in and trying to shame people by citing premises that don't make sense. If his premises made sense, maybe they would be right, but he is he is digging his heels in on premises that would make him fail a test in a college course. And it, it's just a really weird feeling when you have tweet after tweet. The fact that T. Lopes is so insecure about the pronunciation that he had to spend time making a remix, um, uh, uh, saying that hydrosity is not a word, even though Sandopolis is not a word, like it, it it's pretty bizarre. It it it's bizarre, but it's also not surprising because it's becoming more common in our world. And that's why I'm here talking about it. Saying my piece, you may not agree with me, but I, I can just say that all I can say I I is my experience from my viewpoint, which is that you are doing a terrible job of trying to persuade people. If you actually wanted more people to pronounce it the way that you do, if for some reason that mattered to you, which it seems clearly like T. Lopes thinks about this a lot, whereas I can have a chat with pals and have them pronounce it Hydro City Zone and use that as an example to celebrate the different perspectives and, and all the different viewpoints that people bring to the... T it's just, it's an easy win that you're turning into a toxic fest, maybe in part to just generate a little bit of sensationalism and, and maybe a little bit of drama. Oliver Lamb says, T. Lopes is going to call you wrong and short. So, th that's hilarious. Um, if T. Lopes did that, like, if T. Lopes spent time calling me wrong about a pronunciation or short, I would actually take that as a huge compliment because... That just shows you that he was so bothered by all of this that, that he kind of had to make a statement uh, about me personally. Like, when I do my Alex Yarden news dispatches, I hope you understand that by and large, for the most part, 
for the most part, I am only critiquing people that that I generally at least kind of regard like I in a good way and, and I respect their work and, and I would be looking forward to, to maybe even a friendship with them in the future. I can think of kids that, that I was friends with back in, in my school days. I can think of one friend who was one of my best and most favorite friends, but the first couple of years that we knew each other, we absolutely hated each other. He, he went out of his way to, to, to bother me sometimes. I kind of took it. Um, it wasn't, but we were young, and I didn't hold it against him. After those first couple of years, we somehow finally found a way to, to, to and, and he, he was one of my favorite persons that I have ever met in my entire life. So I always come to the table to reclaim conversation and sit in one of these two chairs and talk it through respectfully and non judgmentally. I, I will, uh, T. Lopes, th there's an open invitation. From anyone else that, that I've disagreed with on anything, um, the, 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 I always come to the table willing to talk these things through. It, it's not because, like I said, w we can't just be living in our bubbles and, and digging our heels in to an opinion and, and, and just not listen. Right? So society can collapse if we if we do that. Um, so just take it as an opportunity to, to celebrate the entire Sonic community. Um, yeah. As I mentioned, I only bring up these things on people that I respect and people that I, I look forward to any potential communication and long-term respect and friendship with T. Lopes. But that does not prevent me from calling out disrespectful behavior when I see it. Um, so everything I said today, it, it, guess what? Everything I said today, it, it's now the ball is in your court. You have to make up your own minds, and I'm not going to give you a hard time if you disagree with me about my approach to how we have to have public conversations with an open mind and what respect actually means So here's the last thing I'll say, and to promise you that I won't get sucked into another tangent, I'm going to say this only once I get the game back on the screen, because now we're going to go through Hydrocity Zone in Sonic Mania, and we're going to have a great time, even though this version of the level kind of slows you down with underwater stuff more than it probably is warranted. Um, we're going to celebrate it, we're going to love it, and, and we're going to laugh and, and continue talking about this stuff, but, uh, so I'm going to disappear now, there I go. Um, I thought I saw a comment that, that I, uh, Yeah, so I promise this is the last thing I'll say, and, and I'll even boot up the, the Hydrocity Zone, and we're going to resume this fantastic adventure. So a lot of people in, in this chat, again, this is reclaiming conversation. This is me talking about this in real time. I, I had no idea where this conversation was going to go, and, and now I'm going to say at least my final piece on this uh, uh, before we continue on. I'm going to read the comment right now by Genji Harvester. Genji Harvester is speaking to the fact that if you all think that, oh, T. Lopes is, is just good-natured ribbing, you're taking it too seriously, Alex, you're, you're reading too into it, here's what I would say to that. Genji Harvester's comment is saying that there was nothing lighthearted or clever about it. No wit. It was just kind of a self-pandering objectification. It's a fantastic point because if if it was actually just a good-natured joke, then I, I would be laughing at the humor of it. Um, but it's not. I exactly as Genji Harvester said, there was no wit. It was just him uh, 
doubling down on what he believes and saying, just accept it. I, I guess the last thing I would say is that that approach, right, to say just accept it, that comes from a very real place in, in T. Lopes's heart, in T. Lopes's uh, understanding of what respect means. The fact that he would send that tweet with that energy and, and direct that, hey, everybody in the Sonic world that pronounces it like I don't, this is this is my response to that. That, I, I, I think, speaks volumes. And if anything, that just, you know, shows you how you can't just say, oh, he's just kind of joking. It, it's all in good fun. That that comment, because it doesn't have any actual wit, that is just showing you that that's actually a very legitimate glimpse into T. Lopes's thought process. Bullius is in the house. How's it hanging? It's going real good. I'm very excited to continue in Mahadro City Zone. I've only got two emeralds, but hey, I'm not like a really active emerald hunter. Um, remember when you played Sonic 1? And you get to Labyrinth Zone, there's a whole bunch of underwater parts. And you're just like, all right, this is not the strongest point in my enjoyment experience in Sonic 1. Okay. You get to Sonic 2, you got Aquatic Ruin. Now, of course, Aquatic Ruin has some pretty nightmarish underwater sequences. However, a lot of them, if not maybe all of them, can be avoided in some form. You get to Sonic 3. Sonic 3 kind of continues that Sonic 2 mentality where it's like, all right, we've got this crappy underwater path that a, a lot of it, if not all of it, can be avoided. And we're even going to do these cool sequences when you're right on the surface of the water. Oh, God. You're right on the surface of water and you're moving at high speeds, almost kind of like, doing, you know, in Sonic 06, when Sonic is going really fast and he arrives at the water. I've never played that game, but I get the sense that if you approach the water at full speed, then you can continue running on the surface of the water, much like you do in Hydrocity Zone in Sonic 3. All right, so far so good. Everything that I've outlined from Sonic 1 to 2 to 3, it seems like Sega, right, the Sonic water experience in 2D is moving in a, in a pretty solid direction. And then we get here. Now, you've been seeing what I've been doing for the last couple minutes. It's been mostly underwater. This is just... I mean, it's actually leaning pretty heavily into some of the water levels that it takes inspiration from. Because you saw it before, when I got in that bubble, and this right here is right out of Sonic CD, isn't it? Tidal Tempest. Um, as soon as I got out of the water, what the hell was my point? Oh, yeah. When I got in those bubbles... And then you ride the bubble up. That's taken right out of at least one Game Gear game. Maybe Triple Trouble. I'm not sure. But yeah, and I think Game Gear Sonic 2 has it as well. And I actually kind of like those sequences. If you can believe it, I actually do kind of enjoy the Game Gear sequences where you get in a bubble like this and kind of have to maneuver. Um, I don't like it here, especially because of everything in light of what I was just saying about the logical progression of like figuring out game by game how can we make a water level experience work cerulean confirms the bubble gimmick is directly from sonic 2 8 bit yes and i believe it also appears in triple trouble the crazy triple trouble level where if you play as tails you can actually get a submarine that can shoot missiles it's so cool um it's just funny that it has that random extra gimmick that's only available to Tails. Pretty awesome. Now, what do we think about these boats? Because you just saw me sit still and wait, you know? Um, I'm just going to go grab one thing um, from the other room.
Meg likes the bolts. They're cute. Also says that sewer levels are a gaming staple. Delay points out that Hydrosity went from one of the fastest zones to one with the most amount of weight. And Delay, you make a very good point that that is an inexcusable disconnect. <coughs> Looking at you, Christian Whitehead. Looking at you, and only you. <laughs> Alex G says Sonic just chilling on that gondola. I can too says, are we saying that the evolution of water levels is like Goldilocks and the Three Bears? Labyrinth is too much water. Aquatic ruin isn't enough, but hydrosity, oh, it's the perfect sweet spot. Jeez, I should do a whole YouTube video just based on that concept. Thanks, I can too. I should get you on payroll, jeez. Yeah, this whole bubble mechanic, I do like it on the 8-bit games, as I said. However, whoa, did you see that? The bubble, like, moved to the side. Let's see if I can replicate that. Ooh, that's not supposed to happen in the real world of physics or whatever. Can you not go down? Whatever. And it'll just bounce off the projectiles because I got the... Uh, Oh, there's Robotnik, chilling in the walls, creeping around. I'm on to you, Ivo. I don't care if you have five PhDs, 300 IQ, cool machines that can kill me. Especially in this boss battle coming up, because I definitely have the upper hand. I don't know how Robotnik... Wait, what act is this? This was all act one. Oh my god, that just... I mean, granted, I stopped at least once to, to go grab something but I will say playing Sonic Mania this week especially in the lead up to the Sonic 3 versus Sonic Mania debate that we've been having I've been hyper aware of the length of these levels and you know some of them are not dying I'm Stardust Speedway is pretty quick but I think Lava Reef, we haven't gotten to Lava Reef yet. It's a pretty fun level. Very, very long, though. Very, very long. So I, I, I might have already said this before, but, you know, complaining about the length of Marble Garden Act 2. Um, You would then have to turn around and explain why Sonic Mania is Lava Reef's and hydra it, it especially stings with hydrosity because there's so much water gameplay you have to do that just takes long to get through. Now, I, I don't know how Robotnik got himself in this pickle. But I got his Eggomatic, and this is really cool. It, it's awesome that in Sonic 3, you get to ride the Eggomatic a bit. I was talking with Lothel once. about how he, he mentioned, and, and this exact same thing happened to me as a kid, that you know playing Sonic 3 as a kid, first time you get to launch base zone, the idea of hopping into Egomatic, you know, Robotnik's flying machine, and, and piloting around was just so goddamn cool. It's like, wow, we've taken over. We've been chasing Robotnik for the last three gig cartridges. Uh, he always gets away. I'm supposed to be the fastest thing alive, but somehow he outruns me in Sonic 2's Death Egg. Uh, and, and I finally got to take over the Eggomatic. Solar Isle 888 hates to burst my bubble. Get it. But you gotta move it. Gotta go fast, gotta go fast, gotta go faster, 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 use the drop dash, easy speed. A five-year-old could go blazing fast. No skill required, no thought required. No consequences. Here's your trophy. Thanks for showing up. I heard that, um, <laughs> oh, this is like the ultimate Harrison Bergeron. Like, lately, if you've been... 
I, I'm worrying that we are descending into a Harrison Bergeron nightmare. Harrison Bergeron is a short story written by the genius author Kurt Vonnegut. If you've ever come across his particular brand of very hilarious but extremely insightful satire. Um, Harrison Bergeron is a story where it, it, it's a future dystopia where the idea that some people might be better than others at being beautiful or being smart, people consider that to be like an unfair inequality. So basically, they, because they want extreme equality, what they do is that they say, all right, we can't have someone who's smarter than another person. Everyone has to be equal. So what we'll do is we'll track down all the intelligent people and we'll install a device in their head so that it like every so often it, it'll like insert a burst of like static interference and they just kind of feel like a stinging, like irritating sensation in their head that kind of um, interrupts their thought process so as to prevent them from like being too smart. Um, I, I worry that things like that are starting to happen. <laughs> and I hope I can remember why I brought this up, because I did have a good point. Mig likes the role reversal boss going backward through hydrosity. Cerulean very aptly points out that we got that awesome water parallax scrolling. Olalilia would be proud. Bernard makes an interesting point that Encore mode takes place canonically after forces. I didn't realize that, but that's super cool. It's so funny that, like, yeah, one of the things we're probably going to mention in the Sonic 3 versus Sonic Mania debate is that Sonic Mania is extremely imbalanced in terms of having a cohesive story. Like, and, and I say that it, it's not just the fact that it's a bunch of random zones in no sensical order. Like, that in itself is actually maybe not even that big of a problem. What's a problem is that it has an inconsistent tone between goofy, funny throwbacks versus trying to take things seriously, like with, with the plot near the end and the Sonic Forces tie-in. Um, perfect example, you get in this game, Green Hill, the, the boss of Act 2 is the Death Egg robot. And the first time you see it, it's absolutely hysterical. What the hell is this doing here? This is really cool that it's chasing me putting a new spin on the Death Egg boss, I, I think that's actually pretty phenomenal. I don't know that I would have put it in the very first level, but the, the overall idea is commendable. Um, But yeah, to, to do like comedic bits like that, it's like, oh, okay, this is just a goofy scrapbook game. That's fine. But then to turn around and try to make us care about this epic story, the Phantom Ruby, and tying into forces. Like, it's just, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. It can't decide what it wants to do. And doing so, it fails at both. T-Dog says that you feel like the only thing holding all these story sequences together is basically the Phantom Ruby. And I mean, like, yeah. I get the sense that a lot of, like, Marvel movies or other action flicks, like, a lot of the conflict MacGuffin stuff boils down to, oh, there's this one object that can do anything and can give you hyper superpowers. We have to prevent that from getting into the hands. Oh, he comes by three times, huh? We have to prevent the evildoer from getting that really powerful object that will control the entire world. Now, hmm, does that sound familiar? Have I seen any movies this year that, that use that exact same MacGuffin device? Yes. And I'll give you a hint. The other movie that uses that whole concept, I'll give you a hint. There's a character in that movie called Maddie Wachowski. Sorry, I should pronounce that correctly. Maddie Wachowski. Because pronunciation matters. 
And you see the way that the rings fly all over the place? T-Dog really likes this boss, and I like it too, especially in the original. Wow, see how high I was going? What is this, Sonic 3 in Origins? Jeez. Do, 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 do. I can too, um, says, uh, are, am I of the opinion that participation awards are both unnecessary and even problematic? I certainly am. Yeah. So I, I highly caution people against the everyone gets a trophy mentality. Um, I think that, um, you could even tie it back into the nab nuts thing we were talking about before with. Banjo Kazooie. Um, I think it's a problem when, if you have a, a, a sports competition, if everybody gets a trophy and everything is a trophy, um, th that's a problem. It, I, it's weird. I, I don't have an exact prescribed solution for this. I think it's not nearly as bad if the winners get a trophy. And then everyone who didn't win gets some kind of certificate for participation, maybe so that they can put it in their scrapbook. But to, to take the next step up and give them an actual trophy um, that, that they can like put on their, you know, their shelf in their room and like maybe somehow feel some feelings of pride. Like when I used to do karate as a younger kid, um, some I would do some of the karate competitions, and sometimes I won and sometimes I lost. And friggin' the times I won, I got a trophy, and I was mad proud, and, and that was something substantive, right? I mean, I, I could talk all on about the trophy generation participation trophy mentality. Um, I, I think it's been well articulated elsewhere. Um, but yeah, I, I would even say that that mentality is like creeping into... P people walk into public conversations about Sonic games or movies or whatever else... And maybe that's not a good... Hey, did Knuckles just disappear? Yeah, this idea that you can, you know, come into a public forum and, and drop all these hot takes and, 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 and you just want to come out the victor. You don't want anyone to disagree. You, the, the idea that someone might have made a better point than you is just absolutely intolerable. You know, and, and, and that could trace back to, you know... Joining a sports league uh, or, or going to, you know, a Boy Scout competition where they make those Pinewood Derby cars. And it's mostly your dad that helps you build it. But you build those little wooden cars to be aerodynamic. And, and, and then you race them. And, and you race it like a meritocracy. If every kid walked away from that thing with some kind of a trophy, that is very unhealthy. Because it, it, it they're going to enter the real world where they're competing for a job promotion or they're competing to have the, you know, predominant opinion about a video game. Um, if things don't go the way they want, they say, hey, wh why am I feeling bad? When I was young and I did the Pinewood Derby or the karate contest, I, I always walked away with a feeling of accomplishment. I, I need to have that now. A and the fact that I'm not is absolutely intolerable. Maybe I should do a whole... Ne never mind. But yeah. It's a great point that you bring up, I can too. I think that it has led to a, a, a very, very deep-rooted problem, even at the level of our colleges and universities in the United States, where, yeah, a lot of these colleges are just, you know, reinforcing that mentality to say everyone's right, everyone's correct, um, and, and, and no one's allowed to challenge you or, or to just even beat you. No one is allowed to best you. And, and I think that goes back to what I was saying about that very good... And it's only like two or three pages. I highly recommend it. That, that It's a story by Kurt Vonnegut, and the title is Harrison Bergeron. And, and, and it, it, it's, it's a lament of the death of the meritocracy, right? A meritocracy is... A, 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 it's the idea that a person... Dude, I mean, I, I, could, I could use a high-minded example of myself. My YouTube videos 
provide a quality experience to people to the point where people watch the videos, they comment, they like, they, they, they give all sorts of support. And because of the merit of my videos, uh, the algorithm, you know, acknowledges that merit and shares it with more people. Say, hey, this Alex Yard and Knuckles channel has some pretty good stuff, so I'm going to reward that and, and bring it to more people. And, and th that's just the basic fundamentals of a meritocracy. And people have lost sight of that because in their childhood or maybe into college, yeah, they, they just got people telling them you won even if they don't show up. <laughs> I can't do mentions a parable that's like a mindset where you say to a kid, everyone is special. You most of all. Right? Of course, like, you can very easily identify those contradictions in a lot of the conversations that, that we have in these, right? Like the idea that everyone is beautiful. Um, here's the, he, here's what I'll say about the everything is beautiful mentality. I'm not going to shame you if you think that. I'm just going to give you a little bit of advice because that everything is beautiful mentality is going to bring you great sorrow in the long term. Because... You can sit around on Twitter or, or with your, you know, your friends at your college and, and you could just say, everyone's beautiful, all different shapes and sizes, right? You can have that opinion in a bubble and, and you're right. You, you have every right to do it. Um, I, I would just give you some practical advice that no one else has to, is forced to play by those rules. And when I say that, I simply mean... Uh, you could take the example of, like, if, if any of you know that YouTube commentator, Kevin Samuels, who very tragically and unfortunately recently passed away unexpectedly. A and unfortunately, his passing away was the only reason that I discovered him. But I, I went down the rabbit hole of watching a lot of his videos. And, and, and a lot of what he did was that he would talk to women and give them advice because these women would come in with this mindset like, all right, I'm having a, a, a huge amount of trouble with dating. I can't find a man. All these men are flaky. I, I think guys nowadays are it just that they're not serious. They don't know what they want, right? So uh, diagnosing the problem as men nowadays are immature or, 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 or they're not true to their word because they have segs and then they just disappear, right? <sighs> what Kevin Samuels does is, is he gives these women a reality check. Because he asks these women, what are you looking for? A and a lot of times what they'll say is, all right, I, I want a man who makes $200,000 because that's the amount of money that uh, is going to be necessary to support me and my two kids that I already have. So I want a man who makes $2,000. And, and, you know, he doesn't have to be a model, but, you know, he has to have ambition. Um, he has to be a nice guy. Um, and, and, and then... <laughs> and then Kevin Samuels will, will very simply say to them, he's basically like, okay, w that's a pretty tall order. What do you bring to the table? What do you bring to the table? And, and, and a lot of times they have to stop and think about it and they say like, oh, I have a great personality. I have amazing conversations. I, I'm really curious and, and I like exploring the world. And, 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 and basically what Kevin Samuels will say is like, all right, listen. There are lots and lots and lots and lots of available women who can say that they have that same strength, right? They're good to talk to. They're good company. Um, if a man makes $200,000, um, he, he's going to look at all the women who have a good personality, and then he's going to say, like, all right, well, what else do they have to offer? And so Kevin Samuels will ask these women, where do you think you rank? Like, you know how you rank uh, someone on their attractiveness, like five or eight or whatever? Kevin Samuels struck a, a very good and insightful balance where he would never, ever, ever in a million years say to a woman, like, I think you're a five or I think you're a two. Get real. He would never, ever do that. What he does is, is so brilliant and insightful. He would say to the woman, where do you rank yourself? Where do you think on the hierarchy of attractiveness... If you were to go on a dating app and, and, and then have guys just swipe left or swipe right and, and see who got the highest, you know, percentage score 
of swiping right, like how many men are attracted to what you have to offer? Um, a lot of these women will come out and say, oh, I'm a nine, I'm a 10. And then it's a video call, so he can see what the person looks like. And then he says, what is your dress size? And then they answer it, right? The numbers don't lie, right? If you have a dress size, he will also ask them, how much do you weigh? Um, the point is that he can give these women a reality check, and it's for their own benefit. It's actually very brave and valuable for Kevin Samuels to say, listen, you're not a 10, and I can say that objectively based on your dress size and, and your weight. Um, so going back to what I was saying, if you think that everyone is beautiful, um, that's fine for you to believe. But if you go into the dating world and have that expectation, you're going to die alone because you're not going to find anyone who thinks that who thinks of beauty in the same way that you do. And if you're holding out for a man that makes two hundred thousand dollars and you think a man that has uh, that much financial, you know, status. Um, and, and, and then is going to look at these women that all have great personalities. And OK, what what else do they have to offer that's going to make me attracted to them? Right. So that's why I caution a woman or a man against the everyone is beautiful mentality because you are going to go to the dating world with unreal expectations. And and this is the thing. These women say like, oh, no, I go on lots of dates with these powerful men. It's not that I have a problem getting dates. It's just that I can't get any of them to stick around and commit to a relationship. These women think that because they're able to get so many dates and they're even willing to get a man to start to actually talk about marriage, they think that, oh, I I'm so close to maybe getting married, but it's just things don't always go wrong and men are immature. No. Those men are just dating and, and having their fun, and, and they'll tell you things to, to keep the dating situation going. But at the end of the day, it's like it it's basically like you're running a business. And if you try to run a business with prices that are way too high, your business is going to collapse. It's going to collapse because you set way too high of a price for yourself on the market. You set a way too high price that the buyer you're looking for uh, uh, laughs at your offer. So to, to distill this down in, into a good takeaway, be cautious with the everyone is beautiful mentality because that will that will essentially run your business into the ground. And I say business as a very loose, not very exact metaphor. The business I'm talking about is really just a matter of your success with your love life and finding a partner. And Ryan Azra just realized that I'm trying to get that damn fourth emerald. And I didn't miss it, so Shadow the Hedgehog is probably going to be doubly pissed. And he's probably going to say another swear word. A swear word that would have gotten me suspended if I said it in class in fifth grade. Oh, God. These are the little spring yard sweethearts. Hey, what's up, Bernard? Bernard in the house. Now, this is very interesting. Shattuck1236 says, Oh, man, dude is treading on dangerous grounds. I don't know that this is a common theme that's been happening more and more lately. Um, but it, it, I, sometimes people react that way. Um, I, I'm curious to know what you mean by dangerous grounds because this is th the kind of thing I'm talking about is not even my own ideas. It's good advice that I found, and I'm forwarding it to others. If you want to take or leave that advice, that's fine. But just know that, like, you know, Lena Dunham sits down at a Hollywood party next to an NBA star, and, and that NBA star, you know, really doesn't pay her as much attention as, as she would have liked. And then for her to walk away and send out a tweet that says, oh, he, he barely talked to me because maybe he's not attracted to my body type, and that's messed up. Um, 
An NBA star or some schmuck on OkCupid is under no obligation to find you attractive. And if you insist on that, then you're living in your own reality bubble that doesn't add up. And, and like I said, no one else is obliged to live in that false reality. And you could either accept that today or you could accept that in 30 years when you are 40 years old and unmarried. The choice is yours. You know, Kevin Samuels is very brave and insightful to, to give those reality checks to these women, a, a lot of whom will take the advice. And I give the credit, so much credit to those women for, for being, they do it live on the air, talking through all this stuff. A and it seems like more often than not, the women take the message, which is great to see because th th Kevin Samuels is not trying to shame them, or, or right? He's just saying, get real. Kevin Samuels is saying, you have these goals that you are failing miserably at. Let me help you achieve those goals better. Right? Anyone's feelings in the matter are, are totally their own problem to deal with. Richard M. says, how are you chill on those special stages? That's funny. And now I'm mad that I didn't win it. I think I was so damn close to the Emerald. I, I wasn't even really thinking about the time. I was just chasing the Emerald. Um, the special stages in Sonic Mania use kind of a similar physics experience to Sonic CD. And I do play those Sonic CD stages quite a bit. Maybe that's partly to explain my general proficiency. I, I absolutely love Sonic Mania special stages. It, it's one of the things that I can praise. Um, I definitely prefer Mania special stages over, I guess, Sonic 1, definitely Sonic 2, and definitely Sonic 3. Blue Spheres is one of the weakest parts of my Sonic 3 enjoyment experience. Bark the bear? I wish we could just talk this through and not bang your heels on the ground, heels. Fists, sugar. But you're just an enchanted illusion of this robot, so I forgive you. Now, I've, after all this buildup with Bark, um, it's going to be damn cool to finally get Bark in a game. It's a shame that they're going to bring Big the Cat back for the fishing sequences in Sonic Frontiers, because that could have just as easily been... Bark the Bear. And of course, I'm kidding because Big the Cat probably has a lot more brand recognition, so that makes total sense. I, I get the sense that Sega does not want to bring Bark the Bear back in any material form. It'd just be like a bonus trophy in Super Smash Brothers or some grab. I can't too. Again, says it's kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Don't set the bar too low, but don't set it so high that you'll never make it over. Yeah, it. It's up to you if you want to be honest in yourself. And, and, and you, you really have to... It's a sort of ego issue where... This just goes back to the social media thing where there's so many social media channels that are saying this endlessly. Everyone is beautiful. Be your best true self. Let it all hang out. Um, that... That sort of mindset on YouTube is very profitable because it's very, very appealing to folks that are struggling uh, in in this domain, right? It, it, it makes a person feel good if they say, like, actually, yeah, everyone is beautiful and I'm perfect just the way I am. That, that That's just totally at odds with the basic principles of self-improvement. And fun fact, Bernard claims that Mighty is actually the basis of Sonic T. Hedgehog. I don't have confirmation, but I do have interest in that hypothesis. Is it because some of the earlier concept art, like the earlier drafts of what Sonic was going to look like, uh, looked closer to Mighty? A and then they brought back that design as Mighty. What was Mighty's main debut? Was it Knuckles Chaotix, probably? Or actually, was Mighty and Ray in that game with the trackball? What is it, Sega Sonic the Hedgehog? I forget. 
I always get Sega Sonic the Hedgehog, and then what is it? Sega Sonic Bros. I don't know. Those those arcade games are kind of confusing. Now, you see how I just did that awesome mid-air sequence where I bounced on the monitor and then two enemies, and I'm going really high above the air? I love those sequences like that because it's like it, it, you kind of have to keep track in where your mind of where Sonic is horizontally without being able to see him. And it's very similar to the Hydrocity boss in Sonic 3 because you get those bombs that launch you up over Eggman. And then you have to think, like, where is Sonic right now? Let me apply the exact amount of pressure to the right so that I land right on Ob Robotnik. And, and, and that is an example of uh, Sonic Origins cut content. In Sonic Origins, that Hydrocity fight uh, has a at least one aspect of cut content, which is that you cannot... The camera prevents you from going above the screen like you're supposed to, like you just saw me do uh, when I came out of that awesome little oil tunnel. So that, right, when I'm dissatisfied with Origins, it's because basic features of Sonic the Hedgehog 3 are missing. They're missing. The idea that now those bombs... <laughs> the reason why I can level it as an objective criticism is because literally the purpose of those bombs, the when you think about the purpose of why they were designed, it was so that you can use them to propel you up and land on Robotnik. It's an opportunity to hit him mid-battle without having to wait for him to come down again. When you remove that from the game, and, and then now you're saying that it's definitive, now you have to wait around and do nothing until he comes back down again. That That's a huge deal-breaker. And, and that's just not nitpicking, you know? That's not a default cynicism of the internet by any means. Yeah, I can't do says you're perfect the way you are is another dangerous idea as far as you're concerned. Everyone can be better than they are and we all know it. I absolutely agree I can't too. And I I will I'll disclose this. When I was dating, when I was involved in the dating world, <laughs> suffice it to say it was not all home runs, right? I, I I've had so many at-bats and so many failures when it comes to dating um, that I, I had to put in my effort. L let's say that much. Um, when I was having failure after failure after failure with dating, um, probably the one of the best pieces of advice that I got, that, that I came across in regard to that, was the idea that You can't sit around and say, oh, why aren't these women, why don't they like me? Right? You could sit around and say, oh, why don't they like me? Right? Well, when am I going to find someone that clicks? Right? Instead of saying that, what you have to ask yourself is like, what can I do to, to make myself a person that they would be attracted to? Right? Every time you try to strike up a conversation with a woman or, or a man or whoever you're interested in, um, Every time you strike out, use that as an opportunity to, like, you, you have to kind of hold your own private post-game conference. You have to, you know, you ask for the number, you don't get it, or, or whatever other failure. You, you go on four dates, and then the person says, actually, I, I don't want to continue. Um, instead of saying, like, oh, why is this so unfair? Right, right, you have to look at everything. You have to look at every possible aspect and say, like, hmm. What actually could I do to improve my chances? I can't change my height. I'm going to be 5'7 for the long haul. W what else can I do to make myself uh, more uh, of a person that people would actually want to hang around with? And that exact concept goes back to what I was saying about content creators. Uh, instead of spending your time going on Twitter and saying, please, I want to get this video to 1,000 views, and it would mean a lot if we got to 10,000 subscribers, right? Instead of asking people, please, please watch my content, what you have to do is say, what can I actually do to make good content that is undeniably good, right? I remember listening to the podcast with some comedians, and, and they were talking about, like, how do you make it? What, what's some good advice? And it sounds, like, circular and not very helpful, but I think it's absolutely salient for anyone. 
the way to succeed in that example, the way to succeed in the comedy world is to be undeniably good. <laughs> and of course, you could sit there and say, what, I can't just wave my magic wand and be undeniably good. Yeah, but you can keep honing your craft. You can still improve your skills. You can still have an open-minded approach to how you make content or, or for that matter, how you present the total sum of your identity when you're going on a date with someone. And yeah, that, that, that if you sit around and, and be angry about why you think that you're perfect the way you are, but the dating market is not validating that with, you know, a response and, and a long-term relationship, um, that's all on you. And if you continue to sulk in that denial, literally the only person who will pay the price is you. It's, it's self-destructive in that way. At least I got a fire shield so I can breathe in all this toxic fire haze. I think that this shield renders me immune to this. Hor I'm going to leave the toxic haze as a goof. Uh, um. Uh, interesting comments down here. And one of them is what Steve Reen say. Not only did they break that aspect of the hydrosity boss, but it's also, yes. So you want to talk about cut content in Sonic Mania? There's cut content, but then there's just totally, like, neutralizing any challenge or meaningful gameplay experience. Because as Steve points out, you can just jump and hit Robotnik from the ground at any time. So there's literally no... It, it basically, if, if I could make one ultimate point that underlies all of Origins, is like when you make a tweak like that, then now you are rendering deliberate aspects of the game totally pointless. The idea that Robotnik comes down to start, um, what's it called? The idea that someone, what the hell am I trying to say? <laughs> The idea that Robotnik comes down, that's supposed to be one of your brief windows of opportunity to get in a hit or two. Um, similarly, when Robotnik, um, when he first lets go of that Cyclone, you can stand on the Cyclone and, and very reasonably get two hits in. Um, what's it called? When you change the game so that now Sonic... Is this considered cheesing? You know, I actually die sometimes because of the shield. Using the shield in the oil can get very hectic and complicated. So I, I always caution people, don't get stuck in these oil ponds with a shield. I don't know if they're talking about that in health class, but it's something you, you should keep in mind. Um, but yeah, Steve, as Steve was saying, the fact that you can just jump up and hit him at any time, that literally means that y you have taken away all the purpose and consequence of those other gameplay mechanics of that boss that, that I mentioned a minute ago. Oh, and people are confirming that, indeed, when I have that fire shield, I am not immune to the toxic haze. Um, and I'm really glad you pointed that out, because if I had continued playing the game based on that incorrect perception, I, I would have continued to lose rings and maybe even die. Kind of like what I was saying before about if you enter the social world with, you know, unrealistic expectations about how people perceive you, um, you're going to end up lost in that toxic haze, baby. And that's on you. That's on you. Now, Metafizzle, so many amazing usernames here tonight. Metafizzle, how you doing? Great username. Metafizzle says... Would you ever play Sonic 06 on stream? Aside from the Schadenfreude, I'd be interested in your opinion of what works and what doesn't. Yeah, so I'd be curious to get your thoughts on this um, metaphysical because 
I, I think I mentioned like a few hours ago during the stream that, yeah, Sonic 06 is definitely on my to-do list to play and stream at some point. I'm thinking of probably, no, I actually am definitely thinking that if I do do that, then it's going to be Project 06. And uh, what was my point? Yeah, just that I, I would like to play it, but Project 06 seems playable. I have no interest in stumbling through the real game. I mean, even just on the basis of loading screens it is kind of a non-starter. Um, but with all the bugs, yeah, I, I don't play Origins. I'm, I'm almost 35 years old. I'm coming up on a very important checkpoint in my life because your 20s are like... I don't want to say that your 20s are like your childhood, but your 20s are the first decade where you actually have to go live in the real world and you have to put all of your education and training and, and all the lessons and morals that your parents and your friends and your teachers taught you your 20s are like you, you you go into the real world and, and then you put, I don't want to say you put that to the test, but you, you live your life, you see what works, you see what doesn't, and you figure out who you are. I'll tell you that at age 22, you have no goddamn idea who you are in, in a lot of cases. Some people figure out their deal uh, up front. That's great. But I would say, like I think I saw a, uh, a great tweet by Speed Supersonic, who, no, not Speed Supersonic, his buddy, uh... Jaden, the Sonic Show, which is a channel that I quite enjoy, and his he, he's freaking hysterical. Um, uh, what the hell was Jaden saying that was amazing? I got to look at the comments so I remember. Um. Oh, man, why was I talking about all that? This is like the first train of thought that I've lost on this entire stream. And how long have we been going? I don't have a timer, and I don't care. Although, I started at 3 p.m., and then it's, what, 8.30? So what's that? Five and a half hours? Go, Alex, go, Alex, rah, rah, rah. Oh, I really want to know what I was talking about. <laughs> Everything Review says, no excuse for a gentleman to be under six feet tall in 2022. Hit the gym, slacker. That's incredible. And and I think that that is... Oof. Oh. Oh, okay. I, I want to say the, the, the Sonic Show thing. The Sonic Show posted a great tweet that was like... He showed a picture of himself from like, I don't know, a year ago or, or some time ago. And he was basically looking at the tweet and he was like, oh my God, look how my hair looked like a year ago or whatever. What was I thinking? How could I have thought that that looked good? Um, and, and he might have said something to the effect of like, you know, basically the way I responded was like, because the way that Jaden uh, Sonic Show said it, he almost made it seem like, oh yeah, look at me, crazy me, thinking that that hairstyle looked good two years ago. I'm glad that now I can actually think good and, and present myself and, and look attractive or just stylish or whatever. And, and basically what I responded to that was, listen, if it's any comfort, you will continue having those moments. What was I thinking Like into, until age 30 as a minimum? Because like I was saying, you, you have 20 years approximately of, of education, right? And, and at least until you're 18. Um, education and childhood is is kind of happening in a bubble and then when you start to enter i guess you could say the workforce or just working a full-time job or being financially sustainable and independent um what's it called there's a lot of tr like i look back at my 20s and i'm like I, I i had a lot of successes i had a lot of mistakes and I learned so much from all those successes and mistakes that I feel like it, once I approached my 30s, I was like, all right, uh, after everything that I've done and, and the amazing journey that I've had through the highs and lows of my 20, my 30s is finally like, all right, I, I, I have a pretty good idea of who I am, and I have a pretty good idea of who I'm going to continue to be into my 30s and beyond. Um, 
I, I can't speak highly enough of, of why that, that feeling is so valuable and important and, and why anyone should strive for it. And I'm not even saying you definitely have to feel like that in your 30s. I would just say don't wait around for your life to get better. Um, make it happen. Make it happen. Make mistakes. Have disagreements with people. Learn things. Embarrass yourself. I think that embarrassment is an extremely valuable experience to have. Obviously not that you should seek it out, but to be comfortable with embarrassment and failure, it, it might sound so obvious, but getting used to the idea of, like, failing and, and, and maybe you know you take a swing at bat and you fail whether it's dating or that promotion that you were going for or you just tried to convince your boss something w that something was a really good idea at a meeting and they totally just shot it down and that made you question everything like that all of that stuff is just an opportunity to uh, self-improve and you learn a bit more about yourself and you learn about how you fit into the world and, and, and once you decide who you are, once you decide that you don't actually care what anybody thinks about you, let's take the quote from the movie. Once you decide what, once you realize that, oh, what other people think about you doesn't matter, that's where the fun begins. That's right. That movie, what is that movie? And, and that, that echo, that sentiment has been echoed in plenty of, you know, movies and books and stuff, but... The movie, it, it, it's a like, kind of a coming-of-age comedy uh, about kids in college playing baseball. And, and, and one of the sage advice words is, is that once you stop caring about what everybody thinks, that's where the fun begins. It, it, it's so freeing to accept who you are and not have your sense of self and self-worth depend on anything that anybody says. In a public setting, in, in your family, at the dinner table, any of that. To be confident in who you are and, and then to just conduct your life in your 30s and beyond in a way that's like, I'm going to be exactly who I am. I'm going to be respectful and, and I'm going to always strive to improve myself. But if people disagree with what I think or how I conduct myself, that they can never, ever, ever take away from me who I see myself as and what I what I know makes me happy and, and how I enjoy it. And, and that can be applied to your work situations, that can be applied to the dating world, that can be uh, applied to having conversations about hot takes about video games on Twitter or any other public forum, right? You should not walk into any, if you're walking into a public conversation and your sense of self-worth and security and happiness is contingent upon everybody agreeing with you and affirming your beliefs. Like I was saying with the Kevin Samuels thing, you're going to die alone because the world does not operate like that. And if the world did operate in a way where just like you're beautiful the way you are, accept you, um, don't even worry, you know, be the queen that you are. Uh, because Kevin Samuels pointed that out as a particularly counterproductive message in the church. Uh, the church, in, in, in certain settings, is say, like, you're a queen, be a, God loves you exactly the way you are, keep being you, right? That is just, that's a recipe for complacency, and you're just going to deteriorate, and, and that, it, again, the only person who will ever buy into that is you. It's you and the church that is essentially profiting, if you think about it. The church is profiting off of selling you that narrative because that's very attractive to people. They love to come to church. And again, this is just me literally relaying the, the, the descriptions of what's going on in some churches because these churches are like starting to go out of business. Um, and the only way that they can stay financially solvent is to say like, hmm, okay, actually we're not going to hold our congregants to standards of dressing nicely. Uh, w we're not going to say that they have to improve the way that they treat others with respect, right? We're saying you're perfect the way you are. God loves you. You're a perfect angel, right? In a way, the church has to do that out of a business necessity because if they don't, if they actually were to say, no, actually you can't come to church in your pajamas, 
if they turn people down at the door for that, um, there would be no more church. There would be no more church. It will go out of business. So they've had to accept that, and it's just a, a very vicious cycle of complacency and no self-improvement, a and it's really self-affirmation without actually earning it. We were talking before about the dangers of the trophy generation. Everybody gets a trophy even just par participating. I even see people like Lee Majub, the actor who plays Agent Stone in the Sonic 2 movies. Lee Majub, you know, God bless him. He seems like a really nice guy and his heart is in the wrong place. But left and right, he is handing out praise and affirmation to people that he's never met and that he has no idea, you know, what their deal in life is and whether the problems that ail them are actually just uh, the result of their denial and refusal to self-improve. Lee Majub will go on Twitter and basically say, like, hey, you, yeah, you, you're beautiful. You're strong. Don't let anyone else tell you otherwise. Like, a as a baseline requirement, wouldn't you want to know what that person's story is and how they treat others and, and the effort amount that they've put into succeeding in life? It's very harmful to just hand out that praise to anyone. It's just totally unearned. It's totally unearned, and it will, again, contribute to that false sense of value that you do what you want. If you want to believe it in the comfort of your own home, that's fine, but uh, don't expect everybody on OkCupid to, to have to buy into that or Match.com or OurTime.com, the dating site for baby boomers, I think. Um. Delay says, like I said, you agree with the point, but you're afraid it could be easily hijacked for anti-trans, anti-LGBT, insert here, rhetoric. So here's what I'll say, Delay. Uh, that's a, a very interesting component. I I'll say that I, 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 with all the heavy stuff about hydrosity, I think it, for today on this live stream, it would not be the best to go there. Um, but I'll say this. I would be very interested, and I think it's a worthy to discussion to be had, if if you think that that mentality is being used against any demographic in a way that's unfair and like just unequal. Um, I would be absolutely interested in talking through, you know, any possible way that a, a healthy balance can be struck between um, self improvement and an honest assessment of who you are and how others perceive you you know versus just that be exactly who you are right uh, you, you're a queen you're perfect everyone's beautiful and, and it's just a matter of just keeping put the time in to try to find the right person right that I, it's just a matter of helping that person have the greatest chances of success so I'll say delay I appreciate you bringing that up and I, and I think it's worth exploring some more with an open mind. And, and, and I'm willing to talk about those things in real time. And, and, and I think that's valuable for everybody. So I appreciate you saying that, Delay. Uh, I'm glad, Delay. I'm glad that Delay is listening to what I'm saying and not just taking everything at word and saying like, hey, actually, Alex, I think part of what you're saying makes sense, but it can be used to go in a bad direction like that is the exact kind of mentality that I think is healthy to bring to the table. And that is the opposite of the sort of bullying tactics that I condemned earlier on this stream, right? The, 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 the mentality where you come into a conversation with your mind made up about how the world works. And instead of actually having a, an exchange with someone, you just run away. You say, nope, this is what I think. And if you don't, I'm going to, I don't know, block you on Twitter or just, you know, not communicate with you anymore. Like I said, t to, to use that, like, approach to conversations about this kind of stuff is essentially, uh, you know, what's that flag that they wave in uh, where they're like, basically, I surrender. I surrender. I, I acknowledge that I can't actually engage in this topic. And so my only course of recourse is to just stop the conversation. Alex G asks, will this live stream stay on the channel or is it one and done? Um, uh, what I can definitely say is there will be a VOD available forever. 
I don't know where it will always live, but it will always be available in some form. I may make it like an unlisted video and, and like just somehow make it available. Um, this is as good of an opportunity as ever uh, uh, to kind of building off of that is that um, in the near, near future, all right, in the near future, I am going to be posting a video on the channel Alex Yard Adventure. Now, Alex Yard Adventure is, is a channel that I announced almost a year ago, long time ago. Um, and it has a couple of small little appetizers on it now. But the main intent for that channel and, and what you're going to finally see the fruits of, um, I am going to be posting a video to that channel in the near future. And, and, and basically, if I were to describe the category of, like, what type of video is it as distinct from, right, I got this Alex Yard and Knuckles and music theory videos, right? Um, what what are you going to get uh, the main stage full video productions on Alex Yard Adventure? And, and I always choose my words carefully. And, and maybe it, you might think this is, you know, fretting over words too much. But I, I just want everyone to come to the table with the right expectations. Basically, what those videos are, are they are long-form videos about the games themselves. Okay, they're not about the music theory. They are long-form videos about the, the games themselves. And, and when I say the games themselves, I mean it in terms of, like, talking about it loosely, I could compare it to, like, the kind of things that we've been talking about lately at the Sonic Debate Society. Um, it, it's not exactly a matter of like, oh, I'm trying to persuade you that this game is better than that game per se, but it's more like, um, I'm going to tell you some things that I think about when I, when I, when I think about my favorite Sonic games and why I love them so much and why I think that some games achieve those high highs better than others. I'm going to be taking, you know, a, a fairly in-depth look. At, at, at what I think about. Now, I've told patrons a little bit more about what to expect. Um, so just putting that out there, even if you're a patron at the $1 level, you can definitely get some more intel about future projects. But, you know, not trying to milk it as a money thing. I'm just saying that I'm very protective about talking about future plans. And it's just because I want everyone to come to the table with the right expectations. Hey, a special stage ring. If only I could get to that other plane of existence. <laughs> so yeah, the reason why I mention all that is because once I put that first long form video, um, I, I wanted that long form video that's uh, I, I'm kind of in the finishing phases of, of putting it out. And, and if all goes well, I, I'd like to think that it's coming out by like the start of next week, like maybe by Monday of next week. And once I do that, I may or may not make a third channel that is just basically a catch-all. Anything that doesn't really fit in the music theory channel or the long-form like video game discussion channel. All the other random odds and ends will go on a, on a third separate channel. And, and that just is going to be, you know, a, a bunch of ton of different things. Not really, right? You come to Alex Yard and Knuckles, every time a new video comes out, you are you're, you're going to get a similar type of experience in store. Not even to say that there's a continuity between videos per se, but just that there's a, a format and a flow that, that you can always kind of, I don't want to say expect, but it, it, it's just, it's the established theme of the channel. That potential third channel is just going to be everything else. So it's going to be totally just all over the place, and, and it'll be everything that does. So maybe some bods will go on that channel, but... That was a very long-winded way of answering your question. Yeah, I, I can say at a bare minimum, this stream will always be available to replay and watch in some form. I'm looking at Owen's comment from a little bit while ago saying you stopped caring what people think when you left school two years ago, the quality of life has gone way up. I see those stock charts. I see the, the line graph trending upward. Yeah, and, and that's, that's been some things that my, my recent stuff ha has come up against is that that mentality is so freeing and valuable and important. Um, 
when you have a content creator come up to you and request like, hey, Alex, please stop responding to things that I say, right? Um, the fact that a person w would be so like worrying that something that they said on a, on a public setting discussion about Sonic or whatever else, the fact that they would say, I don't want you to respond to my public statements anymore, I, I would just want to sit down with that person and say, look, the fact that you are hinging so much of your happiness or contentment on my opinion, that just goes to show that y you don't have a lot of confidence in, in your own opinion. Like, you should decide what you think about a Sonic game or a movie, and, and, and if you say your opinion, if you actually truly believe what you say, then you should be able to take any kind of polite disagreement, right? And, and everything that I've said on this stream today... I know that a lot of you might not see the, the, the things the way that I do. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm not breaking the terms of service and I'm not doing anything disrespectful. If you're having a bad time as the result of other people reacting to the things that you say, then you might not be cut out for like having a public discussion, right? Because the whole idea is that you say things and the conversation continues. People respond to things, especially when you start to talk about them. If you can't deal with the idea that someone might see things differently, um, that means that, like you were saying, you are putting way too much stock and investment in the simple fact about what other people... Th I, I just recommend... It's such a freeing, incredible thing that when you actually don't care... When you don't care what people think, then <sighs> you kind of flip the script to the extent that now if someone disagrees with you in public it's actually kind of flattering. Like, if someone were to take the time to actually disagree with me and, like, outline their thought process in a tweet or a YouTube video, if someone ever did that in reaction to something that I would say, first of all, I would take that as a huge compliment. Do you want to know why? I would take that as a huge compliment as a starting point because just the fact that you think that something I said matters so much that you felt the need to respond to it that means that you think highly of my opinion. You think so highly, in, in one aspect, you think so highly of my voice that you think that you have a big audience of people that listen and, and your perspective is so valuable that I feel the need to chime in and respectfully say why I disagree. So if anyone writes a tweet or, or sends me a Discord comment, even if it's not respectful, right, even taking the, the things where people really dis disrespectfully kind of you know, see things different ways and dig their heels in and, and then start to dance with intimidation. Te but just the fact that you felt the need to chime in is a huge compliment because that's saying that you think my voice matters. So if I ever respond to something, um, th th that is a as a starting point on the premise that I think that your perspective is valuable and I think that talking through what you think I is a worthwhile endeavor. Now you compare that to if I just get a, a nasty comment by someone who is not even a content creator, they're just an, a, a random civilian, um, do you think that I feel the need to respond and, and talk through my reaction to all of that? Of course not. Because if I did respond to every nasty, hateful comment that, that came my way, I would never sleep. I would never focus on work, right? You cannot let your sense of self-worth hinge on what other people think. It, that that's a recipe for your own unhappiness because you basically expect the entire rest of the world to walk on eggshells. God forbid anyone should ever politely disagree with you, um, right? That you, you have to walk into the arena. If you're making a judgment about a Sonic game or a movie, you have to walk into the arena with full confidence of, of what you say. And, and the fact that if people disagree, and, and guess what? People will disagree with you. And that's healthy, and that's good. Um, yeah, taking the compliment that they actually took the time to respond to you means they think your perspective is valuable. And also, just like, yeah, I can tell you that when T. Lopes uses bullying tactics, um, I instead of hinging like, ah, uh, uh, maybe I would get along better with the Sonic community if I finally started pronouncing it Hydro City Zone, right? Even just the sound of that just exposes how ridiculous it is. The fact that T. Lopes feels the need to keep digging his heels in on pronunciation reasons that don't make sense, 
far from having that affect my sense of self-worth, in fact, I can turn around and have that exchange add to my self-worth because I know for sure, right? People may not agree with my perspective on uh, how to pronounce a certain word, but I'm so confident in my own sense of self and how I critically think and how I problem solve and how I reach a verdict about a question that's not straightforward that actually I don't need anyone else's agreement. <laughs> I don't need anyone else to agree with me. I, I know the reasons that I have, and I know that I'm not just crazy in a vacuum because there are 50% of the rest of the planet similarly uh, happen to arrive at the same verdict that I did. That's how I, I can never let the T. Lopes bullies of the world that, that will never chip away at my sense of self-worth. That will only make it twice as stronger. I can look at the foolish reasons that T. Lope cites for his pronunciation and, and just feel embarrassed for him. <laughs> uh, and, and I would just recommend that anybody else, um, you know, Yeah, so this is the thing. Uh, Ferba MXX MMXX is saying, you know, tongue in cheek, dude, you are too smart and you're making me look bad. Stop. So I'm going to say this again. Um, here's what I'm going to say. If you think that anything that I've said today is valuable or insightful, if you even had the thought in your head, like, uh, I'm going to watch this stream again because this is some really good advice. If you trust me to give you very good advice, I'm going to give you two just mini suggestions for things that you can look into that will be, if you think that what I've said is helpful, I, I can do you much, much better than that. Um, I'm going to direct you to two things. One is just like a two-page thing. It's that short story that I mentioned by Harris, uh, sorry, by Kurt Vonnegut, you know, may he rest in peace. <laughs> He's a very good author. And, and I studied him in college, and, and, and he was an influence on the way that I think and the way that I satirize and the way that I don't accept bullshit. And one of the wonderful stories by Kurt Vonnegut, he passed away while I was in college. And, and I'm so thankful that the professor brought that story to my attention because now I'm able to share that with all of you and have that not just fuel to toxic bickering, but a way of like being more confident in yourself and who you are and not letting the rest of the world drag you down because they can't stand the idea that you're correct or better at something. So um, my first suggestion is that I think you could find it online right now in, in a PDF, maybe. I don't know if that'd be considered piracy or not, but... Go to your library, obtain the story. It's, it's two and a half pages, I believe, and it's by Kurt Vonnegut, and the name of the story is Harrison Bergeron. And, and it is exactly to what that commenter just mentioned. Say, hey, stop being so smart and correct. Y you're hurting my feelings, right? That is a recipe for societal collapse because if we can't actually have honest conversations and, and give people good advice about the goals that they're trying to achieve are next to impossible because the methods they're using to try and achieve those goals are in fact not actually productive for ways that are easily, easily demonstrable. Um, I'm doing you a huge favor. Other people that are actually brave enough to have that conversation are doing you a massive service. That should be celebrated just as amazingly as I can juggle these crazy boss. This is one of the better bosses in this entire game, I gotta say. And for the simple reason that... Um, <laughs> there's so many different ways that the different micro bosses can come out and, and, and then you have to juggle all the, and it's up to you to choose how fast they come out. This is an S tier boss, just like the press garden act two boss. So my first, if, if you got anything useful out of today, my, my first suggestion, Harrison Bergeron, that short story by Kurt Vonnegut, the second very, very valuable and life changing, um, recommendation that was forwarded to me by an author that that I admire Oof. and 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 that it's my honor and, and privilege to be celebrated to forward this very life-changing and valuable advice to you it's the book that that I put on screen earlier in the stream the name of the book is reclaiming conversation with the subtitle uh, uh, what is it how to I forget what the subtitle is, but it's basically, you know, 
Reclaiming Conversation. The, it, okay, I think it's the power of talk in a digital world, right? Because just like the caution seaman said, uh, people are sitting in their houses. You know, the pandemic made this issue even more exacerbated. Um, people are just just lying back in their own confirmation bias bubbles, and you will learn so much helpful info if you spend time respectfully talking with people that you disagree with. And, and that's why I, I got to give a huge shout out and thank you to Steve Reen again, because Steve Reen is one of the persons who's willing to have those very fantastic. I walk away from a conversation with Steve Reen, and even though I don't maybe agree on every exact point, um, it's so incredibly valuable and affirming to just hear different people's perspective. And, and now I'll, I'll be able to take into that perspective were I to continue talking about those concepts, that's that's a real, that's a something very real that you can do to like, like if you you want to go on social media and tout inclusivity and acceptance, you can do that. But the only real way you can actually do that is to embrace that business model uh, of the total polar opposites of the liberal Luf Ruth Bader Ginsburg with the hardcore conservative. Uh, Anton and Scalia, the fact that they could have totally polar opposite opinions on how to govern a country or what justice means, but the fact that they could move past that and, and go see an opera together and, and break bread, right? To break bread with someone, that's what I have done at every turn over the past two days as I've run up against some of this stuff. At every turn, I've said, listen, we can always break bread. My door is always open. If you're going to just run and hide and, and just abandon the conversation, um, that's on that that you will live with the consequences of allowing someone's opinion to uh, make you feel a bad way, and then to 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 just totally just like I, I won't say that it hurts me, but I'll just say that it takes a great deal of bravery to offer those olive branches and to say I'm. I'm not mad at you. I'm coming to the table in good faith. I'm not going to hide my criticisms of, of of something if they're valid. But to, to, to open that open door, like I said, um, I don't lose sleep over any of those things as like I, I take permanent offense. And now I'm going to always hold a grudge because, as I mentioned, I, I can think of uh, there's a few friends, but uh, there's one particular friend uh, that I absolutely like really didn't get along with. I don't even know if I would say that he was bullying me, but he was giving me a very hard time in, in a way that boys sometimes do. And after a few years of that, I, I couldn't even tell you what turned the tide, but he became one of my best and most favorite, and, and I, I miss him a lot. He's still alive. I don't mean I'm making it. I miss him a lot because I used to see him every day, and now I don't. I used to see him every day at school, and, and I think that that person added so much joy and laughter to my life and the fact that that started out with someone who i absolutely despised right Th that just shows you that even if you have huge differences with someone there's never a reason to kind of give up and abandon that you know uh, because we're all human beings we're all doing our best and, and so long as we're not breaking the law or breaking twitter or youtube's terms of service we all have something valuable to teach each other Um, I can't who says the fact that I'm getting a little choked up leads you to believe I'm getting thinking very highly of it. like I, I forget who you were talking about. I can recall a couple of moments of people that I'd spoken and, and started to kind of pause and, and get a little bit choked up. I'll actually I'll, I'll absolutely acknowledge that. <sighs> and. What was I trying to say? Yeah, one of the very valuable things that I took away from that book that's called Reclaiming Conversation is that right now, I, I've been streaming for five, six hours, right? Everything that you've heard me say today is real. This is a real reaction. You are watching, or, or I should say listening in real time to the totally authentic, unfiltered, right? What I'm doing today is not just 
sitting around and writing a carefully prepared statement uh, 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 of trying to one-up somebody and then have my sense of self-worth hinge on how people receive that statement summarizing what I think, right? Instead, I'm talking through all sides of this equation and, and what my reaction is to it. A and that's one of the valuable things that, that I took away from that book is that you you will learn so much more about what it means to be a human and how to treat others with respect by going there, by dealing and, and not being uh, afraid to actually have these conversations. Um, to sit, to, to watch this stream and, and see me get emotional about this, I, I hope that that aspect, you, you have the takeaway that like, that I'm a real human being coming from a very real place of compassion. Um, and th the fact that you're you're being able to see how I genuinely feel about this in real time, I, I, I hope that that's just a, a valuable glimpse in into the thought process of, of someone who thinks differently from you. Um, and, and it goes back to that wonderful quote that that's from Ender's Game. <sighs> And that quote appears on screen at the beginning of the Ender's Game movie. So if you ever see that movie, you're going to see this quote flash on screen at the beginning of the movie. And that quote says, I, I don't know the exact words. Let me actually look up the exact words. Because I don't want to butcher it and... It's just a beautiful sentiment. Ender's Game. Let's go. Help me out, Google. Ender's Game. Okay. Now, this... What I'm about to say I is not directly applicable to, to the things that have been going on in the past couple days. But I, I want you to... Uh, keep this in mind as a very valuable insight that, that I'm going to share with you that that you can use in, in any conflict in your life, whether it's with people or, or like a work situation or school or your, self, your sense of self-worth. Ready? Now, this quote that I'm about to read, it does use the word enemy. I'm going to slightly tweak that for the purposes of what we're talking about here. This is not like I'm talking about enemies because I don't consider anyone that I've talked to in the past year an enemy. A and I look forward to breaking bread and, and having a, a, a good, we could even good naturedly rib each other and poke fun, as long as it's coming from a place of respect. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna say. I, I, well, I'm not gonna say it, I'm gonna relay you this quote. So not an enemy, but uh, you're, I'm going to say opponent, or, or the, I'm going to change it to, a, if you're having a disagreement with someone, your opponent in that respectful conversation, here is right? In the moment when I truly understand my opponent, when I understand my opponent well enough to defeat my opponent, I need a damn sip of coffee. In the moment when I truly understand my opponent, when I understand him well enough to defeat him, then in that very moment, I also love him. I'll say that again. In the moment when I truly understand my opponent, when I understand him well enough to defeat him, then in that very moment, I also love him. You know, and, and I'm using the word him because that's the quote. It's from a novel, but you, you, th th that can be universally applied where it's like w when I find someone that I disagree with or who challenges me for the way that I live my life and who I am and how I express myself, um, I, I can tell you that I do not... I, I, 
I, I feel like one approach that is very, very increasingly common these days is to just instantly cast off your opponent. Like, oh, they got it wrong. They got it wrong, and they're evil, and they're irredeemable, and I'm not going to do business with them. I'm not even going to talk to them. I'm just going to take that one thing that they said and say, I'm out of here, right? I'm out. I, 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 right? So, uh, there's th that's an option. I can tell you, I, I can give you personal advice against going that route, right? But uh, here's the other option. The other option is that y you disagree with that person, and, and instead you say, like, listen, this is a real human being who pronounces a word the way they do. This is a real human being that has an opinion about a video game. Or, or e even more serious, lofty topics, right? About identity and sexuality and race, right? Instead of just writing off the person entirely, y y if you write the person off entirely and just run and give up on them, it it's like an instant guaranteed loss because, as I was saying, the other approach, which I have tried and, and applied to all domains that, that have come up in this aspect, You have to stop and think like this is a real human being who for them this human being is acting in good faith, right? This human being is thinking through all the components of, of this topic and, and what they're saying is what they truly believe and that is the purest expression of themselves. Instead of just instantly saying like, oh, you're, you're I can't even talk to you anymore. I won't even right. I can't talk to you. Goodbye. You got to look at that and say, no, let me try to understand where the other person is coming from. Because unless they're a criminal or unless they're breaking the YouTube terms of service, we're all in this together and we can find common ground and we can figure out where we disagree, but do it respectfully and in a way that even if we disagree, we can walk away from the conversation with an ability to make a more informed opinion. Because now y you have very intimately gazed into the the, the, the the thought process of a person who is very, very different from you. All right? And, and when you just go around on Twitter or, 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 or discussions uh, about any of this other stuff and you're only looking for people to affirm what you believe, um, that's, that, that's how societies crumble. If, if we can't... If we have to walk on eggshells at all times then, you know, you might be driving drunk, metaphorically driving drunk in a way that might risk your life and bring you severe unhappiness. I'm going to stand up and tell you why I think y you're going down a destructive path. I'm doing that as a friend. It's totally up to you whether you take that thought process or not, and I'm not going to lose sleep over it if you don't. But do you see how that's a much better productive and olive branch, open-minded way instead of just saying... Coming into the arena, making demands up front, and, and then just saying, oh, if you don't agree to all my demands right now, then goodbye. I'm never going to talk to you again, right, right, whatever else. Again, I I'm not giving you those two options a as a way of forming a judgment. I I'm, I'm just gi I'm bringing those two possible problem-solving solutions to your attention so that the next time you land in a situation like this, you can choose for yourself which route is more productive. Ryan is glad he tuned in. Delay didn't expect to, to hear this subject matter come up. All right, my favorite, well, I don't know about my favorite, but the, one of the best comments of the day is, just got here. Who's he crying about? I'm actually crying with gratitude for the, you know, the, the many positive experiences that I've had with people that I disagree with. And, and it's such a beautiful thing that's becoming more and more rare. And, and all I can do is just share uh, my suggestions w with the people who listen to me speak. Um, I, I, I cry with happiness when I was crying, uh, you know, trying to read that quote because to, to, to truly know y y your disagreement opponent and to understand them as a human being, it, it's like it, it's, it's the kind of thing where 
there's this wonderful novel where it's it's a science fiction novel and it's kind of about uh, this war that's being fought in the future all right but in the future great novel in the future they come up with this you know sci-fi is sci-fi they come up with this amazing technology where you know how we have like drones you know how we have drone warfare that you can like send out of aircraft or a robot and, and it, the, there's not actually a person inside the robot. It's just there's a person controlling the robot from a distance. And, and that person is, okay? So in this novel, they come up with a technology that's basically that. But you basically, by using that technology, you inhabit these robots that you can fight the war with. But the thing is, you, you always use these robots in a set of, I think, like 20. Like, it's always 20 people that will jump, like, kind of enter these robot drone machines at the same time. And what I thought was such a beautiful and profound thing is that when you, when you go into that machine, you basically share the consciousness with all the other 19 people. And, and so... When you get into that machine, and it's so fascinating the, the way that it works in the book, it's like when you go into the machine, you pop in, and in that moment, you basically share the experience of you know all 20 people, and it's like as soon as you know what it's like to be in the, in the mind of a black person, or you know what it's like to be inside the mind of a woman if you're a man, or vice versa, right? The point, a, a different race, in other words, the instant, that you know what it's like to actually be that person, you very instantly and, and without question, you, you totally empathize with the person, you love them, you're in their corner, right? We have the, all this, you know, race fighting that, that's going on nowadays. I truly believe that if anyone on, well, not everyone, but everyone who's coming to the table with respect and good faith, um, if you actually knew what it was like to be that person, I, I, I think that I, I think the biggest disconnect and the reason for strife is because people have the wrong idea uh, about what it's actually like to be that person that they disagree with. And so everything that I'm advocating today is just a way of like, don't try to bully anyone and also don't take what they say personally and have that affect your sense of self-worth. Just try to understand where they're coming from and then respectfully tell them the reasons why you have the viewpoint you do. And, and, and then you just break bread. You go see the opera. You play Shredder's Revenge, you know, on uh, online multiplayer. You have a great time. That, that That's how things move forward. That's everybody sitting at the table and, and judging their peers by the content of their character. And Anker act accurately points out, this is one of the only places where you can get life lessons while Sonic gameplay plays in the background. And one of the valuable life lessons I would impart to all of you is that if you're ever going to do like a Sonic Mania type of game, don't just recycle a boss. I guess this boss kind of has two phases, right? But this whole part of it is just exactly the same as the first game. And yeah, you get the gravity twist on the second phase, but that... Uh, all this stuff about, you know, accepting and loving your, 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 your disagreement opponents is important. But also, like, make sure that you can give every boss in some kind of revival scrapbook anniversary game at least some semblance of its own uh, identity. Because this is just some recycle. Isn't this boss awesome? It's actually not that bad. <laughs> to know this boss is to love it. To understand <laughs> the boss is, is to appreciate it. 
I got no insta shield. I wonder if the insta shield will work on that boss when it's on the ceiling. Yeah, so Metaphysical is saying it's basically Pacific Rim, but even more so. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating concept. And of course, that's science fiction, but I do honestly believe that that gets at a very real truth is that, yeah. To, to just live in the mind of someone, obviously that's like basically physically impossible, but th the concept is that if you if you truly understood, yeah, I'm just repeating myself. So of course we don't have that shared consciousness machine, but um, we can do something that's actually not all that different from that machine. We can actually get to like 90% of what that machine might have accomplished. Definitely, it, it's impossible to fully understand what it's like to be another person. But in all the reasons and all the domains that it actually matters, we can get God. Whoa, I almost said a bad word. I, I just meant to say that it was. We can get very, very close. We, we can aspire. We can move the needle in the right direction with a lot more um, effectiveness than you might initially think. Anakor would like to imagine how it's like to be like Alex, doing cool streams and music theories. So, of course, I really appreciate that. And I will tell you that I don't have any imposter syndrome. I think that the fact that I'm living this life and, and being able to have these chats um, is the direct product of my hard work and, and certainly my talent. But I view my success and, and being able to do all this wonderful stuff as not, I didn't win the lottery, you know what I mean? Like, I, I did not win the lottery. Um, I put in my time and I put in my effort. A and I would just say that anyone, anyone has the ability to achieve what I did. Now, of course, I, I have my music theory background. I, I had very fortunate circumstances that, that I was able to, to get, a, 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 even just, like I said, that one music theory class in college. Um, and, it, you know. The point is that a, a lot of the results in your life are a direct result of whether you apply yourself. And I'll be honest, I did not always apply myself. I can think of certain areas of what? Middle school and even maybe the beginning of high school where, yeah, I don't know if it was a motivation thing or, or just, just being a young preteen that was very bad at time management and just wanted to play video games and watch TV and procrastination, pro right? But if you just apply yourself, I if you make a plan to, to make solid progress on your goals on a daily basis, it, what I'm doing is not some, you know, big luxurious lottery that I've won. This is plainly achievable by anyone. A and by the way, I'll echo what I said before, is that I, I was fully ready and willing to continue working a nine to five job, 40 hours a week in the field of medical coding and billing. And I had every, I was fully prepared to do that for the next, what, 30 years, 40 years in the workforce, whatever. I was fully willing to accept that. And, and I wasn't even bummed about it. And, and I say to myself, if, if this music theory stuff succeeds, then I, I'll get to do that. But that, that's like, I don't want to say that it's a, it's a, it's an optional bonus. Like maybe I'll get to, right. But Nothing was hinging on, like, my success. I did it in my free time because I loved doing it, and I knew that it was adding value to people in the way that they vibe with this sonic music and, and the way that they're learning all the fascinating stuff about how music theory works. I know that it's, it's hard enough just being a human being, right? If any, like, indications about the, the frequency of depression and anxiety are, are any indications... And you get a game over, you, you got to choose how you react, right? It's hard enough to be a human being. So, uh, uh, what is this, encore mode? All right, I'm not done talking. Let's play Sonic 3. I don't feel like playing Titanic Monarch again. Let's play Sonic 3. It's a good game. I'm going to show you this in case you want to hang out with us later in the week. We've got Sonic Adventure 2 coming this Thursday. And tomorrow, less than 24 hours from now, we've got Sonic Robo Blast 2. Are you kidding me? What a time to be alive, people. 
John Javitis has always wanted to get into music theory, but always found yourself confused with certain topics like chords, scales. Yeah, so uh, it's interesting that you say that, and I would point you to earlier in the stream. I actually did say a little bit about that. I think it was when I was playing Banjo Kazooie, but yeah, the VOD VOD will be available of the stream. I would say, like, yeah, if you are hitting a plateau with music theory stuff, yeah, I, I, I did comment on that a little bit earlier, so that might be helpful for you. And, and and just so everyone knows, the version of the game that I'm about to play is a game that I like to call, because it is the official name of the game, Sonic the Hedgehog 3, Angel Island Revisited. Or as it's known for short, Sonic 3 Air. This is basically the, the version that, that, that I'll be playing out from, from here on out. I, I kind of already outlined in, in numerous other settings why Origins... Not only will it not be my default, but I just simply will not play it. A and there's a few reasons why I'm never going to play Origins again. And I'll tell you one of them. You, you can't even hold this reason against me. You ready for this? Like, you could disagree with my reasons for not liking Origins. Th Origins. That's totally fine in itself. But what you can't disagree with, and that I'm 100% correct on, is that I literally cannot actually play the game because I guess it's the Denuvo. It, every time that I've tried to play the game after that day one stream, it is just unplayably slow. It, it, like, it moves at half speed, and then it'll work for a few seconds, and then it slows down again. It is, for all intents and purposes, unplayable. And because Sega got my $45, and, and that's what I got, um, that, that, that's all I need to see. That's all I need to see. Transform. I like how the Luma in Super Mario Odyssey, when you feed them enough Lumas and they're like, ah, I, I want Luma. Feed me more. St oh, no, it is a Luma, but it says, feed me more star bits. I am so hungry. I love that when you say so with a bunch of O's. And then when you feed it all the Lumas and, and it's ready to transform, it goes, transform and the sound it makes oh it's enough to cheer you up on a rainy well actually i like rainy days so i won't even say rainy days are bad and they need cheering up but um sonic the hedgehog 3 angel island revisited but yeah Oh, I can't too. Uh, I'm seeing I can't too. Fan and I just th this is again, like I said earlier. Um, I I'm gonna flash this on screen one more time because it bears repeating now. Ah, 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 ah. It bears repeating. Okay, th there's the. Uh, it might be like fifteen dollars the audio book, a life changing book. It it, it it makes a very, very persuasive and valuable case or for why it's valuable to talk through this. I can't too has said something that I I've never actually thought of it in these exact words, but it's so it's it is a very good crystallization of what I believe, which is that even if your opponent is not acting in good faith, yeah, that's the thing. Sometimes you come to the table, you're offering olive branches, you're giving all benefit of the doubt you are taking a little bit of hostility in stride and continuing to keep your calm and keep an open mind and try to understand your opponent instead of just, you know, ratcheting up the war tactics. So, Ikentu says, even if your opponent is not acting in good faith, you should still put your best foot forward, a la be the change you want to see, or treat others the way you'd want to be treated. And, and there you have it. And there you have it. That That's it. Uh, I, and it can be frustrating sometimes to have to, like, you know, I, I know this is gendered language, but the, the phrase is, oh, be the bigger man, right? Uh, so, it, But I, I think that's not maybe the best way to say it, but that sentiment, that phrase that I've heard many, many people say throughout my childhood and growing up, right, the, the point behind that is that, yeah, you, you have to... It, I, I've heard 
you know, politicians say this, m maybe in some times where it's counterproductive. It says, like, when they go low, we go high. Politics is its own animal, but if you're talking about respectful conversations and good faith, yes. Even when they go low, you go high. And you can actually take a great deal of pride in that. You know what I mean? Um... Yeah, so, wow, Inquirer asks a, a phenomenal question. Hey, Alex, did you get mad when you got your first job because you realized that the entire of your midlife would be only your job? So that that's a great question, um, and the answer is this. The reason why I didn't have any crisis like that... Whoops. The reason why... Actually, i got to change my controller setting. One sec. Um, the reason why I didn't have any kind of crisis like, oh my God, I'm going to be working in an office for the next 40 years is because when I went to college, I chose to major in English education with the plan to be an English teacher. And I actually was very passionate about that. That wasn't just something that, that I was doing just obviously for the bucks or for the time off in the summer, right? I was very excited and looking forward to that. And I can say that the five years that I did work in education, I did have, I, I could I, I could single out a, 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 a very long list of great experiences that I had where I felt I was actually making, e even if it's just a small difference in a person's life and helping them, you know, move toward a better life route that's going to get them, help them achieve the goal, like, help them achieve the goals that they seek. That in itself was so amazing. And so I think that that's why I didn't have, like, some kind of crisis where I'm like, Oh, uh, this is going to be the rest of my life, just working for the man? Because I actually did believe in the, um, and, and I still do, and I have such a profound ad admiration for teachers, especially, and even doubly so, since the pandemic started. Since the pandemic started, and since the trophy generation mindset has got worse and worse, where, like, now, teachers try to hold their students accountable, and in the old days, the teachers back them up in the interest of helping their student become a better, smarter, more responsible citizen. But now, the, 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 there's a much higher frequency where parents will storm in and say, no, my son is blameless. How could you do this? Cut it out. Don't punish him for missing homework. I don't know. Um, what the hell was my point? Language. Um, what was my point? You tell me, sugar. Um, but then when, when I found out that teaching wasn't going to be a good fit for me in the long term, and I could talk all about that. That's a whole interesting topic I'd be happy to talk about uh, another time. But once I switched to that other industry, I entered that industry with the understanding that I'm like, okay, it. Medical coding and billing is definitely not my passion, like, inherently. But the sorts of work that I'm doing on a daily basis is actually a really cool kind of, like, problem-solving thing. Like, a lot of the work that I did, it's a little bit complex to explain, but the work that I did in medical coding and billing is, like, w not that it was all this, but it's, like, y y everything that comes across your desk is because there's a problem with it. There's something that the system has caught, that the system considers to be an error, okay? And it's basically like you have to do a little bit of detective work. It, it's it, and, and that is a very fun and rewarding challenge in itself. And that's why, like, sometimes it boggles the mind, but also sometimes it to makes totally sense. Like, imagine if your, your, your washing machine broke, and now your washing machine doesn't work today, and, and now that's on your to-do list. You have to fix your washing machine. So you have to do a little bit of troubleshooting, and this is assuming that you don't just hire a mechanic. If you're trying to do that yourself, you can look at that as a hassle, but you can all, I remember I, uh, someone in my life made the remark where they're like, yeah, I've been trying to fix my um, dryer, washing machine, whatever, a and that person basically said like, I, I kind of like it in a way. It's like a challenge that I got to figure out, testing different hypotheses and, and narrowing down, what is the culprit? Why is this machine not functioning? That can be a very rewarding thing in itself. And I will say that, you know, medical coding and billing, the subject matter was not my jam by any stretch, but um, 
the process of problem solving and then have to see like, all right, th this file, this claim, there's something the matter with it. I have to go by process of elimination and, and try to actually think creatively outside the box to figure out like, oh, it's because they put this diagnosis and because this patient has Harvard Pilgrim insurance and they have certain rules. That was a very rewarding challenge in itself. But if, of course, if I'm being honest, I'll obviously doing that type of work is not my dream subject matter. So I approached that job with this mindset. And, and I'll say it to you, I'm not necessarily even advising that you do this when you choose your major in college or you choose how your life is going to look for the next 30, 40 years. I'm not like insisting that you do this at all because everyone is different. All I'm doing and saying this right now, what I'm about to say is just, just so that you know it's an option. And if that option speaks to you in any form, great, but this is just some food for thought. This mindset moves, th this mindset works for, it, it can work. A and I am living proof that it can work. My mindset was basically to say that I, I don't necessarily love my job and it's not my biggest passion, but it's a job that requires me to use my mind in a way that I'm not just doing something boring and repetitive. I'm actually just, you know, I I'm making my contribution to society. And I don't mean that in a lofty way. I just mean that, as Cybershell said in his famous Cyber Shill video, right? What was his words in that video? He's like, oh, it turns out it costs money just to live. <laughs> So to get that money to live, you have to make a productive contribution to society. And I found an industry that had day-to-day -day work that I found engaging, even if the ultimate mission statement wasn't the thing that I cared the most about. So I was like, I could see myself doing this for the next 40 years, if necessary, and, 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 and not have it be this dreary, awful thing that I'm having to trudge through. I could tell you that I definitely didn't spend my time popping into the break room and saying, oh, Tuesdays suck. Don't you wish it was Friday? The reason why I never succumbed to that mindset is perfect. First of all, it's totally counterproductive, and you are the only person who suffers when you spend mental energy dwelling on the fact that it's not Friday yet. But the reason why it didn't bum me out that it was a Tuesday is this. I would work a 9 to 5 job, right, Monday to Friday, work a full 8-hour day, I would run into these hydrosity badniks and get impaled. But you know why I wasn't bummed out on a Tuesday while everyone was yearning for the weekend and then coming back on Monday saying like, oh, the weekend always ends so quickly, right? That that default negativity. First of all, I, I would prefer that people did not try to share that negativity with me. But even just in their own interest, right, you, you construct your own reality in the sense that you are in full control of what you choose to spend your time thinking about. When you're at home, when you're playing a video game and reflecting on how your day went, you can choose to dwell on that thing that your boss said that was really unfair and you wish that you had said something different and if you had only said the right thing, you feel like you maybe could have walked away from that conversation feeling respected or feel like you didn't kind of get one-upped unfairly, right? Instead of just dwelling on that stuff, you can choose like, all right, is there actually anything else I need to think about right now? Or are all the facts already on the table and I just have to move on? So I say that because dwelling on Fridays is useless. And the reason why I was perfectly happy and excited to wake up on a Tuesday is because I deliberately made time to do the things that I loved. Uh, and, and all I would really do is I would I would wake up and I would drive to work like actually an hour before I started work. And then I would go into like the break room or my desk and I would do something that I cared about, like writing. I would write stuff. I would um, study music theory. I would kind of read through my music textbook and, and maybe do some ex you you can make your day look like the way that you want it to. I would do music theory exercises. And, and, and all it required was getting my workbook of music theory, you know, homework assignments. And I would do them, and I would quiz myself, and, and I would use a little... F Dude, I, I got an app on my phone that's just a free piano app. I think it's called Perfect Piano. A a and it's as perfect and usable as probably any number of easily obtainable apps. So y you got the ability to, like, see what a melody sounds like on your phone. Obviously, you're not doing it to perform in the moment. But... 
you are testing out some of the music theory concepts that you're trying to better understand. So I would spend that first hour before work doing something that I love. And the thing is, when that hour was up and I had to go to my desk and do that work that is an obligation so that I can pay my bills, uh, you just walk out of that first hour of doing something you love and, and something that you're striving to accomplish, something creative. That gives you so much sense of like self-worth and, and even just plain enjoyment. You compare that to, all right, you wake up at 7 a.m. and you know for a fact that it is going to be a minimum of like 10 hours until you do something that you actually like, right? If you wake up, quickly shower, go to work, start work, right? That means that every single day that you wake up, you are going to have a 10-minute wait period until your day has anything great in it, all right? And, and that's not some complaint that you can file, oh, doesn't life suck? You can make that happen, just as I did. Um I would always recommend if people are looking to get into music theory or, or they want to do creative stuff, whether that's writing or art, don't find time for that stuff. Don't find time for that stuff. What you need to do is to make time for that stuff. Oh, I, I, I feel like I can never find the time. to. Uh, I, I got this marimba that I bought at a yard sale, and I'd love to start learning it, but I'm so busy, I don't know if I could ever find time. Right? It, you set your own schedule. You set your own schedule. You can make it happen just as I did. And, and I walked out of those first hours of, of writing or learning music stuff. And also, I was like, all right, I, I'm just going to do this thing for eight hours, and then I'm going to go home and do my, my fun stuff some more. Oliver Lamb and Dat Cute Boy Prower saying this is some great life advice. Uh, didn't expect this amazing life advice from a Sonic stream. I think that we've talked about so many incredibly valuable things today. And I think that if if, if you're just popping into this stream, uh, I, I would recommend watch or just just treat this live stream almost as a podcast. Um, I think that we touched upon a, a lot of valuable things. And it's not just me saying it because I'm having people left and right. Um, I'm not claiming that I have some incredible advice that, that I'm... All I'm doing is forwarding to you the good advice that that profoundly helped me in my life. It wasn't it wasn't stuff that I came up with. It was stuff that I sought out because I wanted to improve my life. Instead of just sitting around and say, "Why don't women like me? When am I going to find a woman that likes me?" I said, "What can I do to make myself more attractive to a woman?" And not only do it for the purposes of finding a woman that thinks I'm a valuable, you know, dating partner. Um don't do it for that. Do it for yourself. Do it because you want to be who you want to be without having that hinge on your success, right? It's horrible, horrible moments in dating where maybe I've gone on one date with a girl and I, I, I'm trying to text with her, see it feel it out, try to, try to get the next date, even let's go out for a bite to eat. That horrible pit of your stomach feeling where all of your sense of self-worth is kind of like hinging on whether they answer your text. You send a text, and of course, one hour can feel like an absolute eternity. To wait this long takes ages, right? The, it, I think that happens to so many people, right? You're what, one hour, two hours, maybe an entire day, right? Your sense of self-worth and how you define who you are and what to accomplish should never hinge upon that validation, and I would say that it's just like it's a reinforcing circle where the more you don't care about other people's validation, the more people will admire you for knowing who you are and being confident in it that actually you're going to get more texts. You're going to get more texts back. You're going to be ignored a lot less because you're being exactly who you are and you're not letting your insecurities make you like stop and think like, oh, what's the perfect choice of words for this social situation? I, I don't want to offend anybody. I, I, I want to be like, you know, I, I don't want to upset anybody by disagreeing with a movie that they like and, and I thought was actually, be right? Be the purest version of yourself. And, and of course, like, you should seek to self-improve yourself, but like, yeah. Do your thing. <laughs> um, Robo says the interesting thing that your father, 45 years old, says that he's still trying to decide what he wants to do when I grow up. And I can think of one family member who was, you know, 
who is currently, well, he would say that in his 50s and his 60s, kind of as a joke, saying, like, yeah, I think I want to do this when I grow up. Yeah, and I would say, like, it's one thing to keep changing careers. I would adv- I, I would also exercise a little bit of caution about changing your career every five years. Of course, I did education for five years and then medical coding for another five years. But the plan was always to do medical coding for the long haul because I found... A, I just One of the reasons I left teaching was because it was extraordinary. For my personality type... It was just extraordinarily exhausting. And part of the reason for that is I just, you know, the, the idea of talking in front of a class of teenagers, half of whom, like, don't want to be there and are trying to interrupt the progress of the class at all costs for their own entertainment, that takes a type. And I have such a deep admiration and appreciation for the teachers that are still staying in the game. They're not giving up, even though they got kids that have no motivation and, and they got parents who are only enabling their children's foolishness but that that took a huge toll on me and i had to leave i changed careers once with the full intent to always do that but but i've seen many many people in my life who i love and i respect and i'm in their corner and i just worry that they're constantly on the treadmill of desires that they think as soon as i finish this degree as soon as i finally get a good job as soon as i get the promotion i want right you spend all that time looking at the next goal that you end up not, right, it's so obvious you don't smell the roses, but because you're always saying, like, ah, the next thing is finally going to be the thing, that you don't actually enjoy any of your life because you're always in this state of satisfaction dwelling on what's next. So, I, I first of all, it's perfectly fine to be confused about what you're going to do. It's absolutely 100% okay to, to get degrees that you end up not even using. I can say that on one level, you might look at my education history and say that I got degrees. I got two degrees, well, one degree and one certificate that I'm not using. Because I got a bachelor's degree to, to be an English teacher at the secondary ed, right, high school education level. And, and then I also got a certificate for medical coding and billing. And that was basic, that certificate was 10 college classes. So do I look at that stuff and say that I'm actually not using that degree? Uh, far from it, far from it. I, I am, I cannot underestimate. I, I cannot understate the extreme value that, in my particular case, the liberal arts education that I received, because I went to so many classes where, like I was saying, with that reclaiming conversation, it is so incredibly valuable to have conversations with people you disagree with in real time, and to see how people work through these topics in good faith. And, and just have that be the foundation of how you select goals in life and how you treat other people. Even that aspect is so extraordinarily valuable. And that's why I say, like, if you want to go to just using Harvard as a goof, I remember reading an article where people saying, like, you know, is Harvard worth the $50,000 tuition if you're just doing virtual learning during the pandemic? Because a big value of a place like Harvard or, or any school that... that I would I would argue that a huge component of the education that you're getting are all those unexpected illuminating conversations that you have with professors that you have with your peers both during and after class. And and that just that 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 ongoing network of numerous numerous like you know uh just because you're spending time in the same space with people on a regular basis um that's so extraordinarily valuable. And so, yeah, I, I think that the, the very valuable lessons and, and just practice and making mistakes and getting failing grades and then, you know, putting my effort into bigger projects that involved a little bit of creativity and a vision. And it's just so fascinating to, to hear the perspective of so many professors that I disagreed with. Um, yeah, I don't want to be a, a broken record, but... I would say that, yeah, getting multiple degrees and, and then uh, and then not really using them, I, I can certainly empathize with the frustration that you feel like you, you, you're, you're not even the specific example that came up before, but I know lots of people, it's, it just seems like they're on an endless quest to go back to night school and get this master's and that, right? Like, 
and then the by the time you get it all, you, you're married with kids, and it's like you, it, it's perfectly well and good to achieve those goals, but to just always be sitting on that well, always running on that endless rat race treadmill. All I would just add as a suggestion, some food for thought, is that you should just be cautious that you are switching careers every five years, switching jobs every two years. You're thinking that that, that next move will finally be the thing that fills the hole in your heart. Very, very often it will not. And you'd just be going from place to place. You spend all this time and money on education or, or whatever else it is. And... and, and you, what I did with medical coding was I said, all right, I, I have a pretty good sense of what my life is going to look like, and I'm going to go all in and try to do it. And if I end up not liking it as much as I thought I might, then I accept that. I'm, I, 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 ca I can look at this career field and say that the worst case scenario of me not liking this job will absolutely be tolerable. Like, I looked at medical coding, and I was like, no matter, no matter how boring it might turn out to be, which it was not boring. It was not a boring job. But, it, you know, working in the field of medical coding and billing as opposed to, you know, music theory and video game analysis, um, obviously that's not my fit. So I thought, I, I, I just came into the that final, I, I was fully intending that to be the only career that I had for the rest of my life. And I was just like, even the worst case scenario would just be, I'm kind of bored. I'm kind of bored by this work, but I can absolutely do it five days a week for eight hours a day, especially because I can do uh, something I love like music theory or writing. I, I can do that an hour before work and I can do it for a couple hours after work. That was a formula that I, I can walk into the arena of life and say like, I, I know what I want out of life and now I'm going to do it and not have feelings of constant striving for the next goal, you know, give me that sense of permanent dissatisfaction that I see so many of my loved ones and friends kind of fall into that trap. That cute boy Prowa says this is making you feel better about yourself. It, if I've even said one thing that, that I think that, that, that could be useful, that that's cause to celebrate. That's cause to celebrate. I, if I've given you any good food for thought, don't think of my advice today as day one. Think of tomorrow as day one. Day one is is the day where you sit down. If you have a planner, right? I, I would say if you don't schedule your time at all, um, you'll never achieve those things that, that you set out to do and just fantasize about doing. Um, as a first good step, like I, I would just say, yeah, get a planner. Whether it's, it could just even be in your phone. The, the point is that you're mapping out your time and all you, literally all you need to do is start small. Um, take 15 minutes per day to do that thing you love. And maybe plenty of those days you're going to do it for more than 50, 30 minutes, 45, right? But just the act of doing it for at least 15 minutes as a starting point, um, as long as you can wake up every day knowing that you're furthering the life that you really want to live, that's how you can solve those issues of dissatisfaction and all. Oh, I can't figure out what I want to do for the long haul, all that stuff, you know. I can't who says, even if you don't use your degree, the sense that your employment isn't predicated on having it, you will almost certainly still use the knowledge and still skills that you acquired. Most definitely, most definitely. Most definitely. Ha <laughs> Anaka says, job is basically school, but prolonged. That's an interesting, what, what exactly do you mean? I think I know what you mean, but, but I'd be curious to get kind of more details about that. Owen has always been of the mindset that even if you think something you put that much time to is useless to you, you gain something, and you're more mature, or you had good life experiences. Owen, for one, initially regretted the last two years of school because you could have changed the course you went to early, but you wouldn't have been mature as if you wouldn't have gotten the most out of it. Mike Bravo is taken off. Uh, I'm glad you enjoyed the discussion. I'll see you later. Yeah, Owen, very interesting to hear that. Um, yeah, it's like I, I remember I had a friend in college who he was he was studying, I think, to be maybe like a psychologist or a therapist or something like that. 
and maybe this is not the exact same thing that Owen is talking about, but it, it, it speaks to the idea of like powering through and that no matter what happens, you will gain more maturity and life experience from, from seeing it through and struggling with, you know, following through on, on a course of studies or career that you're thinking about. Okay, my friend, I, I don't want to toot my own horn, but this is just a recap of a, a conversation that I had with him. I had a very, very dear friend in college who changed his major lots and lots of times, was really having trouble. And he, he, I think he had done like maybe half of the coursework to be a therapist. And then he stopped. And he said the reason that he stopped was because the classes themselves were absolute bullshit. Like he didn't think that he was actually learning anything valuable or practical or useful. He felt like he was just being asked to kind of just regurgitate and memorize a bunch of lofty theories that it was spending time on a bunch of just bureaucratic grab that he truly did not believe was going to help him in his actual line of work. And so he abandoned the course of study. Now, now what I told him when he disclosed that to me, I was honored that he would be able to share that with me. And, and this, again, just goes to the power of having unscripted, unplanned conversations w with peers who are different from you, all walks of life. What I said to him was like, listen, I know exactly the type of frustration that you are experiencing because I absolutely felt it in some of my some of my education classes were equally bullshit. Um, I had a few classes that I can think of which were life changing and tremendous, and they helped me become you know the the educator that I was for five years. And you can bet you can bet that that has helped me um, create the music theory videos that I do because. The music theory videos that I make are, are very much putting those skills to use that I learned in those classes. And if you've ever understood something that I've said in my music theory videos, which if you're here watching the stream, I, I would imagine that at least something made sense to you and was interesting and cool and you learned something, all right? As I was going through those, it was hit and miss. Some of the classes were life-changing and insightful and, and helped me to become you know, the educator I am today. There were just as many classes that were just bullshit. It, I, I felt like I was getting nothing out of it. I felt like I was being asked to go through the motions, regurgitate a bunch of high-minded theory that is just not practical in the real world. And so what I told my friend when he told me um, about quitting his course of study in psychology because he just couldn't put up with the bullshit, I told him, I was like, the way that I've coped with that with my frustration with bullshit classes is just to say like I know what being a teacher is and I know that I can look forward to the rewarding it's not all rewarding work but I can look forward to the rewarding moments in teaching of what teaching actually is no matter what all the half of these classes and bullshit textbooks don't really understand the real world and it's plainly obvious but basically I knew that if I just soldiered through the bullshit that was just a temporary thing that I had to deal with and I could soldier through it knowing that eventually I was going to get to do the real deal. I had to put in my time. I had to go through the red tape, bureaucratic motions, and, and kiss the right asses, and, and all that stuff. But I knew that as soon as I got to the end of it, I was going to get to be a real teacher. And, and I was going to add true value to students. And I was going to feel a, at least some sense of satisfaction and, and pride that I was at least making a, a small contribution to society. And, and that was how I powered through those bullshit classes. And, and, and what my friend, the, the, the abandoned psychology major, said to me, he said, Alex, I wish I had been mature as you to think through the process that way. And so I, I say that not to brag, but just to, just to put things in perspective that um, school can be very frustrating when you have bad teachers or you just feel like the instruction you're being given is not very substantive and you're just asked to memorize questions on a quiz without actually thinking with your own mind, right? Just keep, keep the real world in mind as an eventual reality that you'll be able to enjoy. And, and that, can deal you, that, that can help you power through frustrating classes that you hate don't let the, the difficulties of school, and, and even if you have a good class that just absolutely kicks your ass because it's very difficult, and I've absolutely had a bunch of those, yeah, uh, uh, just as a little bit of fuel and motivation to help you power through, 
just keep it in the back of your mind, or really in the front of your mind. Don't lose sight of what y- your life is going to look like after you get through the, the education. When you think about it, it's a little bit insane, in my opinion, the fact that you don't really enter the real world in the workforce until like 18 at a minimum, 21 for some people. Um, if you can make a baby at, what, 13, 14, right? And, and yet we're we're delaying your entrance and, and you're contributing to society by like a full seven or eight years after that, that's, that's a huge mismatch. I'm not saying that people should get a job a- as soon as they're able to reproduce and create a new human being, but that is it's just don't let the endless string of more classes and more degrees and putting in your work like that. You can get lost in that and start spinning your wheels, so j- just keep your eventual goals in sight. <laughs> Owen says, the thing is, you never realize how useful it is to you while you're actually doing it. Life is annoying like that. And Owen, if there's any takeaway you can get from what we're talking about, I'm so honored and privileged even just to be able to have this conversation with you and others. If if this conversation just moved you a little bit in the direction of being able to recognize those things up front and and know that there will be a payoff eventually, and and that helps you power through the frustrations and the difficulties of school, yeah, I would say that 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 that's a this has been a good stream even just on the basis of that that that's a great stream it it it, it was val it, it was worth it for, for me to come on here and talk for seven hours and on that note awesome turtwig is wondering do i like cookie dough i think i was always cautioned against cookie dough because i think i don't fully understand when it is and is not safe to eat cookie dough if you had to ask me, I would assume that it's never safe to eat it and that you should really only eat, like, cookie dough-flavored ice cream. I honestly don't know the science behind if it's actually safe and edible to eat or not. Um, what's your opinion of cookie dough? I think I've just always been a little bit cautioned and kind of weirded out by it. All right, so Anakra is saying that you um, you had a question about working at the supermarket. All right, I, I, I'm looking through the chat, Anakra. I can't find it. If you, like, copy and paste it, and, and I, I will try to find it, um, because I'd definitely like to answer your question. Um, da 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 Bernard A. is calling the shots, telling the truth and not hesitating to do so by saying that Robotnik is just Teddy Roosevelt in pajamas. I'll have to put an Easter egg for that. Eh, I'm going to stop talking. I can't be talking about future projects. It spoils half of the thunder. Speaking of thunder, look at this boss. <laughs> I can't do says for stuff like cookie dough. If it contains raw eggs, it's a no-go. So there you go. So is the idea that people will put together all the ingredients of cookie dough, but no eggs, and then it's okay. I, I couldn't even tell you what the ingredients are. But yeah, we're asking the important questions about life and career and self-worth and respect and talking through your problems and most of all cookie dough. Oh, okay. So, Anakwa, are, are you talking about, like, are you saying that you're starting a job at a supermarket and you think that might be what you're doing for the long haul? Um, if that's the case and you're frustrated about it, I, I could definitely have some pointers. I, I wouldn't go into them now, but you can bet that if you pop into stream, like on Twitch another day, or we'll, we'll find a way. I, I'd absolutely love to n- n- hear, you know, uh, your story in a nutshell, and, and I would be happy to point you not point you in the right direction, but just give you the food for thought that occurs to me when topics like this come up. <laughs> Dem Rupees has probably eaten a thousand raw eggs and never gotten sick from it. 
Disclaimer, Alex Yard Knuckles does not advise eating raw eggs 1,000 times or zero times or one time. Demrupees is speaking from anecdotal experience, and I can't take that away from him. I'll just say to everybody, check your nutrition facts. Go on Google. Ask your health teacher. Your health teacher is probably not going to provide the tips that you really need to get the most out of Sonic CD. But your health teacher will nonetheless, I'm sure, be happy to, to give you all the rest important guidelines about when it's okay and not okay to eat different forms of eggs. Speaking of egg man, am I right, people? All right, yeah, so Anarkware, I, I would be happy and very excited and honored to continue that conversation with you sometime. That you, you're starting this job, you're a little bit scared, like, is this what the rest of my life is going to look like? I, I can't say that I would um, give, like, an end-all solution, of course, but I can definitely offer some suggestions about what you can do on a daily basis, small steps toward having a life that you're not scared to even think about what the future looks like, you know? Bernard A. knows that T Miles Tails Prower lives on South Island. A and I think there was a little bit of ambiguity and confusion about that that was finally sorted out officially, I guess, in the canon by that very first episode of Tails Tube, if you remember that. Remember, you know, the Tails Tube thing? I think they finally made, like, a third episode of it. I think maybe Eggman was on it. Because the first one was just Tails. Actually, no, the first proper episode, number one, was Tails, and wow, special guest Sonic. Okay, so this is just the Sonic and Tails show. This is not really Tails Tube. Did the second one have Shadow or Knuckles or Eggman? I don't know. But in that main first episode, yeah, Tails fully confirmed that he's from South Island, and that's where Sonic and, and Tails met. And I really appreciate that confirmation. I was not as happy to see the opening cutscene of Sonic 2, the animation. Um... Because it was like a direct homage to Tails Gets Trolled. And I think Tails Gets Trolled is one of the greatest things to ever come in existence. But I do feel very strongly that that should always be kept separate from the actual official canon work itself. When you just start having Sonic memes... Like, I would have been very disappointed if Sonic Origins had a little Easter egg where... See this little uh, sh sh ice shell right here with the monitor in it? If you break this open and you find a little PNG Easter egg of Sanic, you guys know Sanic, of course, that would be very immersion-breaking. It's kind of like when, you know that show, The Simpsons? And this is true about a lot of shows that when you have an iconic show like that that has been running for so many years, one of the problems is that, like, if a show is on for 10, 20 years, obviously the, the, the writers on the show are going to change. You, you can't have the same writers for 30 years. So as you bring a new generation of writers in, some of those writers grew up on The Simpsons, and th they come to appreciate Homer Simpson for, like, specific aspects that they grew up on. And so they'll write new canon episodes that kind of exaggerate certain aspects of Homer Simpson or whatever in a way that's, like, kind of a caricature, and it's just kind of a fan service. So I, I always get a little bit weary w when that starts to happen with something like Sonic. I, I think it's harmless enough that there was, I think hilariously, there was an official Sonic product that was, I think it was a drink. I don't know if it was an energy drink or something else, but it was basically something like an energy drink that was Sanic. It had that Sanic drawing, that, um, you know, that classical illustration of, of, of drawing that's called Sanic, gotta go fast. So the fact that that becomes officially recognized in, you know, an official drink that you can buy, I guess that's mostly okay, but when it starts to show up in a video game, certainly, I even have mixed feelings about it in the movie. Of course, the first Sonic movie has that brief moment on screen where, what is it, Crazy Willy? Flash, I'm going to lose my shield on purpose. Did that intentionally, as Ola Lilia says. Four hits on that first hit. That's what you can do. You can all strive to do that. You might get hit and lose all your rings like I just did, fool. But you can indeed get four hits before that first downward ice spray. Now, what on earth was I talking about? That cute boy Prower 
uh, has contributed five dollars, which I so thoroughly appreciate. You want to say thanks for giving you your uh, thanks for giving me my love toward Sonic Three soundtrack. You always loved it, but understanding it is something else. Yeah, I I just <sighs> part of the reason why I I got a pretty good feeling a as more and more the videos came out. I got a stronger and stronger sense that the channel would succeed in some form because I genuinely did believe that I was accomplishing the goal that, that, that you just outlined, right? I, I, I Here's this game, Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Knuckles, this music that maybe some people are just discovering, maybe people have been listening to it since they were young and they're adults now, right? To have such a deep and thorough appreciation for the music Right, and you've already had such wonderful experiences, even just playing the game and listen to it on your own. And, and then you come to a YouTube video like mine, and now you're learning like new things about the song that you can get a deeper understanding of it. Right, things to look out for uh, in future playthroughs. Like I, I gotta say, it really means a lot that you would say that that cute boy prowl because that I, I consider that that's one of my important goals. And a comment like that is mission accomplished, so I'm going to keep doing it. And should the channel grow and, and I get to 50,000 or 100,000 subscribers, um, those numbers are always encouraging, but they're never the primary goal. And they're never something that I hinge my self-worth as a creator on. Um, I've said this in the past to patrons. I'll say it again now. If you were to ask me, like, Alex, when do you think or, like, what... What do you think it would look like when you feel like you've truly made it? You know, someone says like, oh, yeah, people are talking about you a little bit more now on Twitter or other YouTube videos. You're becoming a little bit more of a household name. Um, that's also incredible and awesome. And, 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 and sometimes people say like, wow, Alex, you're really starting to kind of make it. And that's so awesome and flattering uh, that, that people would remark like that. And I could even do them one better and say that, like, if you were to ask me when do you... What would it look like if I think that I made it and I was truly, like, a success? Of course, that's... There's not one single definition of success, but... If you ask me, like, what would it look like where... What level of fame or recognition would I have to get to to really consider that, that I've made it? I would say that I already accomplished that. And if you were to ask me when you thought that I accomplished that, I would say that you could go as far as back as the Azure Lake video. And I know I pronounced that word incorrectly. I know the pronunciation is Azure, but I've said it Azure my whole life, and I know it's incorrect, but I will continue to say Azure because it just sounds better to me. And I don't say it sounds better that I think it's more correct than Azure. Um, I just choose to say it that way. And the thing is, I know lots of people in my childhood that also said Azure, so I, I know that it's not just some crazy fluke that I've come up with. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is that it, the Azure Lake video was the first time where I was like, all right, th this is not just some flash-in-the-pan thing that a couple people are finding and leaving a comment. This is like people are looking forward to the next video. They, they, they're really grateful that they got to learn something about, right? Azure Lake video got a like really nice comments and it got 2,000 views. Of course, it has a lot more views now, but after the first couple weeks, that got 2,000 views. I'm like, this is like maybe even better than anything I could have ever expected. If I continue to make music theory videos in my free time while working a steady 9 to 5, 40 hour a week, Monday to Friday job, if I were to continue to make videos that I got comments like these, and even just the baseline minimum of like 2,000 views per video, I, I was ecstatic. I was so thrilled. I That that was the moment where I was like, I, I now already have all the motivation I ever need just to sit back and ask myself, I'm like, are people hearing what I'm saying? A am I just having this these observations and, and they're just kind of floating out into the world and kind of dissipating? Or are people actually hear what I'm saying and, and, and I'm giving them an experience and food for thought with music theory or, or, or helping them to better understand this game that they love so much and continue to fall in love deeper and deeper as I have, even especially in the past two years, I cannot express to you how much 
I have so deeply fallen. Uh, Sonic 3 was already my favorite game of my entire life, but to look at the music to the extent that I have, while also totally rediscovering what this gameplay experience actually is and can be, wow, I, I just... It's been so amazing, and if I can get people a, a little bit of those kind of insights to help them enjoy the music in the game more, then let's do it. I'm in it. I'm here. I'm doing this. Sometimes I talk to people, and, and I talk. And I happen to mention the subscriber count because they're curious, and they say, "Oh, that that's really exciting." You know, what you could think about doing is eventually, you know, you might want to sell the channel to someone. You could make a boatload of money. And I have kind of have a moment where I kind of like blink for a couple moments. And what did you just say? Um, it's totally fine to strive for financial goals, but yeah, that that's just a totally different mindset. That yeah, to hinge your vision of success on just like selling your channel or or like I don't know, doing something like Angry Video Game Nerd did. And uh, by the way, there's absolutely zero wrong with the way that the angry video game nerd essentially, uh, whatever the technical word is, he basically sold the rights to the AVGN and like the main ownership. He still has a ton of creative control and he's still the host, right? But basically they are the, the, the prime, I guess, co-owners, right? It's totally even fine to do that, but to look at that as the benchmark of your success, You have every right to do it, and, and I'm not necessarily even going to convince you not to do it. I, I would just caution you, and just use myself as an example. The reason why I do not approach things that way is that I, I, I don't, first of all, I don't want this stuff that I love so much, music theory and everything else, I don't want any of my participation in music theory in my life to be validated one way or the other, depending on how much financial success it brings me, you know? Um... I'm doing this because I love it like so deeply and so passionately and, and and the conversations that I've had with patrons have been so just wonderful and the comments that I get on videos have been encouraging and uh, I, I, I have to emphasize how helpful the comments are. So many comments that, I, that I've read on my YouTube videos are things that they, they just helped me notice something about the music that, that helped me express my feelings on the music better in the future. So you are all a big part of this, and, and I thank you. Bayanovos is in the house and said, I get, did a break breakdown on Sonic 3 and Knuckles. And you like the hidden melody that I found in the Burning Island stage? Yeah. Um, I'll quickly say about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what will always make me interrupt and drop whatever I'm saying is a Doc Future quote. The Doc Future says that <laughs> I know this game was half made by Sega and half by weird Chinese bootleggers but these days Sega pretty much is a fanfic company anyway. That That is, there are so many absolutely tremendous quotes that, that I just uh, uh, heard that quote so many times because it's so goddamn funny, and, and it just kind of has its own rhythm and musicality to it that works so geniusly, perfectly w with the flow of, of that Let's Play. And Rowboat knows. Rowboat and a lot of people uh, that, that, that hang out on my streams, sometimes we take a look at those Dark Future Let's Play videos of, of Sonic 2 Special Edition, and it's a one-of-a-kind production. Uh, I, I, it was highly influential on me. And, and especially my Sonic content creation stuff. Watching Doc Future's videos was one of the, just a, a very formative experience. I mentioned Cybershell earlier in today's stream. And I, I, I definitely also will mention Doc Future as I, I watched Doc Future's videos and it was a type of insight and comedy that I did not even know was possible because I... I'd never seen anybody else do anything like it. And when I make my YouTube videos, w one of my goals, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel, but, you know, I, I am striving to provide an experience that you can't find anything else. 
something that uh, I don't want to be high and mighty and lofty and, and say that I'm the man, but I, I strive to create an experience that speaks to you in, in a one-of-a-kind fashion. And Doc Futures... videos um, came from such a place of passion and appreciation for the Sonic series and it was just there are certain things in that Sonic 2 Let's Play that, that are just a type of humor that I think is impossible to replicate. You can mimic it, but you can't you, the way that he talks in, in such a serious and sincere manner about like oh yeah this Mystic Cave Zone is messed up and I can't even tell which character I just transformed into, so I, I think this is... Right now I'm playing as Mighty, I'll say. I'm not going to overanalyze why, all the reasons why I think an example like that is so funny, but you can bet your bottom dollar that that, that had a huge impact on... It had a very big impact on the formation of my comedic voice. So I'm going to use this celebration stream to immortalize the comment that I want to say thank you, Doc Future. The memorable laughs that, that watching, you know, his stuff brought me. You know, one of the things that I aspire to do, uh, I, I could never, like, do exactly what he does, nor what I try to try to do. But just that unique, one-of-a-kind feeling of, like, what am I watching right now? This is so funny and strange, and yet uh, on some level it also makes perfect sense like that. Those were formative experiences, and I I if I can pay that forward, even just a little bit, then I win. I win. And I've already won. I it's not that I've already won and like, that. that's my whole life, I've accomplished everything I want to. Hell no. Hell no. But just the fact that I'm able to participate on the Sonic stage in that way is, is something that I'm thankful for every day. <laughs> I, I'm glad to hear from Icantu that Icantu said that you watched Sonic 2 Special Edition after you mentioned it, and that series of videos is so intricate, I could spend years trying to properly understand that. I, I will say something about that after I say goodbye to Anaka. Anaka, you've been here just about this entire stream. Um, You and, and a lot of other people who have been hanging out here, I, I can't thank you enough, so I, I'm glad you're just mentioning that, that you're popping out. Um, Thanks, Anaka. I look forward to more chats with you because uh, I don't mean to overuse this stream, but when I always say these words, I mean it. Um, you've been a great presence here at stream. So have a good night, and I'll see you around. So thank you. I, I, I would extend, likewise, a thank you to you. Now, I can too says something very interesting that, that I want to comment on, is that that series of videos is so intricate that you could spend years trying to properly understand it. That's my exact thought on the matter. Like, I'm saying this just as a philosophical fact. You absolutely could do that. There, I, I feel like you could write PhD dissertations trying to, you know, tease through just, just everything that's going on, even in just those series of videos. You could... You absolutely could, and that it, the fact that you're able to do that is a great testament to 
what of a one of a kind work of genius that it is. Simultaneously, I personally um, think that I, I can just speak from my experience. I think that it's such a one of a kind, bizarre, awesome thing to experience that I almost think like to 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 step back and try to quantify it and analyze it. It's very tempting to do just because it's such a great work of art that I want to understand and, and I would love other people to understand. But it's such a bizarre thing that I think it, by its very nature, it resists that. It resists like explicitly quantifying it and trying to make sense of it that way. I, I think that it, 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 it much better lives. Uh, did I just die twice by that same damn flying caterpillar? You're damn right I did. <laughs> In lieu of doing an extensive, like, encyclopedia of all the references and all the different layers that, that it works, I think that what's much better and more productive... Let me not die this time. What's, what's much better lends itself well is to just experience it, to watch it one time or, 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 or several times, as I have. And, and then I gotta say, it, it, it's, a, it's a special type of treat when something like, uh, I, I want to say who it was because I, yeah, Metafizzle earlier in the stream dropped that Doc Future quote, and, and and I know for a fact that, for example, Cybershell uh, would probably speak as highly about Sonic 2 Special Edition a, as I would, and he, th th there's just a certain type of good vibes and affirmation when, because that that series of videos is a very, very particular type of experience, and it exists in a niche that is so small because in order to even understand it and get half of the humor, you have to have a fairly encyclopedic knowledge of the Sonic series and all the characters and all the references, right? If you're just someone who doesn't know uh, about a lot of the Sonic games and some of the more obscure things, um a lot of that is going to be totally lost on you. A a and that's totally fine in itself. It, it just makes it all the more sweeter when you come across someone who is able to, like, convey and, and just share the laughter uh, about how great it is. And because it's not a mainstream, like, TV show that you could see on broadcast television, it lives in this very unique... Which you're not supposed to say very unique, but... This one of a kind, unique thing, where especially because it involves like copyrighted stuff, like there's all that stuff with the, of course, the absolutely hysterical and hilarious episode of Casino Night Song, where basically he's playing the game and he's on Casino Night level in Song 2, and then it so happens that the computer that he's playing the game on also has a file. Um, called Casino Night.avi because that is the episode of that show, The Office. The Office has a show in season one or two, I forget, that the name of the title is Casino Night. So what happens in that episode, within the canon of the episode, is that Doc Future's computer malfunctions so that the file for the Casino Night Zone level and the file for that episode of Casino Night on The Office and his computer... They get accidentally merged. And so the remainder of the level is like this absolutely bizarre and hilarious hybrid of Casino Night Zone from Sonic 2 mixed with the Casino Night episode from The Office. And I'm not just going to list all the references, but when I tell you that the things like this are like the funniest thing in the universe to me, um, you know how in Sonic games... <laughs> Uh, a common trope in Sonic games is that, especially in these 2D side-scrolling momentum entries, it, it, it's like a common reoccurring thing where the invincibility theme is using the same melody from the opening theme, right? Sonic 1, you get the invincibility. Sonic Knuckles. Right? It's so cool. I love that aspect. Um, So in that merged episode of, of, of Casino Night Zone with the show The Office, 
he gets an invincibility monitor and what starts playing? It's a remix of the theme from The Office. <laughs> that in itself is like one of the funniest things in the world to me. And then he just layers and layers and layers of humor because as that song is playing, he's just casually saying like, oh, I... right, the song is playing, he's got invincibility, I'm laughing my ass off. And what does Doc Future say in that moment? He says, <laughs> he says, he says, there's not much of a point to the invincibility here because there's like no enemies, no spikes, it's kind of pointless. I'm not going to overanalyze why I find that to be so funny. I, I think that if you also find that funny, you, you kind of know the reason why without having to deconstruct it. Uh, that, to me, is, is just peak humor. And, and I salute you, Doc Future. I, I hope that a few people watching this stream seek out your videos. It might seem very strange at first, uh, but after a first couple episodes, you, you kind of get what's going on, and, and then you can embrace the madness, and that's one of the great life advice that Doc Future gives you in the last episode, the Death Egg video. The final boss, right? You know, you can't sit around worrying about this stuff. No one's out to get you. There's no conspiracy, right? The best thing you can do is embrace the madness. That's great, That's great advice that comes at the end of that Let's Play. Embrace the madness. Some of you may be familiar with, with, the, with the adage, we must cultivate our garden. And that comes from Candide, a work of fiction that, that I encountered in my studies. And yeah, w one of the takeaways from Candide is that we're put into this world. It's very difficult to make sense of it at times. And sometimes things are not fair. And sometimes stories end without a satisfying conclusion that feels right or just or sensible, right? But you can't just sit around like uh, hoping and imagining that the world will change or be more conducive to your good feelings. All you can do is embrace the madness. And what Candide says is we must cultivate our garden. We didn't choose to, to, to enter this garden. We may not know exactly what the purpose of this garden is, this life that we share on this planet and, and this galaxy. We might not be able to make sense of it, and it might not be always a good time. The on Literally, the only thing we can do is to make the best of the place and the people that we have. We must cultivate our garden. A and I want to see uh, the original French translation, because it was originally, uh, I'm almost positive, written in French. And that phrase is, and I, I, however many years of French that I took, I might get this pronunciation right, but we must cultivate our garden. That, that comes from the French. And I'm going to read the French out loud because I want to, because and that's also the original language that it was written in. Il faut cultiver notre jardin. There you have it. We must cultivate our garden. The only thing that we can do with our time on this earth is try to make the world a bit of a better place. A and not even just the world, but make things better for the people that you love and spend time with. And even your debate opponents and people you disagree with. Make things better for yourself and, and for your community. And, and, and you're not going to fix everything in your lifetime. But you can move the needle in the right direction and, and, and feel confident and positive for the entire ride. Genji Harvester knows some Voltaire when Genji Harvester sees it. Thank you, Voltaire, for that fantastic work. Candide, we must cultivate our garden. We must cultivate our Twitter sphere where we have conversations. We must cultivate our community garden of YouTube comments and, and the way that we treat each other and, 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 and the way that we try to understand the differences between people instead of just discounting them and running away. That, that's literally the only thing we can do. 
and, and take pride that we move the needle in the right direction in our particular corner of the universe. Robin D. Commend, uh, sorry, Robin D. commends my good French. <laughs> wow, so I can't do says that Yes, and, and okay, so first of all I can't do said um you only want to say that to highlight just how good it is. Even if you wanted to unpack it all, you don't think you could. Yes, and I definitely got that. I, I know that sometimes when you say stuff like that, you have this feeling like, no, no, it's not that I wanted to overanalyze it to death. Like, I definitely did not mean that. And I, I just meant it as the fact that you could do that. It, it, I, we, you and I, I can too, are just using that as a barometer to to quantify how genius it actually is. And, and and I just <laughs> I can't do. It sounds like you're talking about like what was the moment as, as you're watching through his videos? Maybe you don't know what to make of it. Uh, what the hell is this? I, uh, some parts are kind of cool. Some parts are weird. Like what was the thing, the moment where you thought it was a masterpiece? And for I can't do, it was in the first damn level. As soon as you saw that little micro cutscene with the corkscrew loop to loop things in Emerald Hill, you're like, boom, masterpiece, ten out of ten. I'm in. I'm in. Let's watch the whole thing. That's freaking amazing. I will I will share that I don't know if I would call it my favorite moment in that let's play, but it is absolutely the moment that had me laughing the hardest. Possibly the hardest that I've ever laughed in my entire life. It was the Oil Ocean episode when you get that whole big news dispatch recounting the life of one failure crash. The poor boy who got born with a rare case called... What is it called? Cranioboxoheditis. I forget. But basically, it's a very rare and unfortunate uh, birth defect that is the result of being you know, exposed to TV screens and ATM machines and all that horrible radiation. Basically, the kid was born and his body was totally normal except that for a head, he had a 10-ring monitor. He was a human with a 10-ring monitor for a head. And as you're playing through Oil Ocean Zone, you, you get the full story of his entire life and how he was, you know, one fateful day while doing routine patrol in the Oil Ocean as part of the Army. Um, he, 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 he unfortunately crossed paths with some rogue militants that, jumped, that, that cut his head off. Very unfortunate. He lost his head, but he, uh, as you know, people with that condition can actually live as a 10-ring monitor, even if it's been disconnected from their bodies. And so, after all that buildup, the dispatcher is like, all right, we now go live to witness the death of Failure Crash, because Sonic is about to jump on that 10-ring monitor, finally. And I'm not even going to recap the way that that scene plays out, because I want you to see it for yourself. I want you to witness that moment. Um you know, in real time, but I, I will say my reaction to it, which was that I I started laughing, and I started laughing so hard that I fell out of my chair. I know that that's such like a cliche, and how often does that actually happen, but I fell to the floor, and I could not get up. That was one of the goddamn funniest things that I've ever seen in my entire life, and yeah, that, that, was, that was a big, that was a, like I said, a formative, because... The reason I won't overanalyze why that's so funny, uh, I'll let you experience it for yourself, but that that type of approach it, it is definitely been something that's kind of in my comedic toolkit. Not copying, but emulating. Taking the mindset and exploring new domains with it. Um, Robin C. says someone clipped that, because that's some real facts. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Um, just that... Yeah, oh, I was just going to mention that the VOD, the VOD, will be available here on the channel, at least for a while. Um, I don't know about permanently, but definitely for, like, at least a few months at a minimum. So. Alex G is thinking about maybe going to watch this. 
I will point out that you can find some of it on YouTube, but not all of it. I think it's probably due to copyright reasons that the easiest place to just find the entire Let's Play and, and with much better video... Like, people have reposted most of it to YouTube. However, the qu video quality in those reposts is not not nearly as good as if you go to... I think it's archive.org. Archive.org, and it might also be on LP Archive. I'm not sure. It, it's in at least two places, but... The one that I do know, it, it has all the episodes, all the mini-sodes, like the promotional TV advertisements. Um, they're all there. And, yeah, it is it, it, very awesome that those, that series of videos could be so appreciated and, and to be immortalized and preserved like that. For folks like Alex G to be able to watch, yeah, check out archive.org. Doc Future, let's play of Sonic 2 Special Edition for the Sega CD 32X. See, he had an uncle that worked for Nintendo, so he was able to hook him up with a copy on his 21st birthday. His uncle knew how big of a Sonic fan he was, so for, for him to get him that for that awesome birthday, that was a pretty big deal. Alex G is popping out, says, enjoy the rest of the stream. Well, Alex G, it's been great having you here. I think this is probably the first time I've seen you pop in to chat. I had a great time hanging out with you, and, and I, um, three days a week, my door's always open. Come hang out. You got a question? You got a music discovery in the Sonic universe? You know where to find me. Twitch.com slash Alex Yard. Uh, that number again is... Twitch.com slash Alex Yard. Good night, everybody. I ain't going anywhere. I'm already at Sandopolis. You think I'm going to cut and run now? Hell no. We are going to the Death Egg. Maybe not the Doomsday Zone, but we are certainly settling the score with Robotnik at the Death Egg. Even though I'm god darn stabbing. I'm so stabbing I drop my R's when I talk. Can you believe it? Someone lives in Massachusetts. So Metaphysal, all right, I'm not going to say too much on this because I, I don't want to overanalyze it. I, I want people to experience it for themselves. But obviously people sharing the stuff in the comments is truly phenomenal. I love it. Um, the fact that Metaphysal actually believed it was, you know, all right, I'll say that you can read that comment. Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to say too much, but. The point, I, I will say indirectly metaphysical that, yeah, the, the fact that you had that experience um, is, is, is one of the greatest aspects of it. So I won't spoil anything, but if anyone listening to the stream hasn't fully pieced together what I've said, I'll, I'll just keep it vague to, 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 to preserve that tremendous surprise for you. But yeah, not a lot of people know about the special edition because it, it was never officially released. But you had to have the Sega CD, you know the Sega CD add-on that you put the disc in to play, like Sonic CD, for example? You needed the Sonic CD and the 32X. And it's crazy that there were multiple games that were published that, I can't even believe this, games that were so crazy and loaded with content and data that in order to play them, you needed to have a Sega Genesis, right, as a starting point, a Sega CD, and a 32X. It's nuts. I mean, who can afford that? Who can afford that? That's the, the upper echelon of the financial social status back there in the 90s. How much did a Sega CD cost? Like 200 bucks, 300 bucks, And you had to get a Genesis first? So even if that game had been like fully finished and came out, um, yeah, it, it, it would have had its work cut out for it as far as, you know, making its way to enough people that were interested in it because of the huge financial barrier. Alex G is going to sub to my channel in a sec. Um, yeah, so I said it before. I'll say it one more time. If you're interested in watching that series of videos, it's called... Let's play Sonic 2 Special Edition, pretty much, by Doc Future.
Uh, Robin D. says, people talk all about quote-unquote Sonic momentum, but they proceed to ignore the part where Sonic is on the ceiling thanks to sand. Yeah, you know, if I actually stop and think about those, like... Oh, God. If I actually stop and think about those, like, sand paths on the ceiling... Yeah, I don't know if there's any real-world equivalent for, for why that would make sense. <laughs> like, how could a path of stand, sand, sand stay on the ceiling? I don't think it's a fault of the game, just that it wouldn't check out in the real world, I suppose. Um, as soon as I get across this walkway, I I'm going to read a great comment that I just started to look at. Actually, if I keep jumping, I should be safe for a moment. Um, Sonic's the Sucky Doo says, Can I just say that I can explore the zones of Sonic 3 and Knuckles for hours? I actually got a time over just from exploring Angel Island Zone of all places. It's ridiculously fun. So I, I always love to hear uh, perspectives like that because... It's so amazing that Sonic 3, or any Sonic game, can work on that level, and yet y you can play the game and not really pay that much attention to the exploration aspect, and you're not really missing an essential part. Like, the exploration aspect is absolutely there, and I just... It's so cool that the game works on multiple levels like that. Like, I personally have never felt the need to explore, but it is very, very, very easy to imagine, you know, a, a different personality type that, that someone who would love to explore Angel Island for so long that goddamn 10-minute timer runs out. That's awesome. I, I, I just, it's just like I was saying earlier where you have people come to the Sonic universe and they pronounce it Hydro City Zone and I pronounce it Hydrocity and, and that just, the fact that we have multiple perspectives at the table is such a beautiful thing to recognize and celebrate. Alex G. subbed. See me later. Nice name, by the way. It does have a pretty good ring to it. I recommend the name Alex. It's a great name. It comes from the Greek. I'm not Greek, but I got to give those Greeks credit because Alex means protector. And then the name Alexander, which actually my name is not Alexander. Like, legally, my first name is Alex. But... The name Alexander uh, translates to protector of men, which I, I would assume that that really just means, you know, protector of people. But man was the word that they used back in the day. I could be wrong, but th that was all. I, I, if I was going to, you know, carry the torch of, of doing my small part to help protect the people that I respect and, and, and want to see succeed, I would say, yeah, I, I, I would gladly... Uh, like, I don't think that your name should have any bearing on who you perceive yourself to be. It's a really strange thing when you think about it. Like, especially when you watch TV shows or you read a book of fiction. Like, there's so much emphasis on, like, reading into, like, the symbolic meaning of what someone's first name is. And I'm always a little bit suspect of that because it's just simply not the way that the real world works. In the real world, you, you don't look at someone's first name and, like, piece together, like, oh, actually, that name makes sense because that's a reference to this Greek mythology thing, and that speaks to his personality type and the way that he problem-solved when he got to that chapter in the book. Like, that, I always, not to say that I cringe a little bit when I see books or TV like, put an emphasis on, on someone's first name as an indicator of, like, getting to understand that character. But because, dude, Alex is a name that sounds good, and that's part of the reason why my parents chose it. it. It wasn't because they wanted to make some statement about me, because they didn't even know who the hell I was. I was just a damn baby. A blank slate? Obviously not. Completely a blank slate. That's not how uh, forming a person works, but you know what I mean. It's like, it's it suffice it to say that when you, you bring a new person to this world, during that first day, 
you don't know a heck of a lot about that person's personality and identity yet. You, you do get a little bit. You do get something. But um, unraveling that journey over 10, 20, 30 years has it, it, got to be an extremely rewarding thing. But nothing actually has to do with the person's name. Maybe some people choose a name deliberately. But in a way, that's a kind of folly because that's almost a way... Like, if you... If a person names their child something deliberately because they want their child to, like, prioritize that concept in their life, like, that that's actually not... Uh, that sh in my view, that should not be up to the parents to prescribe. I would say that the job of the parents is to uh, introduce their child to lots of different perspectives and, and lots of different hobbies to find out, like, what environments do they thrive in? You know, what, what, who do they choose to spend their time with? How do they define respect? What do they think is important? What is worth fretting about? And, and what is worth just casting off as just a potential source of stress, but nothing that you actually have you to hinge your sense of happiness on? So I, I almost kind of had an idea. If I was ever going to write some kind of novel about a future society, I had this idea that, like, basically you, you, you have, like, a name for the first so many years of your life, and then once you figure out who you are, you, you pick another name. <sighs> it's interesting food for thought, but I actually think that the, 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 the current system is perfectly fine. Just that I, I caution people against reading into the meaning, because as I said about the amaranth problem... Uh, a word is just a signifier. You know, you can't fret over words so much because, as Solid Snake said to write in the Metal Gear Solid 2, right? Don't, I don't know the exact words, but don't obsess over words so much. Finding, find the meaning behind the words and, and then choose what worth, what's worth fighting for, what's worth passing on to the next generation, and, and there you go. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> sorry, I laughed at Dem Rupi's comment, and, and I breathed in a weird way that I kind of choked on my own moment of... The point is, I have to hit Robotnik a couple times and then take a sip of water. Give me a break, people. Wow, eight minutes? What's the matter with you? Oh, said Tony Soprano. What's the matter with you? Oh, Oliver Lamb reports that the stream's been wonderful. You're heading out. I'll see you guys later. Oliver Lamb, I'm glad you popped in. I'm glad you had a good time. This was a blast. This was a day that I'll never forget. And, and, and I'm going to say this at the end, but thank you so much, everyone who, who's popped in. If you're watching the VOD, I hope you understand how much this stream means to me. Not because of 25,000 subscribers, but because we could sit here and talk about things that matter and, and also talk about productive ways that we can help each other get through this journey that we call life. I, I, I wouldn't change a single word of this entire... What time is it? Almost 11? What's 11 minus 3? Eight hours so far we're going? I, 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 I think that this stream w will stand a as a wonderful time capsule of where we're at in the, in the summer of 2022, and, and I can't thank you enough. <laughs> Rowboat says that your name means little wethead, but you're not a wethead. Who'd have thought? I would have thought. Yeah, so I, yeah. A word is just a signifier. Don't worry about words. Well, choose your words carefully, but don't spend most of your time trying to, to, to get the right words and, and trying to force other people to say the right words. Just think about the meaning. Decide who you are independent of any particular word. And you do you. Um, I can too says always a pleasure. If you're taking off, I can too. You know, and I, I, I already recognized uh, uh, earlier in the stream. I, I recognized w what a great contributor I can too is, and I can think of easily off the top of my head lots and lots of other folks who, whenever they pop into stream, I, I brighten up a little bit, and it's not 
due to anything remarkable that they do. Um, the, the simple fact that they're being themselves and, and weighing in on these topics and, and helping me to notice things that I didn't think about before and, and also saying freaking hilarious things like I can't do does. So, yeah, have a great night. I can't do. I'm very, very happy that, that you were here for the stream and have a good one. Kit, hello, Kit. Kit is in the house. Kit says you think this might be the first time joining his stream, and hello. Glad to see him doing great. Kit, I, I'm very, very happy that you're here. And and I want to recognize Kit as a, a very nice and cool person who has been watching my YouTube videos for a good while. And, uh, yeah, I, I featured Kit's animation in, in that first Patreon announcement video that I did almost a year ago. Can't speak highly enough of Kit, just as, as a pleasant person that I'm very glad to have around on the Discord server th that we have. But also, just that uh, people like Kit give me so much hope for, like, I don't know, just creativity and passion. Because if you go to Kit, you could click on YouTube. If you click Kit's username right now and, and just, you know, put a couple of videos on Watch Later. Um, Really, really amazing stuff. Kit, I don't know if you... Uh, I don't know if I remember to mention this or not, but I did feature one of your animations in an episode of Alex Yarda News, and it was the absolutely amazing, uh, the the one that you did that was like, oh, I'm bored doing laundry, and I got special stage blue spheres on the mind. How can I make this work? That, that animation I is quick, and it's so simple, and yet it is so amazing, and it just, it you make it look effortless. The way that you time your amazing animations to the music, not only is it graceful, but it adds to the storytelling and the hilarity of it. And just the fact that Kit has not even gone to animation school, and this is something that Kit ha has picked up, I believe, within the past like two years at most, I it, it astounds me and it encourages me. And, and I want to say that Kit, you, you keep doing what you enjoy doing because I really enjoy it and, and I know that other people do. And that's talent that, that, that it's always very good to recognize and celebrate. God damn, am I hungry. Wouldn't you be hungry if you did an eight, what, nine hour stream, eight hours? And the only thing you ate was like a couple of pretzels after you were like halfway through Sonic Mania? I tell you that it, this has just been so exciting that the thought of hunger has like almost not crossed my mind at all. Uh, but I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm going to eat after this stream. I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm going to eat because I'm very excited to eat it. It's one of my favorite foods, and I save it for special occasions because it's not healthy and it's not something that a person should be eating multiple times per week. It's an indulgence, but it's one of my favorite ones. After this stream, I'm going to eat a pizza from Pizza Hut that has stuffed crust, and the toppings are sausage and green pepper. When I tell you that I really enjoy that type of pizza, you can believe it. It's one of my Good go-to, and especially on a day like this, you know, on it, you know, I, I just, I, I couldn't think of a better way to spend the day. And I hope my saying that didn't make you too hungry. But hey, if you got food, eat it. And if you don't have a Pizza Hut within driving distance, then I sympathize with your plight. <laughs> Kit says that you'd like to see that, and thank you. You enjoy making small animations with music in there. Heck yeah. 
you, you, you're doing a great job, and, and however much you do or don't pursue that in the future, I, I think at a minimum, it's great that you have something that you enjoy doing and, and that just brings, e even if it's just a little bit of entertainment here and there to, to me and others, it's, it, it's very admirable. I mean, Jay Sells knows what's up. Uh, green pepper on pizza is underrated. And you have a frozen one in the oven right now. Hell yeah. And Ryan Erzat echoes the sentiment, you can't go wrong with Pizza Hut. Look, it's not fine dining, but if, if you're me and many others, you, you know what you like. Honestly, it's the stuffed crust that puts it over the top. I absolutely love the stuffed crust. It's very dangerous how much I actually enjoy it. <laughs> but, like, even the pizza on the rest of the pizza, the cheese on the rest of the pizza is actually pretty goddamn good. Yeah, come on. A and the butter sauce that they put on the crust, are you freaking kidding me? Oh, that's so damn good. And I almost died. Let me eat, like, at least one pretzel. Will you all allow me to eat one pretzel? Robo. Here's how you deal with this situation, Robo. You ready? Don't take the bait. Because right now you're taking the bait. B-A-I-T. <clears throat> and, 
And you're giving the person what they want. <coughs> Dem Rupees says, in the time this stream has been on, you went to see Louis C.K.'s new movie in the one single showing available in your state? The movie is called Fourth of July, and it was really damn good, and you're very glad you went. Well, that's cool. I had no idea that he had a new movie. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a Louis C.K. movie. However, I've have, uh, I've seen him live. I've seen him do stand-up live in, in stand-up concert. That was like over 10 years ago. It was fantastic. Um, and, and I think that... Yeah, the show Louis that was on FX is tremendous. And that, that's actually a one-of-a-kind vision, I would say. And actually, Dem Rupees, I don't know if you ever saw the other Louis C.K. show called Horace and Pete. I highly recommend that to anyone. That that really, that, that stayed with me, that, that show. That, I, I might watch it again sometime, but that was like, holy shit. I just watched a very, very impactful season of television. There's just one season, and pretty much the story does wrap up at the end of the season, so... It, it really works. It, it's a really just chilling and fascinating, and I, I could even just say that it has a, a ton of very, very good food for thought on, on a number of topics. Dem Rupees hasn't seen Horace and Pete yet. Yeah, it's really something special. I, I think his, his comedic vision is one of a kind. I guess I have to acknowledge the elephant in the room of his misbehavior, but look, I, we can we can still talk about his artworks, um, knowing that hopefully he's reformed his ways uh, to at least stop doing the things that he did that were absolutely, you know, inexcusably inappropriate, because some of the things were. Uh, uh, moving on. <laughs> A great majority of them were. Hey, how about Love Reef Zone? It's got cool music. It's got the good T Lopes remix. Oh, it's got the gorgeous guitar bends in Sonic Mania. I love it so much. Look at all these cute little badniks exploding, fulfilling their life's purpose. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Redley asks No, Relody. Is there a TV series that really impresses me with its score? Sorry if you already mentioned been in and out. That's a great question. I guess uh, so. Uh, nothing instantly comes to mind. Yeah, score. Hmm. Well, as I think back to some of my favorite television shows of all time, because uh, any show that yeah, that's such an. I guess I never thought about it because I can think of obviously plenty of movies that that that, that had a great score, but TV shows. I honestly. I, this is not obviously me saying that one is better than the other because this is so incredibly broad. But I generally enjoy television, you know, series um, a lot more than movies. And it just because television has the advantage of like going on a long journey with a character over time. Certainly a show like Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, because you're starting the season, season one, you're starting with a version of the character. And you're watching this very slow but very trackable and noticeable evolution of, of of how that character, you know, what he believes in and how he sees right and wrong. That That's a huge advantage, whereas I feel like movies are at a disadvantage because how the hell are you supposed to convey all of that in, in two and a half hours? Um, movies always feel a little bit rushed in a way that TV uh, does not have that problem. Um, yeah, I don't know why I can't think of a single example. Um, certainly the Breaking Bad score, very, very good. A and they've continued that in Better Call Saul. And, of course, I'm not going to give any spoilers. But I will say that last night's Better Call Saul episode was fantastic. So damn good. Um, I, I, I very much look forward to uh, talking some more stuff with Dem Ropies and others about uh, that episode and others in the future, probably on stream at a minimum. <laughs> Daniel Bryce says that you'd like to see me, Alex, tear apart the music of Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. Uh, I, I would mention that I've never played any of the 2D Zelda games. I have tried to, and I just really don't vibe with it. I'm, I'm really like, 
Like, I play it for five minutes and ten minutes, and I'm like, I'm going to have to do mainly this for the next ten, twenty hours of gameplay? I, you, uh, I can't even imagine. I totally can understand how people could vibe with it, but yeah. I, it's just really strange that, obviously, like, Ocarina of Time and all the 3D Zelda games were, you know, the seedling of an idea was that that, that was a 3D representation of the 2D formula. So you would think that uh, I would at least connect in some length with the 2D experience that started it all, but yeah. I have a great time playing the 3D Sonic games. Sonic games. Zelda. Of course, I'll probably buy Breath of the Wild 2 when it comes out. I've been, I, I'm have been i critical of Breath of the Wild 1 because th there's certain things that... There's a great many things that it does that is like... I'm going to time out, huh? Ooh, but I'll at least get the signpost right here, right? And then it'll set my time back a little bit. There is a signpost, right? Uh, never mind. Ready to time out, people? I should just crush me. Yeah, Reldy says TV series can follow a more epic poem format. Wow, what a great way of putting it. When it comes to character development, and Breaking Bad has some amazing music. Yeah, I m great moments in Breaking Bad that I think of. What the hell? Am I basically like kind of soft locked into this? This has never happened to me. This is really funny. So basically, if this happens to someone, if they're playing like the real game on a real Genesis, they would be totally stuck. They would just lose. Well, I guess at, in a worst case scenario, they would lose all their lives. I guess I thought the timer restarted. They would just lose all their lives, and then maybe if you have a continue, you have to start the entire act over. But yeah, I, I how have I never come up against this? Maybe it's because usually I don't take 10 minutes to get through these damn zones. All right, so to solve this problem, I will need to exit the file and just jump to Hidden Palace. Oh, that's weird. Look at the timer. Hmm. I'm gonna have some, I'm gonna have to ask my sources what's going on here. Why does the time reset sometimes but not others? All right, good. I'm glad we can have the full canon experience of Lava Reef and its wonderful transition to Hidden Palace. It's a very important part of the story. Ah, Metaphysical uh, sheds light on my confusion, which is that the time only resets if you get a time over. Good to know. Mystery solved. That makes perfect sense. So definitely what you want to do, what you don't want to do is say like, oh, I'm going to get a time over, so let me just die on purpose. No, ho, as Olilia said. I love in the ap episode of Ask Olilia Things on this very channel, Alex Yard Knuckles, uh, the video with Olalilia that's about his, uh, the, he, his prospects of getting a job and trying to juggle that with his atypical sleep schedule. The way that he says, oh, no, is so goddamn good. I love it so much. He's like, yeah, I'm so desperate to get out of North Dakota and move to Florida that I am willing to work 70 hours a week every day of the week. But what did he say when he's like, oh, no. Well, I, I butchered it, but basically he says something like, oh, you think I don't want, like, I don't have enough motivation to work to be able to make money to move out of North Dakota? No. -ho. I am willing to work 70 hours a week every day of the week. And you notice the way he said it is kind of like he, he, he had a slight mistake in his choice of words. Obviously, we all know what he meant, but he said, 70 hours of the week, every day of the week. <laughs> it's like what, Anchorman, 70% of the time, it works every time. Uh, Ryan Arzat is heading out, and I appreciate the kind words. That it, uh, I'm glad you thought it was a fun stream, and I definitely felt this to be one of the most fun streams I've ever done. 
because it's a very special occasion and, and the outpouring of support and kind words has been awesome. It's been really something special. And I will never forget it. And the VOD will be available forever. It'll be available on this channel for a while, but uh, eventually somewhere else forever. Damn Ropies hopes Nick's doing good. And yeah, I haven't talked to him in like at least uh, several months, but definitely within the past year. Yeah, he's, uh, actually, I think that he, well, I do know for a fact that he started a Patreon, which is probably still active, and, and the last time I checked it, it still had a fair amount of monthly pledges, so at least he's got that going on. I do remember that he was moving yet again to maybe somewhere on the West Coast, but I'm not sure. Yeah, now that you say that, Demropies, I'm gonna have to check in with that fella, because he's such a cool guy, and he's always fun to talk to. Isn't it funny to see this cutscene with the Michael Jackson boss music? <laughs> it's funny that Sonic Air doesn't... I, I would think that Sonic 3 Air would at least have the the judgment call to say, like, all right, you can you can toggle on the Michael Jackson mini-boss theme. But, yeah, putting it here is freaking out of place and very, very funny and good. Sonic's the sucky dude really dislikes the Lava Wreath Act 2 boss. The beginning portion is fine enough. But when you're actually fighting Eggman, it drags on for too long. <clears throat> it's just platforming. Yeah, I would echo that sentiment, Sonic's the sucky do, because I always hate in non-interactive bosses. That, that's an example of a boss where you're not actually interacting with the boss. Uh, a baseline requirement for, for a good boss is just that you're attacking the boss, and, and you have to like really think about when is the boss actually vulnerable, when is it not safe because he's going to punish you with his attacks, right? But to just have the boss sitting on the side of the screen and literally all you do is avoid obstacles is pretty dumb. I don't know what y'all think of the Labyrinth Zone boss. I, I wouldn't even say that it's bad. It, it almost does, though, seem like it was kind of a placeholder. Like, maybe they had an idea for, for another boss, and it just wasn't quite working, and time was tight, so they were just like, uh, let's just make this a chase sequence that you don't even have to hit Eggman. The fact that you don't have to hit Eggman is kind of dumb, because you could just have easily made that part a part of the level, right? It's like Hydrocity Zone with the advancing wall. Like, that's a sequence where the wall keeps moving, and you got to keep up or pay the price. A and that's basically what that Labyrinth Zone boss is, you know? One, one, seven, six, 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 four. One, the one chord, you know. One, seven, six, the reverse Eggman cadence. Five, four, five. Five, 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 five. You, you want to wrap up your song? All you need to do is spam the five and then go back to the one. The five to one is the ever trusty five to one, just like I talked about in the Benjo Kazooie video. Daniel Bryce says Lava Reef main boss is kind of fun, kind of somatic. But TBH, Lava Reef mini boss is way better. What's the Lava Reef mini boss? You know what's actually much, much worse is the Lava Reef boss in Sonic Mania. I think it's Act 1. It's really, really bad because it's almost an example of what we were talking about where you're just waiting and dodging attacks. You're not actually interacting with the boss. Because the whole idea, I think, of how to... The quickest way you can beat that Sonic Mania Lava Reef Act 1 boss is... I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, but all you have to do is just make sure that each time the boss comes down, it lands on a different platform. But you don't want it to land on the same platform twice, because the first time it lands on a platform, it'll take away some of the ground. But then if it lands on that same thing again, I think it'll maybe take away the entire ground. Now it's lava, and it can attack you. So basically, that stupid boss is just a chore of, all right, uh, I, I position myself here so that the boss crashes down here, and then the next panel is very, very dumb. 
It's not replayable. There, there's no thought involved. And I don't understand how that standard of quality for bosses was acceptable in this game during development. You want me to call out chords like that? I'll, I'll do it a little bit more if you want to. I'm assuming you're not being sarcastic. If it's annoying, I can definitely stop. But I'll just do it right now and see if anyone chimes in with irritation. I won't do it for the rest of the stream. I promise I'll do it for a maximum of just 20 minutes. Five chord. Five, five, five. Five chord. Hit the spikes. One. And then we'll go down. Seven. Going down. Reverse Eggman cadence. Uh, sharp six. Uh-oh. This is the chromatic stuff. Sorry. Ready? One. Flat seven. Six. Flat six. Here we go. Going back to the five. The big five. Five. And then back to the minor six. Oh, six. So damn good. Five chord. And then come back up. Mario Cadence. Six. Seven. Back to the one. One. Oh, we made it. We made it. Sonic Knuckles and Tails are striking back. Yeah, we've got all this difficult strife, but at the end of the day, we're going to, you know, put our heads down, power through, and get the job done. And make it back up, slowly but surely, to the stop of Sty Sanctuary Zone and, and the top of that chord progression. Rejecting the Eggman cadence in favor of the Mario cadence. And I got a comment once that was like, all right, anyone who's seen the Sky Sanctuary video knows what I'm talking about, the Mario cadence. In fact, I think I inter yeah, I introduced the Mario cadence in my music theory videos in the Mushroom Hill music theory video. But then I also mentioned the Mario cadence in the Sky Sanctuary video because as I was just singing, it's in the song. And someone left a comment that was like, listen, I love these videos and I've watched them all like four times each at a minimum. It is absolutely effing and raging that you would call that chord sequence the Mario Cadence. I mean, you could have called it anything that had to do with Sonic. You call it the Sonic Cadence, the Victory Cadence. But to just call it the Mario Cadence, it just feels so out of place. And you know what I responded to that comment? I said, listen, sugar, I did not come up with the name Mario Cadence. Do you think that I would have, like, shoehorned that in for no reason? The Mario Cadence is something that I can think of at least two YouTube videos that have already outlined the Mario Cadence and what it is and how it works, right? Because uh, you can find, it, we call it the Mario Cadence, but if you go looking for it, you can find that freaking chord progression all over the place. It, it's not like a rare, obscure thing. Um, yeah, it's but yeah, it, 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 I, I really liked that comment. And I don't say that sarcastically, I just because I thought it was funny. I thought it was funny, and, and yeah, I'm like, I didn't name the Mario Cadence, and other peoples have made videos about it before I did. And you can bet that within an hour, the person took down their original comment. <laughs> so you know that I screenshotted it. You're damn right. It's really, really interesting, the science of, like, when you're having an online interaction with someone... And they're behaving in a way, this has even happened to me in the past couple of days, when they're acting in a way that is so immature and, and you know, like, are they really going to stand by what they're saying here? Or, or are they just talking so foolishly that they're definitely going to come to see how ridiculous it is? And if they do find out how ridiculous what they're saying sounds, they're going to take down their tweets. It, it, it's so goddamn satisfying when you have someone, like, giving you a hard time and criticizing you in ways that are not fair at all. And you know they're not fair, and that's why you don't let it upset you. But you're like, this person is being so illogical and unreasonable that I bet they will eventually see the error of their ways. But because they're going to take that tweet down, I'm going to screenshot it. A and sure enough, within 6 hours, 24 hours, you come back, the tweet's gone. Big surprise. Uh, and, and I accurately predicted it and anticipated it and, and grabbed onto it. Daniel Bryce says, they're not foolish. Filter's ignorant. That's ignorant. How could you say that? No, it's a beautiful thing. That's ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Gamer Smarts is starting a new movement with hashtag not my Mario Cadence. I, I'm going to be looking out. I'm going to be looking out for the legions of folks who reject the Mario Monica. And Daniel Bryce furthermore elaborates on the people to say they have a primordial, primal need to be right. Yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, when you boil it down to that, it, it, it's a very observable social science, let me tell you. Well, no shortage of fascinating observations in that domain. Like, one of the greatest things... It's always so sad. I, I don't mean to brag or anything, but, like, it's happened multiple times in the past. One time, there was a video back in the day when I used Facebook, and you know that I left Facebook in, like, five, six years ago, and, and being able to disconnect from that polarizing bullcrap is part of the reason why I'm now today able to have such a clear enough head that I can make some of these music theory videos. But anyway, back in the day when I was on Facebook... Someone posted a link to a video that was basically it was a it was a call it was a, a video that took place at a college cafeteria, and it was this really stupid, indignant, a really entitled kid who like I think he wanted chicken nuggets. He was probably drunk, under the influence of something. He he really wanted chicken nuggets, and. And so this video that was caught, this footage of him, he basically went up to the, uh, the the cafeteria staff and was demanding nuggets and was getting really hostile about it. Totally out of line, right? So y y you watch this video, and, and what happens in the video is that the damn brat gets what's coming to him because after a while, security steps in, and when he doesn't comply, they, like, tackle him to the ground. And, and, and as soon as they tackle him to the ground, like, all that bravado and all that macho, you know, making demands about getting he chicken nuggets, suddenly, in the blink of an instant, that, that, that attitude, right, that persona that he was trying to use to, to get he nuggets, <laughs> um, totally evaporates, totally evaporates, and now he's just this wounded little animal. Ow, ow, it hurts. Oh, my God. Right, right. And so... Somebody shared this video on Facebook, and curiously, um, I I instead of saying, like, oh, look how ridiculous this kid is being, the person framed it as, like, they, they said, you know, this is not a laughing matter. People who work at colleges have to deal with abuse like this, and, and to just share this video around and, and make some kind of spectacle about it, is really disrespectful to the trenches. People in the trenches, you know what, because working at a college, you're in the trenches? Come on. I know you can deal with indignant parents and bratty, drunk college students, but very, very fascinating that that person uh, who works in that setting, right, and, and that maybe predisposed them to have that takeaway, was like, oh, th th it's shameful that this video is being shared around to just make entertainment out of a horrible exchange like this. And, and, and shared an article that was, like, elaborate. So this wasn't just the Facebook poster. It was the Facebook poster sharing an article about uh, being outraged about that. And I said, listen, this doesn't make sense. I'm going to tell you why. And I bet you're going to run and hide and delete your comment after I say what I have to say. And basically, the heart of what I said was, listen, this kid is being a total brat. The video is not glorifying that. You're just being insecure and, and suddenly thinking like the entire world is out to get people who work at colleges. I'm like, the reason why I laugh at this video is not because it's turning a, a, a really bad confrontation into some kind of entertainment. If anything, I'm laughing at that kid because he's an a-hole and an idiot. And it is absolutely hilarious to see him get what he deserves by being tackled to the ground. And And it's like... It's kind of, I think Chris Rock made the point about, <laughs> Robot says, why can't a man have his nuggies? I think that the, the sage voice of Chris Rock made the point about that. He was like, talking about how, especially, uh, I don't mean to make it a race thing, but this is definitely something that white people are guilty of. Especially the Justin Timberlakes of the world, who he talks about in this bit. He basically says, That, w some, that there's a certain strain of white people who will 
adopt kind of a black way of talking only in certain settings and, and situations. They will only adopt kind of the, the, the black vernacular when everything's great, right? They're hanging out with friends, laughing, having a good time. Yeah, what's up, dog? Yo, give you a handshake, right? Or that that cool looking high five that, that you can give someone and you can wear your, your your baseball cap backwards, like totally embracing that look, to talking like it, you know, you know, what I'm, you know, you've, we've all seen Justin Timberlake act that way. Um, and, and so what Chris Rock very, very geniusly observed is that that is most definitely not the real Justin Timberlake. And the reason you know that is because when shit hits the fan, it's not how he talks. And he uses the example, probably most of you are familiar with that show Punked that Ashton Kutcher had. Um, they would pray pl- uh, they would do pranks on celebrities and, and then reveal it at the end, but they would get them all stressed out about some situation. And so they they prank Justin Timberlake. I don't even remember what they did, but basically th- they got Justin Timberlake to think that he was in a whole crap ton of trouble. Like, either he had hit someone's car, or he was being accused of, like... Or, like, maybe someone got hurt in a public thing by accident, and they were blaming it on him. Like, oh, why don't you look where you're going? I can barely see. My eyes hurt. And, of course, you got to be very, very careful when you do pranks like that. I do not advise it. But during the time that Justin Timberlake thought that he was in deep doo-doo, and he's like, oh, my God, I'm in trouble. I'm so stressed, right? The way that he talks is like the most whitest way ever. He's like, oh, my God, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Jeez, I, I hope they're not hurt. I didn't mean it, right? And then and then, as soon as the instant he finds out that it's a joke and, and all the tension is relieved, he goes, oh, dog, how could you do that to me, dog? I can't believe that, man. How could you do that, bro? Right? Total tonal shift. Uh, it, that just shows you exactly the way he thinks and talks you know, when it matters, and and, and then he kind of adopts that vernacular, appropriating it, one might say. Uh, It's absolutely hilarious. Kit has a question, which is, what Sonic 3 and Echo Zone is my favorite, and why? Wow, great question. I'll say this. As a starting, I am going to answer your question and try to give a single zone. But let me talk through my thought process, which is a lot of times the best way to think through this is like process of elimination. What is definitely not my favorite act? And this is a total cop-out, but at least for the first six zones, I like all of them a great deal. Um, If I had to absolutely pick one, I would say Hydrosity. Because gameplay-wise, I just think that every other zone has more to offer. But that's not nearly to say that hydrosity is bad. Just that it does not live up to the... the just uh, I look at every other zone from Angel Island, Marble Garden, and then all the Michael Jackson levels. They're, they're just non-stop awesomeness. And hydrosity isn't even that bad. I can definitely say that I like zones in the first half of the game more than the second. And some of you longtime players playing this game may not know that. You can watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to, of course, do the typical method of coming down at the right time. But watch this. See those upside-down ones? Watch what I do. See how when they're upside-down like that, you can spin-dash into them? And, and not only do you not die, but you can get a hit. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> There's another Ella Lilia cloat. cloat. How many hours have I been streaming? God damn. A great Ola Lilia quote that I will often bring up is isn't this awesome? Because it's a video that you can probably find on YouTube right after the stream. It's a video that Olilia put out. It's probably on the Olilia archive right now. And it is a video about Super Mario Sunshine where he basically shows you this glitch where long story short, there's a way that you can manipulate this this platform so that it will launch you very abruptly, like, really high into the sky. Like, you go up so crazy high above the level, um, and and once you get to the apex of your height, way up above the level, then you start to fall. And basically, you can see the entire free fall. It takes them forever 
to fall back down to the level. And at first, you it's so far away, you can't even see the level. And then the level materializes, and you could ju it's just this tiny blip in the distance that he's slowly but surely... Of course, he's moving at super high speeds in a free fall, but he's so far away, right? And and, and so <laughs> I love Olivia so much. He's fallen down. He's commenting on the different trajectories, top speed, how long is it going to take. And, and, and then there's a few moments where it is silent. He's just watching the speed. And, and, and then he breaks that few seconds of silence by saying, as he falls down, the island gets better. He goes, isn't this awesome? And, and that is just one of my favorite emblematic Ulalilia moments. Ulalilia. Actually, the correct, hyper-correct pronunciation is Ulalilia, I believe. And, and, and you can bet that Cybershell corrects that. Uh, sorry. Cybershell always pronounces that correctly. I don't. I'm sorry, Ulalilia. But I think Ulalilia basically said he was cool with alternate pronunciations. I tend to say Ulalilia. Ulalilia. Sorry. It's like a tongue twister, like Ron Burgundy to get ready for the news. Ola Lilia. Ola Lilia. Seven swan sweaters. Um, yeah, I say Ola Lilia, which probably most people online do. But the official canon pronunciation, because Ola Lilia came up with that name himself, so he's the final word, is, it, it's almost like you say the word lily, like lily pad. It's Ola Lilia. So yeah, to go back to Kit's question, I got sidetracked. If I had to pick a favorite zone, I'm going to say Marble Garden. Marble Garden was a, a, a level that I felt very mediocre about for forever. And, and I think a great many people do. Once I figured out how to actually get into a good flow at Marble Garden, I just, yeah, it echoes what I said before, that it's just a perfect example. Marble Garden is... A constant high-octane obstacle course from beginning to end. It's just a bunch of quick jumps and maneuvers, and you got to dodge the spike ball. you got to uh, wait for the right amount of time for the blue badniks to, you know, they have their spikes, and, and if you wait a brief moment, they'll withdraw their spikes. Like, so many cool, like, quick calculations you have to make. And uh, I'm all about it. And the music, are you kidding me? That's another example of a song that I always liked a lot. But it never struck me a as one of my favorites. But, yeah, doing the Music Theory episode, and that was one of the first, you know, I think that was maybe the first level theme that I did. After, um, oh, no rings. Everything's on the line, Alex. You got to do it. Woohoo! that was close. All right, no rings. I can do this. Now, I think I'm actually p in pretty good shape because, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think you can actually take damage during the sequence. You can't take any hits because the only thing that can happen is that you jump up to Robotnik, and, and if you're jumping up in a ball, you're going to hit him. Whoa, that was iffy. Whoa. I did it. I stopped Robotnik once and for all, for this game anyway. Um, hey, why did the Master Emerald stop falling? That just makes no sense. That makes no sense from a physics standpoint, you know? Alright, can I appear on screen right now? I'm not going to get rid of the, the, the game yet. But I'm going to wrap up the stream soon, and you can imagine why. But I think it would be fun to wrap up the stream with the credits playing and, and, and me appearing on camera because uh, I have a somewhat attractive face, and, and, and it's bearable to look at. I, I think you will be able to tolerate my face. It does. It's not that bad in the end. Do-do-do-do. <laughs> So damn good. I love hearing that alternate song. Get ready. I'm probably going to pop onto the screen in three, two, one. Hiya. How are we doing? Wow. 
we're at the end of this absolutely tremendous stream. I, 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 I can't thank you enough for showing up and hanging out. It's been an absolute ball, and, and I figured it would be, and <laughs> wouldn't you know, it was. I want to say thank you to all the wonderful designers of Sonic 3 and Knuckles because it's a game that's so... Look at that. Producer, Yuji Naka, not just the lead programmer, all right? Director, Hirokasu Yasuhara. You're going to hear me talk about him in my upcoming big... <sighs> as a video that's coming to the Alex Yard Adventure channel. Senior game designer, Takashi Izuka. He was a senior game designer of Sonic 3, and that counts for something. Lead programmer, Yuji Naka... Origins absolutely ruined the physics, but it, it, we can still always play it for the rest of our lives here in Sonic 3 Air and any number of alternate options of playing the game. Ridley says thanks for the stream, and I appreciate that. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I think what we're hearing now is the... Uh, actually... I think the reason that this is not this is a who gives a crap fun fact, but if you're into this technical stuff, I'll just say it. After I give credit to the music composers, Buxer, Brooks, Ross, Grace, Grisby, Scirocco, Howard Drossen, great music we haven't forgotten, and you did like 30 other tracks, Michael Jackson tracks that we never heard, and if we never hear them, that's a possible future, but if we got to hear them, I, I think that would be like the ultimate Christmas morning just super treat. I would love to hear all the other music that... Uh, Brad Buxer and his team came up with. PT, no, P, P the ass says, cool stream, man, even though you just joined last 30 minutes. Yeah, I mean, of course, a live stream is, th there's a certain energy to it in a, a live broadcast that, of course, is it's just not quite the same. I think I will probably actually leave the chat on. The last s live stream that I did here on the YouTube channel, I didn't have the, the, the chat replay on. I think that in this case, it would be a better opportunity to make the chat that you'll be able to see, especially because we talked about so many great important things. Like this was much more so than the last one. This stream, which I, I'm so happy that we had this awesome celebration stream, um, it, it, even just sitting here right now, the stream is not even done, but I think this will work well as a time capsule of, of where we were and what we care about and, 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 and the things that we've been working through, for better or worse, come heck or high water. Um, yeah, this VOD will be available. I, I think we talked about so many fascinating things, and, and, and I so commend everyone for taking part in the conversation. So yeah. Um I think it's time to sign off. So I uh, I want to I just keep repeating myself and say thank you. But yeah, I mean I I think that Actually, give me one sec. There's that louder music. Yeah, what I was going to say before that I got sidetracked, this might be who gives a crap theater for most people, but that ending credits theme apparently is like classified as a sound effect, not as music, and that's why you hear it so much lower is because I turned the sound effects down due to my ear problems. All right, let me get what I need to get. Now I'm appearing in front of a black screen. Ooh, whenever you see an important Nintendo executive appear on camera in front of a black screen and you don't know what it's about yet, you, you don't get a good feeling. Ooh, ooh, I feel a Breath of the Wild 2 delay headed my way in just a few seconds. And now I gotta listen to him open his mouth and, and, say, and, and deliver the bad news. What's it gonna be? Time stones. So yeah, I'm I, I just gonna... Actually, this is... Uh, Yeah, this footage that you're looking at is just from my stream the other day. Sonic CD, it's a great game. 
Um, yeah, so uh, so many incredible things that we talked about today, and I didn't even anticipate what we were going to talk about. Um, I, I think this is just a genuine exchange of ideas, and, and I'm glad that I was able to, to mention a few things that you might find useful when it comes to, you know, achieving the goals that you seek to achieve. And yeah, you could see up at the upper corner, I put that book. It's called Reclaiming Conversation by Sherry Turkle. And that is, is a huge alternative. And, and, and it, it's a solution to the problem that we've been having with everyone's in their own bubbles. They, d they have no common ground. They hate each other. They think the other side is a demon. No. The way that we move forward is by talking to each other because we're all human beings. So I could list any number of reasons why that book is so tremendous. So if you have the opportunity... You know, you always buy a Starbucks coffee once a day, and that's like five bucks. So just skip three coffees. You'll have the 15 bucks to be able to get it as an audiobook that you can listen to while you exercise. Oh, I haven't changed the screen yet. Oops. Here I am just pointing at stuff and telling you about gameplay in the back. What would I do without a rowboat and others? All right, let me switch to that final screen so I can give you a lovely goodbye. We're going back in time to Collision Chaos and Tidal Tempest. Gotta love that Tidal Tempest music, people. Um, yeah, let me at least give me one sec. Da, 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 da. This level especially is, is definitely... Oh, I can't... <laughs> That's the... Uh, the, the <laughs> I forgot that this is a stream, so I'm not going to get game audio. I'm going to get my commentary from that stream. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah, so Reclaiming Conversation. Sorry about that. That's the name of the book. Sherry Turkle, Reclaiming Conversation. I, I've said plenty about it, so I won't uh, repeat myself now, but... A very important book for me, a, a very important book that has helped me be able to approach you know, healthy disagreements with people in a way that is you know, puts people's respect, you know, first and foremost, and, 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 and it's just a productive way to move forward. PT the Ass says that I should do a video on Sonic CD music. All I'm going to say is, if you were a patron, you might already know the answer to that question. That's all I'm saying. Steve Reen says, good stream, and I appreciate that, Steve. Uh, you got see your classical snowman, the same snowman emoji that accompanies your uh, go-live notifications on Twitch. Is there any story behind that? Is that, like, kind of just your default favorite avatar? Dem Ropies says, tremendous stream. Thanks so much for popping by, Dem Ropies. Dem Ropies, and me and Dem Ropies go way back to the YouTube era, back when I was first, you know, uh, coming across Ola Lilia and, and all that stuff. So it, it's great to have a longtime pal from the YouTube community, Dem Ropies. Thanks for hanging out. Me and Dem Ropies are uh, really excited for this last season of Better Call Saul. Uh, Sonics the Sucky Doo says goodbye. It's been one great time. I'm glad you, you feel that way. It's been such a blast for me. A and I'm ready to, <laughs> to come back on the air in less than 24 hours. So yeah. I uh, just know that it's not that I'm like the going to solve your problems or anything, but just know that three times a week I will be live streaming. You can count on that. I stream every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Right, this week was actually a bonus stream. Even this regular week, I'm doing my normal three streams, and I I, I really just appreciate so many people who have subscribed on Twitch. Um, that really helps me and the channel and being able to continue doing this full time. And yeah, so I will always be available to, to hang out and say hi on Twitch. So I would love if you pop by. Um, Black Floyd wonders that Nick Alililia seems so cool. What's it like hanging out with him? That is a, 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 the answer to that question uh, would take a long time to explain. He is an absolute joy. I, he is such an interesting and fascinating guy. He's totally genuine, which is more and more rare these days. He's totally genuine. He says what's on his mind, but never, ever, ever in a way that's rude or condescending. 
Um, when you hang out with Olalilia, I, I had the pleasure of hanging out with him twice. Because one time I went to North Dakota to hang out where he lived at the time for a few days. And then another time he came to Massachusetts. He didn't stay with me, but I got to hang out with him on two different days. And it's just uh, so many priceless moments. And not even to say that I like started laughing and cracking up and like that kind of funny, but just moment where Olalilia will will say things that it's like that could have only come out of the mind of Olalilia, and, and that's a treasure. That's a, and I don't mean that in a condescending way. Um, the the way that he solves problems and, and talks through his thought process is. It's so interesting because he's so good at just laying out all the facts. I don't mean, mean to take a dig. At, it's not that other people are dishonest. It's just that my calculations is so well informed and deliberate that to just hear him outline that out loud is always just so fascinating. Black Floyd says also, well, uh, thank you for making all the swell content. You got it, Black Floyd. I really enjoy doing it, and I look forward to doing more. So... The, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, I, a lot has happened to me in the past month. Sonic Origins disaster. It was a disaster for me. It's fine. Other, I don't want to be playing cards, but I'll say this. I I guess you could say I took a small break from doing music theory videos, but I wasn't just sitting around. What I was kind of doing instead was working on the long-form video. It, it it's It's a... It's an in-depth look, right? I'll, I'll just say it's, it's longer than a half an hour. Let me say that. It's longer than a half an hour where I am going to... Out, it's about a, a Sonic game. It's one of the original Momentum Sonic games on the Genesis. I'm not going to say which one it is. I think I told patrons, but I'm not saying it here. I, it, it's a video that I hope to give you a ton of food for thought, and, and, and really my main goal of it is to help you enjoy the game more. I don't want to give too much away, but I I, I, I aspire to... Th that video is in the final phases, in the final touches. I, I think it is very, very, very high probability that I'll be able to put it out before Monday of this next week. I have had such a crazy, insane week and past few weeks that, you know, even doing this... <coughs> let's say it was more than eight hours. I can't even do the math right now. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think, he, here's what I'm thinking. I'm just thinking out loud. I'm thinking that I'm going to do my streams uh, to Wednesday and Thursday. And then I'm thinking that this weekend, right, I'll have three days where I just totally disconnect. No Twitter. Um, uh, maybe I'll just make it a mindset. I'll, 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 I'll pick one specific time per day to pop into the Discord, see what's happening, chime in. But I, I'm going to take this final weekend to, to really put this uh, finishing touches on this video that I'm so incredibly excited about. And, 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 and if you think that I've given any advice that's useful today or useful food for thought, I would say look forward to more of that in that forthcoming video essay. I mean, it's, it, it's about a game, but I, I approach the way of thinking about the game that it, 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 it is practical and useful for you. You can take some of the things that I observe about the game, and you can notice those things about the thinking about the game in a different way that I will contend in that video, that I, I'm bringing these things to your attention because I think it will bring you a, a lot more lasting and rewarding fun gameplay. And I say that because I have been playing the heck out of these games in the past year, much more so than previous years, and I've discovered so many cool things and different ways of experiencing the game. So I look forward to it, and as soon as that video comes out, I'm going to go full steam ahead on the next music theory video. I... I'm obviously not going to say right now what the next music theory video is. Suffice it to say that I, I've dropped some pretty solid hints here and there, and I do have a very clear sense of like what the next like few videos are going to be. So I, I'm bursting with excitement for that and a lot of other stuff. So I'm going to say a final sign-off um, as I get played out, what's behind me on screen right now? A game that I absolutely adore, and, and I play it at least once a week when I do my wager streams. And then you see that book up at the upper left. Um, the heart of that book is at, at, at the heart of, you know, everything that's been going on in the past few days. 
and, and this is how we move forward. This is how we win. This is how we love each other, and this is how we understand each other, and, and, and this is how we take control of the narrative of our own life. I, I recommend you do it because I have done it, and I, I'm living the life that I want to, and I'm extremely fortunate to be able to celebrate a milestone like this here on YouTube. I can't thank you enough for the continued support, and, and I look forward to finding new you know, musical insights and discoveries with this music that helps you understand the music a little better, gives you something interesting and cool to look out for the next time you play the game or listen to the soundtrack. So this is Alex Yard Zone. This is Alex in the Alex Yard Zone signing off. Thank you so much. Three times a week. Stop by. Say hi. Uh, reclaim conversation. Be respectful. Stand up for what you believe in. And don't spend time dwelling in your regrets. Spend that mental energy focusing on the things that make you you and the things that you're proud of and especially the things that make you you that you're proud of that no one can 